healer's potion. Written by Fanny Finch and published by Starfall Publications. Manifestos of Love series book. Available on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. Enjoy. Prologue. Arabella Dorset, 1787. Papa. Arabella pulled on her father's sleeve, though he appeared not to notice. She supposed it was because she was so small, for she was easy to ignore. Her mother had once described her as being similar to a fairy. Small, formed in a lovely shape, easy to hide where no one would think to look. Arabella had adored the description, smiling up at her doting mother as she listened to the words. Such a memory felt so distant now that her mother was gone. She must have been about eight at the time they'd had the conversation. That was two years ago. Papa, she tried to get her father's attention again. I'm sorry, love, he said, his voice gentle as it always was. However, a different undertone was present in his voice today. Was that exasperation? Tiredness? She couldn't be sure. Her father kept his head turned from her, staring across the breakfast room. He sat at the head of the table. His breakfast was untouched, and the cup of coffee that sat beside him in a silver cup was the only thing that was empty. He tapped the wood of the dark mahogany table incessantly and stared at the window that looked out over the grounds and the vast estate. Papa, Arabella spoke quietly at his side. She'd left her seat at the table, deciding the best way to get his attention was to pull at his sleeve. You said today you'd stay here. You were going to show me the horses. Did I say that? He looked at her at last, his round hazel eyes that were so like her own growing wide. He doesn't remember. Arabella bit her lip, trying not to cry again. She knew her father was tired of seeing her cry. He'd said as much more than once this last year. Many tears had flooded this house since her mother had left, but the loneliness seemed to continue on, even with those tears as an outlet for her grief. All Arabella wanted was for her father to spend the day with her, yet he always had somewhere else to be. He had tenants to see to, business to attend to. She didn't really understand what he did when he left the house, but she was beginning to learn it had to be more important than her. Crying was certainly not going to keep her father beside her. You said you'd show me the horses. Ma said I could learn to ride when I reached my tenth year. Arabella spoke with eagerness. Her small hand now curled around his sleeve, clinging on tightly. Her father sighed deeply, turning his head back to the window. I don't have time to teach you to ride today, love. There's too much to be done. He shifted in the seat and reached for her. Lifting her cleanly off the floor, he rested her on his lap. Arabella's hand now shifted from his sleeve to the lapelled tailcoat he wore. It was a long time since her father had embraced her. Franny the cook had told Arabella that her father loved her. It was just that sometimes he forgot to show such affection through embraces or kind words. He had a lot on his mind. No horses today, then, Arabella said, her voice quiet. She chewed the inside of her mouth, hoping that the feeling of pain would ward off the prickling sensation at the back of her eyes, so no tears would come. Not today, love. Another day. He kissed her on the forehead, his fair hair bristling her temple, before he lifted her off his lap and put her back on the floor. She tried to reach out and take his sleeve again, but she was too late. Her father was already on his feet, sliding his seat back, so the wooden feet of the chair scraped along the floorboards. Looking down, Arabella's nose wrinkled. A rug used to sit beneath the table, but it was gone now. The fine silken and heavily embroidered rug was missing. Where did it go? As her father walked out of the room, she followed him, as if she was his shadow. He didn't appear to notice she was there as he crossed to the entrance hall. Their butler stood by the door, holding onto a frock coat and top hat he passed to her father. What news, Robson? her father asked, sighing with the words. He often sighs these days. 
Arabella kept the thought to herself as she stood beside her father in the entrance hall, wishing he would stay. The footman and valet have packed and left this morning, sir. By the end of the day, it will just be the three of us that remain. Robson spoke formally, but there was a kind smile on his face. Arabella recognised that smile, for it was one the butler often bestowed on her. Good. Thank you. Her father paused as he turned in the doorway. I am sorry it has come to this, Robson. You do not need to apologise, sir. Robson offered another one of those nice smiles. As her father turned in the doorway, his eyes landed on Arabella. They widened momentarily, shocked to see she had so soundlessly followed him. You have a habit of sneaking about, love, he said, his voice soft as he patted her on the head, brushing her auburn hair out of her eyes. Like a fairy. Just as Ma said. She parted her lips to utter the words, but her father was already gone, stepping out of the door. No carriage waited for him in the driveway as it usually did, just a single horse, its reins held by a stable boy. Before Arabella could ask where the carriage was, Robson closed the door on the view of her father. There now, Miss Spencer. Have you eaten your breakfast? Robson asked, bending forward and placing his hands on his knees so he was at her level. She nodded in answer. Good. Then I shall clear up. What would you like to do today? He stood straight and walked toward the breakfast room, with Arabella trailing in his wake. She shrugged, and he merely smiled in response. As he cleared away the china from the dining table, Arabella stood in the shadows watching him. When he left the room taking the servant's staircase downstairs, she followed him. On the way, she noticed some strange things. In the corridor, the grandfather clock that used to chime each hour was gone. There was just an empty space where it had once stood. Even on the servant's staircase, where a painting was once fixed to the wall, bearing a sketch of how their house used to look decades ago, was now missing. The wall was quite empty. Where is everything disappearing to? Is the house under some sort of spell? Arabella trailed Robson into the kitchen. He passed the china to one of the scullery maids to wash, and Arabella stood in the centre of the kitchen, watching the activity. There used to be more maids. Alongside the scullery maid was the cook, Franny. Franny turned round from where she was stirring a mixing bowl. When she saw Arabella, she threw the bowl into the air. Oh, heavens, she cried. It's only Miss Spencer, Franny, Robson said with a deep laugh as the bowl landed on the counter nearby, somewhat miraculously not cracking. Miss Spencer, you gave me such a fright. Franny said, placing her hand to her heart. I'm sorry, Arabella said with a giggle as Franny smiled at her. Always tiptoeing around, aren't you? Franny joined in with the laughter. Now what are you doing down here? I thought your father was going to show you the horses today. He... Arabella didn't finish. Unsure what to say, she was aware of Franny and Robson exchanging a look. Then there was sudden movement. Well, we are the lucky ones then, for we get your company for the day. Franny picked Arabella up and placed her on a high stool nearby so that she was level with the worktop. Robson placed a cauldron of water on the fire, ready to be made into tea, and the scullery maid produced a small pastry former cupboard that she held in the air. Franny took it from her and handed it straight to Arabella. Here, eat. Thank you. Arabella took the pastry and nibbled lightly, delighting in the sugary taste. This was a special treat and not one Franny gave her every day. You can help me with my tasks today if you like. Franny collected her mixing bowl and stood beside Arabella. What are you doing? She peered forward with the words, trying to see what was in the bowl. I am mixing a tonic. See these? Franny pulled out some green leaves from the bowl and passed them to Arabella. These are mint leaves. They have power in them, special power. Like magic, Arabella asked excitedly. Of a kind, I suppose. Franny giggled at the idea, leaving one of the leaves in Arabella's hand to play with before she returned the rest to the bowl. 
Call it magic, science, or simply knowledge. The natural world has power, if you know where to look. She turned round, still stirring the bowl with one hand as she lifted the cauldron of water off the fire with the other. She poured out a cup of hot water, then pressed the mint leaves into the bowl. Drink that when you are done with your pastry. You will see what power mint has. It can calm the stomach and the mind. Truly, Arabella took the cup ready to drink when Franny held the cup down a little. Don't burn yourself now, Miss Spencer. The care and attention she gave Arabella had her smiling. No one else uttered such words to her since her mother had passed. Arabella blew on the mint tea for a few minutes before she took a sip. She could feel no immediate relief, but the taste was herbal and sweet. She smiled, taking another big sip. How do you know these things? Arabella asked, turning her focus on the cook. I had a good teacher, Franny said with a smile, stirring some more leaves into the bowl she was attending to. She also added small white flowers to the mixture holding them up to Arabella first. Smell these. Arabella sniffed hard, then recoiled, startled by the strong scent. Chamomile flowers. Franny stirred them into the bowl before she continued with her tale. My mother taught me all I wished to know about the natural world. She showed me what power it has. It can heal one's body and their soul, make someone happy, even make a heart fall in love. Love, really? Arabella laughed at the idea, finding it quite preposterous. Well, maybe that is a tall tale, even coming from me. Franny joined in with the laughter, making her large cheeks jiggle. The important thing is that plants, if you know where to look, can bring us health. That is the most important power there is in this world. The power to help another. Arabella smiled at the idea, thinking it was much like something her mother had once said. She had accompanied her mother a couple of years ago on a visit to the tenants of the land. Her mother had said how important it was to care for the tenants, to show them that no matter what was happening in the world and what adversity they faced, the family cared for them and would help when they could. Perhaps I could help the people as she did. Franny, Arabella said, leaning forward. Yes, dear. Would you teach me about plants? She asked, watching as Franny looked up from the bowl, her dark eyes lighting up. Of course, Miss Spencer. If you wish, I will teach you everything I know. She pushed the bowl toward Arabella, allowing her to take over the work with the spoon. As the scents of the herbs filled the air, Arabella felt a strange certainty fill her chest. I think this would make Ma happy. Chapter 1 Daniel Dorset, 1802 Daniel, you are not eating much today. The soft voice of his mother had Daniel raising his head from staring at his plate and purposefully placing another bite of toast in his mouth. I do not need to give her further cause to worry. I am just not hungry this morning, mother. It is nothing. He strained his voice a little, holding back the cough he so desperately wanted to let escape him. As much as he wished to convince his mother he was well, he could see in her face that she was not persuaded. Marianne sat forward in her seat at the foot of the table, one hand fussing with the necklace at her throat and the other playing with her cutlery. She chewed her lip as she so often did when she looked at him these days. Perhaps we should send for another physician. What do you think, Gregory? She appealed to Daniel's father, sat at the head of the table. Daniel offered an apologetic look to his father, though he knew what little good it did. Gregory was as fearful these days as Marianne was. They'd tried that many physicians and doctors. Daniel had told them to abandon finding someone new long ago. We've had this conversation, Daniel spoke before his father could. I'm well enough. You do not need to seek out another doctor. His words cast a quietness on the room. 
Gregory and Marianne looked at each other across the long oak table. The Duke and Duchess of Gordon, as they were known to others, often exchanged such silent looks these days. Daniel had developed a habit of not commenting on that look, for he knew what it meant. They are worried about me, yet there is nothing any of us can do, is there? Sitting straight in the tall back chair, Daniel tried to breathe deeply. The weakness in his lungs was ever present at the moment, with a familiar tightness that squeezed across his chest. At least he could breathe easily enough. Sometimes taking a breath seemed like the hardest thing in the world. Perhaps we should delay our travels for a while, Marianne said hurriedly, leaning forward and resting an elbow on the table as she fidgeted with her necklace. Again? No, Daniel answered before his father could. Guilt swelled in his stomach. Ever since his sister Clara had married in the summer, their parents had been planning a journey to Scotland to see some of the sights that Clara had seen on her honeymoon. It was a journey they had been put on hold more than once, thanks to Daniel's present sickness. And now the weather had turned colder and winter had crept in, they risked snow on their travels. Daniel was tired of his parents putting their lives on hold out of concern for him. Mother, you do not need to do that. He sat forward, feeling the light brown hair bristle across his temple with the movement. I travelled the continent on my grand tour just fine by myself. I would hate for you to hold back from your travels out of concern for me. I will be fine alone. On his journeys, his sickness had been much recovered, with only the occasional attack. Since he had returned home in the summer, though, he had grown worse. Marianne did not look convinced by his words. She fussed with her own cinnamon-coloured hair that was beginning to grey, pushing the few loose locks from her updo back behind her ears. Danielle is right, Gregory spoke for the first time that morning. Daniel looked up, watching as his father pushed away the newspaper at his side. None of us can put our lives on hold out of fear. It is no way to live. He smiled softly at Daniel. If you wish to travel again as well, you should, son. Thank you, father. Daniel forced a smile of his own, for he knew the truth. I am in no fit state to travel. Already his breathing was shortening, and he needed to escape the company of his parents if he did not wish them to worry more. He swallowed the last of the toast on his plate and downed what was left in his teacup before he stood to his feet. If you would excuse me, he said, nodding his head at his parents before hurrying out of the room. Is all well, son? Gregory called after him. I'm fine, father, nothing's wrong, Daniel lied, feeling his breath escape him. As the door to the dining room closed behind him, he wheezed. He headed for the staircase as quickly as he could, knowing that running would make it worse. But he did it anyway. He was tired of causing his parents such worry and longed to be like any other young man, stronger than this. Taking the stairs two at a time, he panted with each breath until he reached the landing. No longer able to take a deep breath, he fell to his knees, clutching the banister beside him so much that he could see the skin of his knuckles turning white. Concentrating on his breathing, he closed his eyes. It was a technique taught to him once by a physician in Paris. In and out, my lord, that's right. The breath encapsulates one being. To control it, you must think only of it. Daniel recalled the memory as he breathed. There was a dizziness that dissipated as he opened his eyes. Once he was strong enough, he pulled at the banister, hauling himself to his feet. Then he hastened toward his bedchamber door, glad it was not too far away. Stumbling inside, he kicked the door shut behind him and reached for the nearest chair, dropping down into the seat. Pulling forward a small table nearby, he bent over a bowl of heated water. His valet had brought it for him that morning, as was customary. It was cooler now, too cool really, but there was still a thin vapour of steam that helped to clear Daniel's breathing. He inhaled the steam as much as he could, bracing his hands to his knees. I shall conquer this. 
I shall. Yet he had been telling himself this same thing for the last thirteen years, at least. On his fifteenth birthday, his breathing had first become ragged, and a physician had been called for. Since that first day, Daniel's condition had been given many names. Dyspnea, inflammation of the lungs, asthma, and more. One physician had even proposed that Daniel had had a curse placed upon his lungs. Needless to say, Gregory had sent that physician out of the house with some sharp words and a warning not to come back. Daniel had never believed in such superstitions. Once his breathing was completely under control, he sat back in the chair, his shoulders slumping. Across the room he caught sight of his reflection in the mirror over his vanity table. With the mirror at an angle, it distorted his reflection a little. A distortion that seemed rather apt to him, mimicking how he felt. The light brown hair atop his temple was growing a little longer these days, and despite being waxed that morning was already unkempt. The cropped beard across his chin had become unruly. His long nose seemed crooked in the reflection, and the lips that had a habit of smiling broadly in company were now flattened together. His tall figure, almost lanky, was crumpled in the chair, with his long legs stretching out in front of him. He sat forward, staring at the bowl in front of him and watching the last few vapours of steam waft in the air, forming thin tendrils. There had been a time when Daniel had encouraged every physician and doctor they could find into the house, desperate for a cure. But he'd long given up hope of a remedy. There's only one thing I can do, he muttered aloud, his voice deep. Push on and live with it. He pushed the bowl of heated water away. Sitting back in his chair, he thought of all the things he would do today if he had more energy. He missed riding his horse and longed to do more of it. But the last ride he had managed was round the estate with his father following him on another horse. It was a far cry from the long horse rides Daniel had had on the continent the year before, unattended and exploring the great Alps of France and Switzerland. Much has changed. And despite what I say, I am getting worse. The thought made him lift a hand to his chest and place his palm flat. He felt for the beat of his heart. It was slowing now to something more normal. He took comfort in that sound, letting the steady rhythm rock him. He was so close to sleep that when a knock came on the door, it jolted him forward. My Lord Marquess! the butler called from the closed door. Yes, Travis, Daniel called back, standing abruptly. Your sister has arrived at the house. She's asking to see you, my lord. Thank you. I will be down shortly. He waited for the butler's footsteps to retreat before taking a deep breath and moving to the door. I will be fine. Clara understands this more than any other, and she knows how I try to protect our parents from fear, too. It seemed to be an unspoken agreement they had formed long ago, that when he had trouble, Clara would help and try to keep their parents calm. They had seen Marianne panic enough to know that she could become quite wild, out of worry that one day Daniel would just stop breathing entirely. Keep breathing, you fool, he muttered to himself and reached for the door. Slowly he made his way downstairs, finding Clara was already in the sitting room. Their parents weren't there, but out on the driveway, waving to Clara through the window. Are they fleeing you as you come to visit? Daniel teased, earning her gaze. She rolled her eyes at his antics and turned away from the window, flashing her large eyes. Should I be worried? She continued the jest, then hastened toward him, her arms outstretched for an embrace. Daniel took her in his arms, holding her for a few seconds, before he stepped back. There was a glow in his sister's countenance he had not seen before. How are you? she asked, before he could ask the same of her. Well enough and you, he said, releasing her and reaching for the nearest chair. He sighed as he sat down in the chair, noting that she did not take her customary seat across the room but pulled up a footstool and sat beside him. I'm well, she said hurriedly. I thought we could go for a ride today, 
Horatio is seeing his tenants on business, so I am quite lonesome and in need of company. As she spoke of her husband, she smiled sweetly. You are quite amusing to watch when you speak of Horatio, do you know that? He teased her as she sat stiffly, the curls of her hair twitching with the sudden movement. Whatever do you mean? Her voice pitched high. I mean that you go from talking normally to speaking of your husband in a light voice and with a ridiculous smile on your face. He was mischievous as he gestured to her. Then I shall have to do this. She covered her lips, hiding her face from him. They both laughed together, and she soon let her hand drop. I cannot deny Horatio makes me happy. I know. I have seen it. Daniel felt a twinge of envy in his stomach. He shifted, trying to abate that feeling. Ever since Horatio and Clara had married, he'd been truly delighted for them both. Horatio was a good man and the best brother-in-law he could hope for. He and Clara suited one another well and had a preoccupation with one another's company. Daniel had never seen his sister so happy. In his darkest of moments, though, he feared it would be a feeling he would never know. Love. You are both well, then. No regrets over your marriage, Daniel teased her again. At Yuletide, you looked quite ready to throw your Christmas gift at him. That is because he was causing mischief, Clara said simply. Wrapping up an apple is not a gift. Fortunately, he gave me a much better present after that. It seemed to be a running jest the two had between them, of wrapping up things that weren't quite gifts in the attempt to deceive one another. I am very happy. She looked down a little and fidgeted with her gown. Daniel wondered what such a movement meant before she continued on. I hope someday soon you will marry Daniel. Me? He sat tall in the chair and laughed at the idea. We both know that is absurd. Absurd? Why on earth should it be absurd? She looked quite outraged, folding her arms across her body and making her pink cheeks flush red. I hardly need say why, do I? Daniel continued to laugh before he could not breathe. Abruptly, he coughed, and his laughter came to an end. One cough was not enough to clear his lungs, and he sat forward, struggling to catch his breath. At once, Clara was on her feet. She clapped Daniel on the back, trying to help him clear his lungs. Amongst the coughing, Daniel was aware someone else was in the room. What can I do? It was the butler's voice. Hot water, at once, please, Clara called. Daniel managed to stop coughing by himself and sat straight, though he wheezed as he moved. Clara released him, moving back to the footstool. So close, he could see the fear in her eyes and the way her lips were pressed together. Don't you start looking at me like that, Daniel said, his voice strained. I get enough of that look from our mother. I can't help it, Clara said in a small voice. Hot water soon arrived and was placed beside Daniel on a table. He thanked Travis for the kindness who parted, leaving Daniel and Clara alone again. Daniel raised the water to his lips but didn't take a sip. He merely breathed in the steam. There was the scent of phlegm hanging in the air but he didn't draw attention to it. It seemed to be a scent that followed him around these days. Well, that answers your question, doesn't it? He asked Clara eventually. What? she murmured her eyes dancing over his person, showing she was still anxious with her concern for him. I doubt I will ever marry Clara, he said, his voice deep. What woman would accept such a husband as I? What husband would that be? Clara stood, her hands on her hips. The son of a duke, a handsome man at that, one full of good humour and jests, intelligent too, great rider. I'm amazed. You are uttering more compliments than you have ever done in our lifetimes, he teased her, watching as her stance relaxed and she lowered her hands from her hips. My point is, she paused and sat down again, leaning forward. Your sickness is not the definition of who you are. You are so much more than that. He smiled softly, touched by her words. She and I know that, but I also know what others think. 
He didn't wish to make the atmosphere worse, so he did not tell Clara of his thoughts. He had never told her of some of the meetings he'd had on the continent that had made him so afraid. In the south of France, some villagers had pointed at him, saying he was cursed. In Italy, after being introduced to a fine lady at a masquerade ball, she had retreated from him after he had coughed and said she had no wish to die of the plague. No matter what he had said, he could not persuade her he was not contagious, that it was a problem with his own lungs. I believe someday you will marry, Clara said confidently, her eyes lighting up with her confidence. You will find someone who loves you for who you are. The confidence of my sister, he smiled at the words. You always were a little idealistic. He remembered once that Clara had thought just as poorly of herself, though that seemed some time ago. Ever since she had married Horatio, she had been a little naive at times. I think the word is optimistic, she prodded him with her statement, making him wriggle in his seat, trying not to laugh out of fear he would cough again. Now, what do you say? Shall we go for that ride? We could talk of the ladies you have met at the Yuletide balls. Daniel's eyes looked out of the window. The grass beyond was frost-covered, and the trees were white as if they had been sifted in fine sugar. He longed to journey out, but he feared what it would do to him. Maybe just a short journey, he said eventually. Though the fear of what could happen outside made his knee bob up and down, and the heel of his hessian boot repeatedly tapped the floor. The last time he'd had a coughing fit outside, that cold air had burned his lungs, making it painful indeed. I'll keep a close eye on you. Clara stood and offered her hand. The temptation of the adventure was too much to resist, and he took her hand, standing to follow her. Now, as we go, tell me what ladies you met at the Christmas ball, she asked, prompting Daniel to shake his head. They were all fine and fair enough, sister, but they kept their distance. It was a sad truth. He had a distinct memory from the ball of when he had coughed and a group of ladies had all turned their heads away from him. Chapter Two Arabella With her arm growing tired from waving, Arabella persisted, gesturing at Franny as she took her leave in the cart, parting from the house for the last time. Arabella held back her tears as she had grown used to doing over the years. That same familiar, prickling feeling was there, though she refused to give way to it. Goodbye, Franny, she called to the cook she would miss so much. Goodbye, my dear, Franny shouted back, leaning out of the cart and waving for as long as she could. Finally, the cart turned at the end of the drive and disappeared from view, masked by the trees. Arabella's arm fell to her side, and she breathed deeply thinking of how lonely the house would be now. Franny was the last member of staff to work for Arabella and her father. She had stayed on for many years, even when Arabella's father, Harold, had told her he would have to cut her pay for he couldn't afford her any more. It was the greatest kindness Arabella had ever known for Franny to stay as long as she did. How can I leave you, Miss Spencer? She'd said once, years ago. She was Arabella's greatest friend until now. Harold could no longer afford to pay Franny a single shilling, and Franny was forced to look for work elsewhere. Arabella chewed the inside of her mouth to stop her tears, as her eyes landed on the trees at the edge of the estate. They swayed in the breeze, their bare branches shivering, shedding any last few leaves that had clung on past Christmas. With the turn of the new year, much was changing. Not only was the estate withered by the cold, but by a lack of money too. Harold had sold off most of the tenants, a lot of the furniture from the house and even the horses. What was left of the house was bare and lacked any comforts at all. Turning her back on the driveway, Arabella walked into the house. Shivering at the cold in the air, she wrapped a blue woolen shawl tighter around her shoulders. Peering into the closest room, she saw the fire was empty. They couldn't afford the coal to build it up again. 
She would simply have to wear more shawls for now. Reaching for a second shawl off the coat stand, she wrapped it around her shoulders as well as the first, then walked into the room to see her father. Harold was bending over a writing bureau, his body stiff as he hurried to write notes. Papa, she called to him. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button this way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. He didn't appear to hear her at first, but fidgeted. He pulled at the sleeves of his tailcoat that were beginning to fray, then he returned to his notes. Papa! This time he looked up, his chin jerking toward her in surprise at her presence. Franny has left. Ah, yes. He pulled at his frayed sleeves once more and sat back. I am truly sorry, love. I know how much she meant to you, but I... I know, Papa. We couldn't keep her with us any more. She forced a smile, though it made her cheeks ache, so soon fell away. I will miss her. She didn't say the words aloud, fearful of making her father feel any worse. All will be better soon, I promise, her father said, and picked up one of the sheets of paper before him, waving it in the air. I've had some advice on a new investment opportunity. Another? The last few have not gone well. She tried to issue a note of caution, but he was too taken up by the idea to possibly listen. This one will be better, I'm sure of it. He spoke with heavy anticipation, leaning forward so much in his chair that it creaked beneath him. You'll see, all will be better soon. All I need is a little money to invest a Kai. And where are you going to find that money? Arabella pointed out. The happiness in her father's face faltered for a second before it returned. We have some left. I will use that. He turned and pulled forward a new sheet of paper. I will write to the other investors now. I must put forward my money soon if we are to reap the benefits. I'm not sure about this, the last investment you made. She trailed off, aware that her voice didn't seem to reach him. It was as if he was in another world now, unable to hear her. He muttered to himself as he wrote the letter, and she backed up, tiptoeing soundlessly out of the room and into the corridor. As always, he didn't notice she had gone. Arabella walked the corridors for a minute, noting the new empty spaces in the house. On the wall there was a blank space, where a painting that had been painted by her mother used to sit. Feeling her gut tightening, with horror she realised her father was even selling things that had belonged to her mother now. He is so desperate for money. Turning her back on the empty space, Arabella left the corridor and made her way to the one place in the house that brought her comfort. Hastening for the servant's staircase, she walked down into the belly of the house and found the kitchen. Here, the hearth was just as empty as every other fireplace in the house. One log was in the grate, unlit, ready for her to make dinner later that day. She could not afford to light it now, for that would be wasting the wood. Tying her shawls around her shoulders, she fixed them in place and lifted a bonnet from where she kept it on an iron hook nailed into the stone wall by the kitchen door. Fastening the bonnet under her chin, it helped to ward off a little of the chill as she began to prepare some food. Over the years, Franny had taught her much in the way of cooking. Now, Arabella would have to use all of that knowledge if she was going to cook for her and her father to keep them alive on what little food they could purchase and grow in the kitchen garden. Taking a mixing bowl, she began to stir together breadcrumbs and herbs when the scent of mint filled the air. Lifting a mint leaf out of the bowl, she crushed it between her fingers and pressed it to her nose, inhaling that scent. It brought forward happy memories of Franny. Remember, dear, plants bring happiness as well as health. What is more important in this world than those two things? At the time, Arabella had had no answer for the cook.
now she did have an answer. My father would have said, Money. The words escaped her in a rush, her voice quiet and barely audible at all. Since her mother had died when she was a child, Arabella had witnessed the steady decline of the estate. At first, Harold had been caught up so much in his grief that he'd been distracted from his business. The once great merchant and landowner was unable to concentrate on his responsibilities, and one poor decision had led to another. What had started out as grief had become ill-considered business choices. One mad scheme of investment led to another. And now they had fallen far from the once wealthy position they had occupied. We have to find money from somewhere, Arabella whispered to herself as she lowered the mint leaves into the bowl and stirred them with the breadcrumbs, thinking of making a stuffing to have with a chicken that evening. It was one of the last chickens they had on the estate, chickens that were now attended to and fed by her, for the maid who used to attend them had left long ago. The year before, Arabella had dappled in selling her herbal mixtures and tonics to the village and town close by in order to make some money. She had done good business for a while, before she had decided the risk was too great to continue the position. For one thing, all the money she had brought home was used by her father on some new ridiculous scheme. She had also feared that her identity would be discovered. Having styled herself as Bonadea, the unknown healer of the town who helped women with secret tonics, gossip had spread and many had tried to discover her identity. Out of fear of discovery, she'd abandoned the endeavour. It would have embarrassed her father greatly for the town to know his daughter was working as a healer. And she feared what the town would think to see the daughter of a fallen merchant was now attending to their ailments. As she stirred the stuffing together, she heard footsteps beyond the kitchen door, hurrying through the garden and the herbs she'd planted outside. Pausing in her task, Arabella looked to the door, wondering if it was in her imagination. Franny walked those paths many times. She will not walk them again now. There was a knock at the door, a rapid one, making Arabella jump. Arabella? Arabella, a familiar voice called on the other side. Betchy. Moving away from the worktop of the kitchen, she reached for the door and opened it wide. The fair hair of Betchy appeared on the other side, her skin pale from the cold as she blew on her fingers. Brr! It's chilly out here today, I hope you're going to invite me in, Betchy teased with a great smile. Happily, though be warned it is not much warmer in here. Arabella hastened her friend inside and closed the door behind her. She and Betchy had met as children on the estate, for Betchy was the daughter of one of her father's old tenants. They had played together when they were young and had remained friends to this day. In that time, much had changed. As Arabella's position had fallen and she'd turned to quite an isolated life in this house, Betchy had many reasons to smile. The maid had gone to work for Lady Clara, the daughter of the Duke of Gordon. With Lady Clara now married to Mr Horatio Fitzroy, the future Baron of Aldington, Betchy was moving between grand houses. She'd also met a young valet, James, and fallen so quickly in love that Arabella had teased her friend that it often sounded like the tale of one of Shakespeare's grand plays. Now married, Betchy's belly was beginning to grow with child. Come in, come in, Arabella ushered her friend inside and toward a chair. We cannot have you cold, not in your state. I'm sure it is warm enough in here. Yet Betchy's smile faltered slightly as she shivered in the room. Goodness, how does this cold air not make you ill? I fear some day it will. Deciding she had to at least use some of the log in the grate to keep her friend warm, Arabella dropped to her knees and lit the fire, stirring it to life. The yellow flames were small at first, but they soon cast a warmth into the room, enough for Betchy to hover by the hearth in her chair and stay warm. Here. I'll make you a sweet mint tea too. It will help you with your sickness. How did you know? Betchy said wide-eyed as she turned in the chair to look at Arabella. I have not complained to you for weeks of my morning sickness. 
Arabella raised her eyebrows, watching as Betsy smiled. Well, not for days then. You are pale, my friend, Arabella said softly, laying a comforting hand to Betsy's shoulder. I can tell when someone is feeling ill. She had learned to recognise the signs over the years, just as Franny had taught her to. Not only was there a paleness to Betsy's cheeks, but there was almost a purplish tinge to her lips that would not have been helped by the cold air outside. Hastening to her task, Arabella placed a cauldron on the fire, stretching her small frame with the large cauldron ready to boil the water, then began to tear up mint leaves, preparing them for the tea. How are you? Betty said, her voice soft. Arabella heard the concern in her friend's voice without having to look up and see her expression. They had talked much in advance about how today Franny would be leaving. It had not been a day Arabella was looking forward to. I'm well enough, Arabella forced a smile. We must push forward with things, must we not? Move on with our lives. She placed the mint leaves in two cups, then turned to face her friend. How are you faring? She noted there was an excitement in her friend's manner. Betsy was sat forward in her chair, her lips parting and closing as if she was anxious to speak. You seem excited about something, Arabella observed, tilting her head to the side. as She watched Betsy. May I presume this is not like any other visit, but you have come to tell me something. How is it you always know what I'm thinking? You are too perceptive. That or you have powers and really can read minds. What was it your mother always called you? Betsy spoke more to herself rather than needing an answer at all, and tapped her chin. That was it, a fairy. Perhaps your mother was right. You certainly have such magical powers that I would associate with a fairy. Goodness, I have not thought of that memory for a long time. Arabella stilled with the mint leaves, recalling her mother. A happy memory flashed in her mind, of her mother walking with her in the garden, holding her hand. The memory slipped away, and Arabella's smile faded with it. Anyway, what is it you wish to tell me? I have come to ask you something. Betsy leaned forward as Arabella moved a chair from the kitchen table to sit beside the fire. I bring a message, a request. What sort of request? From Lady Clara Fitzroy. Betsy spoke with glee. At the words Arabella stilled. The last time she had worked as a healer was for Lady Clara, though she had been determined not to do such work since. Arabella had made tonics and potions for Lady Clara to give her more confidence, as well as providing things ladies often wanted, to feel more beautiful, such as belladonna drops. Lady Clara had taken too much belladonna in her tea one day and had become quite ill. It was one of the reasons Arabella had not worked as a healer since, for she had no wish to risk another ending up hurt. She longs for your help, Betsy went on, calling Arabella's mind back to the moment. My help, Arabella said in panic. Surely she does not know. She broke off suddenly and collected the cauldron of water from the fire as it began to boil. No, no, she has no idea you are Bonadea. Trust me, that is a secret I have kept very well. Betsy sat tall, pleased with her success at holding on to such a secret. Arabella sighed with relief as she poured the hot water over the mint leaves, making their tea. She asked for your help as Bonadea. She is facing a grave situation. How do you mean? Arabella paused from prodding the tea leaves with a pewter spoon, raising her eyes to her friend. It is her brother the Marquis of Wareham. He is ill, and no physician seems able to help him. Betsy had lost all traces of her smile. Lady Clara has offered to pay you a great deal, but she longs for another's advice, someone besides the usual doctors and physicians who always say the same thing. They have not managed to help him. I... Arabella didn't know what to say. She passed the teacup to her friend and kept the chipped cup for herself not wanting her friend to use the damaged crockery. 
Returning to her seat, she lifted the teacup to her lips, deep in thought. I haven't worked as a healer for a while, Betchy. You know that. A year's break is not so long. Betchy waved the idea away with a waft of her hand. Lady Clara offers you money, a great deal, and I know it could do you good. It could. She paused, chewing the inside of her mouth as she looked around the room. Just minutes before Betchy had arrived, she had been thinking of ways to make money. Was she now going to turn her back on the one chance she had for earning something? I ask you for more reasons other than money, my friend, Betchy said and sat forward, catching Arabella's gaze with her own. Lady Clara is truly worried for her brother. Sadness clings to her, as if it were her shadow. If there is anything you could do for him... Her intake of breath was shuddery. It would be more valued than I could ever say. Arabella had seen Lord Wareham from a distance once. He was a handsome man with light brown hair who had noticed her despite the business of the streets in town. His eyes had danced over her and he had offered a smile. It was a kind thing to smile at a stranger in the street. Then he was gone, walking past her beside his father deep in conversation. The thought of the man with the kind face suffering illness tugged at her heart, making it thump harder in her chest. Very well. I could take a look at him. Yet I shall go as myself. I could hardly examine the man purely through letters, so I pray Lady Clara will be content to keep the secret of my pseudonym for now. She swallowed nervously at the idea. Of course, you do not need to worry about that. Lady Clara has promised to keep the secret. Betchy assured her in a rush. Very well, then. Going to the Duke of Gordon's house would mean revealing her identity to some people, but at least this way she could get her father the money he needed. When should I go to see him? Come to the Duke's house tomorrow, Betchy pleaded, her cheeks spreading into a wide smile. I am so glad you have said yes, Arabella. I am sure you are the one who can help him. Chapter 3 Arabella Arabella paused on the driveway, fidgeting with the gloves around her wrists and the herbal case in her grasp as she stared at the Duke of Gordon's house. She had seen it many times from a distance when she walked nearby hills and from a passing road, but never had she been so close before. The structure was vast and made of yellow stone in the Palladian style. So impressive in stature, with a multitude of windows that glistened in the morning light, it made Arabella swallow nervously, feeling quite out of place. She felt as small as a pebble in comparison to the house, as if she did not belong here at all. Maybe this was not such a good idea. She supposed she might have felt like she belonged more had she approached on a horse or in a carriage. But the carriages had been sold long ago, and her father had never taught her to ride a horse, despite her frequent requests for him to do so. In the end, she tried to ride a horse herself one day. When the horse had tipped her out of the saddle, she decided not to try again. Fidgeting on the driveway, she didn't move forward or back for a minute. She thought only of the house before her that was dappled in frost, and the way the icy gravel path had crunched beneath her feet. The manner of the house being so enveloped in ice reminded her much of her own home, as if there were more similarities between the abodes than she had considered before. I do not belong here, Arabella whispered, reminding herself that she was really suited to calling at the servant's doorway. Yet the instructions Betchy had left for her didn't speak of the servant's entrance but the main door. Think of your father, you fool, she thought to herself. He is in need of the money, to buy food if nothing more, so you have no choice. Pushing away any feelings that she did not belong on this estate, she walked forward, making her way to the front door. She knocked quietly on the wood, only to find it was not answered by a butler. Betchy was the one to answer it, flinging open the door so hurriedly that she nearly tipped herself off her own feet with it. Be careful! Arabella called and jumped forward, grabbing Betchy's free wrist to keep her friend stable. Oh, Betchy shook her head at herself. 
I swear this baby is making me lose control of myself. She laid her other hand to her swollen stomach and laughed off the idea. I am always full of excitement. Arabella smiled and released her friend now that she was stable on her feet. Come in quickly before the staff see you. I beg your pardon? Arabella just managed to get the words out before the door was closed and she had to hasten out of the way of being caught by it. Stumbling into the entrance hall, her mouth turned dry as she took in the view of the corridor. The house was magnificent, with a hallway that towered at least two floors in height. Flooded with light from the great windows, the whole place felt bright. Despite the coldness beyond the windows from the icy day, inside this room all was warm. Betchy, what did you say? Arabella tore her eyes away from admiring the room and fixed her gaze on Betchy, who now locked the door. The staff do not know you have come. In fact, only Lady Clara and I know it. Betchy took Arabella's hand and dragged her away from the front door. Oh, how wonderful, Arabella said with thick irony. If you expect to keep my presence in a house secret, what do you wish me to do? Hide in the corners and shrink down to the skirting boards like a mouse? The thought may have crossed my mind, Betchy teased her with a giggle, before hurrying her into the nearest room. Trust me, Arabella, it is for the best. Before she could ask Betchy any more about why there was such a need for secrecy in this house, she grew aware of another nearby. Arabella turned in the room to see Lady Clara standing by the fire. She was a lady Arabella had often seen at a distance, beautiful, with large eyes and distinctive features. Now Lady Clara had a vast smile too as she turned to face Arabella. To meet you at last, she said gushingly, what a joy this is. Oh heavens! Arabella was not prepared for the way Lady Clara ran forward and took her hand. My lady! Arabella hurried to curtsy, feeling ill at ease and out of place. This was the daughter of a duke before her. Arabella did not deserve to be in the lady's sitting room, let alone to have her hand taken by the lady. Forgive me. I know I am being informal. I am just so thrilled to meet you at last, Lady Clara said kindly. After all that you did for me last year, I have wanted to thank you in person for so long. Oh! Arabella felt as if... The breath was stolen from her body. She recovered fast, trying not to dwell on how she had helped Lady Clara. She'd sent Lady Clara the potions, but it was the letter she had sent that had done the lady more good than anything else. Arabella had often heard from Betchy that without the letter, Lady Clara feared she never would have married her husband, Mr Horatio Fitzroy. It was a letter Arabella had written after Lady Clara had fallen ill, urging her that she had no need of such potions and tricks to feel confident. I did only what any other lady would do. I was glad to be of help, my lady. Arabella curtsied once more, prompting Lady Clara to smile. Thank you so much for coming. You're cold to the touch. Lady Clara pressed Arabella's hand between two of her own. Come, stand by the fire. This will warm you. Arabella was drawn forward, shocked by the sudden heat in the room. It had been a long time since she had seen such a roaring fire, with great yellow flames leaping upward as if each one was competing to reach the top of the chimney, far above it. She hovered by the fire, startled to find that Lady Clara still hadn't released her hand. Slowly, Arabella extricated it, gripping to the herbal bag in front of her. Betchy said you were in need of my help, my lady, for your brother, she asked leadingly, hoping to discover what was wrong. Yes, that is right. Lady Clara looked to the doorway of the room as they heard sounds beyond it. She waved a panicked hand at Betchy, who abruptly closed the door. I apologise for my manner and my secrecy, but there is a reason for it. For one thing, Betchy has impressed upon me your wish for your identity to remain unknown as a healer. Thank you, my lady. Arabella smiled, touched by the kindness, 
though she sensed there was more here that hadn't yet been told. There is also the matter that my parents do not know I have sent for your presence, and I fear what they would think if the staff were to pass on news of your visit. Lady Clara looked uncomfortable, wringing her hands together. They have gone travelling, and after they left, my brother took a turn for the worse with his illness. It all started one day when we went riding. She swallowed clearly holding back tears as her eyes grew wet. The concern for her brother was so evident that Arabella felt nerves tremble in her gut. What you must understand about my parents, Miss Spencer, is that they put a lot of stock into science and the medicinal profession. I fear that if I told them I had asked a local healer to look at my brother, they would disapprove. Arabella couldn't help but smile a little at the words, for it was not the first time she had heard such a dismissal. They would not be the only ones to have such an opinion, my lady, Arabella said slowly. Many think that a woman such as I could not have knowledge that compares to that of a male doctor's learning. What they fail to see is that my knowledge is based on science, too. When I was a child, I called it magic, but as I have grown older, I have come to see that they are one and the same thing, really. Science is magic, but it has an explanation behind it. Her words prompted Lady Clara to smile, and the signs of tears in her eyes faded. I admire you for such a thought, she confessed, her voice quiet. I know of your capabilities, of course, after our past dealings, and it is my hope that with your knowledge you will be able to help my brother now. I can try. Arabella nodded, fearing what she would find when she met the Marquis of Wareham. Yet I am no sorceress nor an all-powerful being. As much as it pains me to say this, my lady, I must issue caution. It may be the case that I can not... She broke off, struggling to say the words. That you cannot help him, I know. Lady Clara smiled sadly. Trust me, I have seen many doctors come to such a conclusion, and I am prepared for it. But at this stage, I am willing to try anything. I beg of you to at least look at him. If you cannot help him, then I will accept it. But please, say you will try. The desperation in her tone was so plain that Arabella found herself nodding, even before Lady Clara had finished speaking. Of course I will help in any way I can, Arabella assured her, and glanced back at Betchy, who still hovered by the closed door. All at once Arabella could see why Betchy considered Lady Clara such a good friend. The difference in their station mattered naught to either of them. With Lady Clara's kind manner, Arabella could see how easy it would be to confide in the woman. I will do what I can. Arabella clutched the leather handle of her bag a little harder. May I see him now? Yes, please. Come with me. Lady Clara beckoned her to follow and moved to the door. Betchy peered out first into the corridor before stepping back and giving the all clear with a nod of her head. We must hurry, she said swiftly. The butler seems to be keeping a close eye on the house these days. I think he worries for his master too. Then let us go now. Lady Clara stepped out into the corridor, with Arabella following behind and Betchy trailing at the rear. With Betchy growing with child, she was not able to keep pace with the others. Together they hastened up the stairs, only pausing at the top when Lady Clara held out a hand toward Arabella. There is one thing more I must tell you before we see my brother. Lady Clara said, returning to wringing her hands in her customary fashion, revealing the stress she suffered. What is that? Even as Arabella asked the question, she saw the way Lady Clara's eyes darted to the door of a bedchamber nearby. There was something in the movement of those eyes, the sharpness, and the way the lady's lips pressed firmly together, that led Arabella to conclude what was wrong. Allow me to guess, my lady. Have you not told your brother I'm coming to look at his condition? I'm afraid I have not. Larry Clara, Grimace said, with the words and laid her palms to her cheeks, attempting to hide 
her blush of embarrassment. In truth, I feared what he would say. I knew if you were already here, when I introduced the idea of you looking at him, he would find it much harder to say no. I'm afraid my brother thinks like my parents when it comes to healing. Arabella said nothing for a minute, with her hands tightening around the handles of her bag. Coming to look at a man who had no idea she was here to see him felt audacious and rude. For a minute she considered turning back around and refusing to see him, for what would the Marquess say when she appeared in his chamber door? He could cast her out of it. The thought of the handsome Marquess of Wareham glaring at her was too much to bear. Well, I am not sure, she began, then broke off. Lady Clara dropped her palms from her cheeks and revealed the sadness of her expression. Behind her, Betchy appeared, a hand to her rounded stomach and breathing deeply after walking so quickly. You must take care, Betchy, Arabella said, reaching for her friend. She took her friend's hand and led her toward a chair at the top of the stairs, helping her to sit. See, that is how I know you are perfect for this, Lady Clara said, gesturing to what Arabella had done. There is such care in what you do. That is what my brother needs, rather than another doctor who simply knows he will be paid well for coming to look at the son of a duke. Ah, I see. Arabella felt the guilt tighten in a knot in her stomach, for it was the money that had brought her here too. How many times must this poor man have been poked and prodded by physicians, who simply knew they'd be compensated well for the task? Very well, my lady, I will see your brother. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lady Clara spoke quickly with animation before she reached for the nearest chamber door. Daniel? She tapped lightly on the door. Are you risen? Of course, a deep voice called from inside the room. I'd be the definition of laziness itself to still be in bed at this hour. Oh, good, Lady Clara opened the door and pushed it wide. Arabella's eyes shot to the room inside where she saw Lord Wareham. He was sat up in an armchair by the fire, dressed though missing his tailcoat, and with his sleeves rolled up to his elbows. The handsome countenance had Arabella fidgeting, remembering what it was like that day in the street when Lord Wareham had smiled at her. When his eyes turned to greet his sister, the smile dropped from his face and the pale pallor became mixed with a dark look. Sister, why are you bringing a lady into my room? Chapter 4. Daniel. Sister, Daniel said impatiently, looking to Clara, who was now fidgeting restlessly in his chamber. The lady with wild auburn hair, standing in the doorway, flinched at his words and sighed, as if he'd said some great evil indeed. I recognise her. I've seen her in the village in passing. He was sure there was something familiar about her. It would be hard to forget the large hazel eyes and the heart-shaped face. She was a very pretty woman, though he had no idea of her name. Any attraction he felt toward her was dampened by the strangeness of this situation. Clara, he said more sharply this time, she's a healer. Clara stepped forward as she spoke, gesturing to the woman. I asked her to come and look at you. Clara, he said her name again but with exasperation, this time, and leaned forward, pinching the brow of his nose. How many physicians have we had traipsed through these corridors? They've offered nothing more useful than breathing in steam, smoke, and God knows what else. I do not need to be looked at by another, especially a... He trailed off as he lowered his hand. He had been about to insult the concept of a local woman healer. He'd heard of ladies with such pastimes before, but they were supposed to use superstition and old wives' tales. He highly doubted such superstitions could help him now. A what, my lord? the healer asked, stepping forward with something of an amused smirk on her lips. Pray, go on, you have me on tenterhooks as to what insult you were about to say. The embarrassment swelled within him, and he glared at his sister, angry she'd put him in this situation. It was not my intention to insult you, he explained, his voice deep. 
and if I had been given a shilling for each time someone had insulted me for my occupation, I would no longer need to do it. You do not need think your insult would be the first I would hear. She laughed at the idea, then turned to face Clara. I cannot help your brother if he refuses to be looked at, my lady. I'm sorry. She moved back to the door. Wait, no, my brother will behave, won't you, Daniel? Clara cut back to the door and blocked the path, begging the healer with her hands pressed together. I don't remember making such promises, Daniel said dryly and sat back in his chair. He had no wish to be rude to this young woman, but he was in a dark mood. After a dreadful night's sleep, he could summon little energy for the day ahead. Each time he took a breath, he felt as if his lungs rattled. It made him grouchy and ill-tempered. Daniel! Clara seethed quietly, though he merely shrugged in answer. I apologise for my sister wasting your time, Daniel called to the healer. It is no matter. It was my own error, the lady said, pausing in the doorway and looking back at him. Her chin was lifted high, and there was such an air of resistance in her manner that Daniel was quite drawn to her, impressed by how she did not cower at his words. I mistakenly thought I could do some good here too. I guess I was wrong in what I thought of the Marquis of Wareham. Pray, what does that mean? Daniel suddenly sat forward, his words bringing the healer to a halt on the other side of the door. What did you think of me before you stepped through my door? He was aware of Clara standing off to the side of the room now, fidgeting with her sleeves and looking between them, but her presence was almost incidental. Daniel found he could not look away from the young healer. I believed Lord Wareham to have an open mind, and I had also heard of him being a benevolent soul. The healer looked back, a mischievous smile on her full lips. Such benevolence to send away someone who has come to help you. Her dryness had him sitting forward once more, moving to the edge of his seat. You shouldn't believe everything you hear of people in gossip, miss. He gestured toward her, waiting for her name. Spencer. Miss Arabella Spencer. At her name, Daniel paused. He'd heard the name, of course he had. Her father, Mr Spencer, had once been an impressive merchant situated not far from Studland Bay. He even had an estate and at one time had tenants of his own. Yet that was many years ago. The land had fallen into disrepair as Mr Spencer's investments had fouled. So much time had passed that Daniel hadn't even realised Mr Spencer's daughter would no longer be a girl, but a young woman. Miss Spencer. He nodded to her, in acknowledgement of her name. Perhaps the gossiping town has made me sound a better man than I am. Brother, you do yourself a disservice, Clara said, stepping toward him with eagerness. I'm sure Miss Spencer would not agree with you after my lack of a welcome to her. Daniel cleared his throat, feeling the temptation to cough returning. When Miss Spencer said nothing but stayed silent, he gestured toward her. See? And you do not seek to change my opinion, I see, Miss Spencer called to him across the room. Her audaciousness had him smiling. Many a woman would have scurried away by now. He wouldn't have blamed them for it. His ill temper had made him rude and unwelcoming, yet there was something of the challenge in Miss Spencer's words that had him not wanting her to go just yet. It hardly bothers me if people think ill of me, he explained with a shrug and coughed again. He had hoped the single cough would clear his throat, but it did not. It merely brought on a more violent attack. Unable to breathe, Deeply, he sat forward, nearly retching with the force of the cough. Clara stepped behind him, clapping his back to help him, though it did little. Daniel was so lost in that cough, he was barely aware of the surrounding activity. There were words, hurried instructions too, and a panicked tone. Lord Wareham? Miss Spencer was suddenly in front of him, 
on her knees in front of his chair so she could look up into his face. Breathe in through your nose. What? He wheezed and began coughing again. Sudden pressure was placed on his back, in the centre between his shoulder blades. It made his cough deeper. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Now. Her soft instruction he tried to obey. Abruptly, the coughing ended. He repeated the breathing mechanism, finding Miss Spencer still knelt in front of him. She released his back, and the rather forward touch she had made to his body, mimicking the breathing pattern she wished for him to make. He breathed in time with her, his breath beginning to slow. That's better, she smiled in triumph. A simple breathing exercise, my lord. It's remarkably effective, I find. Daniel could say nothing. He merely blinked at her in amazement, unsure of what to say. He'd had doctors slap him on the back, and one had even clapped a hand over his mouth trying to stop him coughing. But never had he been taught a breathing exercise. I have sent Betchy for some hot water, my lady, Miss Spencer said to Clara, who took a seat beside them. I take it, my lord, you have been instructed to breathe in steam. I have, he said slowly sitting back and finding his energy had departed him. He pulled at the cravat around his throat, loosening it and then tossing it away so the neckline of his shirt was open. Miss Spencer was fussing with a leather case she placed on a small dumbwaiter table beside her. When she turned back to face him she blushed, apparently a little embarrassed to see him without his cravat. Any other time he would have smiled, delighting in the thought that maybe Miss Spencer was as struck by his appearance as he was hers, but not now. He was still concentrating on the breathing exercise she had given him. Would you allow me to look at you now, my lord? She asked calmly, reaching for some glass vials in her bag. Daniel was ready to argue when he felt a slap to his shoulder delivered by Clara. Very well, he accepted, in no mood to argue with Clara. Thank you. Miss Spencer scurried close to him on her knees and reached for his hand. What the... He pulled his hand away in amazement. Miss Spencer, how am I supposed to examine you if you will not let me touch you, my lord? She asked, an amused grin on her lips. I am thinking of the inappropriateness of having a lady in my chamber. Now you must touch me as well? He teased, finding his own mischievousness softening his expression. She looked tempted to laugh at his words, but reached for his hand again. Yes, I must. This time he didn't pull away. She took hold of his wrist and pressed two fingers to the underside. Her touch was warm and soft, a contrast to most doctors who took his pulse. Continue breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth, she instructed, counting out the pulse. When she was done, Betchy returned proffering forward a bowl of steaming water. She placed it on the table beside Miss Spencer. Thank you, Betchy. Would you prepare some hot water in a teapot too? Am I to be prescribed tea now? Daniel asked, raising a single eyebrow as Betchy hurried off for more water. If you are to question everything I suggest, my lord, this will be a long examination indeed she warned him playfully. He actually chuckled, startled he wished to so soon after a coughing fit. She began to add herbs to the steamed water. The scents of lavender and peppermint filled the air along with eucalyptus. She stirred the herbs through the water, then passed the bowl to Daniel. Breathe this in through your nose and out through your mouth. He didn't take the bowl at first but stared at it with a little suspicion, prompting the healer on her knees before him to roll her eyes. Do you wish to share your complaint with me now? she asked. It seems rather like a potion. He practically whispered the words. Aha! Do you imagine I am a witch, my lord? She laughed at the idea, still holding forward the bowl. By the pricking of my thumb, something wicked this way comes she declared, adopting a dramatic tone. Hearing the words of Shakespeare's Macbeth spoken had Daniel smiling once more. 
You are educated, Miss Spencer, he said approvingly. Strangely, we women from the town do not have nothing in our heads, she said, pushing forward the bowl once more. I apologise, I never meant to insult your education, he admitted, and took the bowl from her, watching as her lips flickered into a smile. It struck him there was something quite captivating when Miss Spencer smiled. It lit up her heart-shaped face, making it quite impossible for Daniel to look elsewhere. Bending his head over the bowl, he began to breathe in the fragrant steam. As always, the steam helped a little, but what amazed him the most was the feeling of his lungs being cleared by the scent. The more it worked, he looked up at Miss Spencer, who had dragged forward a footstool and now sat before him, attending to more glass vials in her bag. I do not believe it, he whispered, raising his chin higher. Ah, it is working then. She smiled with the words. I cannot blame you for your reticence toward me, my lord, in truth. Many a man of science and a good education would be as wary of me as you are. Yet if you will allow me to say so, what I use is merely science. She paused and gestured to the bottles. I have been educated, though my education is different from that of the doctors you have already seen. It doesn't make my knowledge of the natural world any less valuable. If you wish, I can show you some more ways to help calm what bothers your lungs so much. She paused, holding on to one of the bottles, clearly waiting for him to speak. Daniel was unsure what to say. Breathing in the lavender, eucalyptus and peppermint scent, it was easy to feel calm and not so dismissive. Miss Spencer had brought him that calmness. I am wary of you taking on this task, he said slowly. What you have seen just now is but a small attack. They can be much worse. I do not doubt it. She sat forward. He found himself leaning forward, struck that Miss Spencer carried her own scent. She smelled of rose oil, a sweet scent that was as intoxicating as the mixture she had presented him with. I do believe I can help you, my lord, but I would not press you to take advice you have no wish to hear. I offer you my services, and they are at your disposal, if you should have need of them. Daniel sat back staring at her as he considered the words. Many times he had met with a doctor or a physician who had claimed they could do wonders for his health. He'd tried new mad gadgets, amazing wondrous medicines that tasted like little more than water, and did even less. He doubted Miss Spencer could offer anything more revolutionary than the wild remedies he had already tried. And yet there was something tempting in the idea of accepting her help. If nothing more, Miss Spencer was a distraction. Before she had walked into his chamber this morning, he had been miserable, and since her appearance he had laughed, jested, and found himself staring at her. Daniel! Clara tapped his arm in reprimand again, clearly wishing him to speak. Yes, very well, he sat forward. Though I warn you, Miss Spencer, this is not an easy task, and I will not blame you if you can't do anything for me. Many men have failed. It is fortunate than I am no man, isn't it? She said with delight. He chuckled at her words just as Betty returned to the room with a teapot. Miss Spencer took the teapot and began to add herbs to the mixture. What is that you are making there? He asked, curious at the new scents filling the air. You will not like the taste, but I am certain it works. It's fennel tea. She added small fennel seeds to the mixture, then added a few drops from an oil too. This is echinacea. In case you have any lingering infection in your system, this will help too. Here, drink. She passed him the cup. When his hand brushed hers over the cup, he felt a jolt pass through his skin. Miss Spencer must have felt it too, for she nearly dropped the cup and moved back from him. Her gaze avoided his, and she looked down at her lap, fidgeting. Ah! He busied himself with drinking, then had to stop himself from gagging. It tastes awful. Yet it is good for you, and it will help. 
she sat forward once more. Now, if you will permit, I will ask a few questions about your condition, so that I can get a full overview of your case. Daniel took another gulp of the tea, glad to hesitate from answering her for a minute. This was something new to him. Most of the time, a doctor took one look at him and heard him coughing, then presumed they knew everything about the condition. Ah, I have seen it before, my lord. How many times had he heard such words before they prescribed him some awful tasting concoction? Miss Spencer was the first to inquire as to the details of his case. What do you wish to know? he asked, his tone wary. Everything. From your first symptoms when you were younger to the progression of your state to your decline now. She gestured toward him. You are clearly a healthy man in many regards, and you keep yourself physically active. She blushed with the words and looked down again, prompting Daniel to smile. Ah, she is looking at my figure. That suggests to me something recent has aggravated your condition to hinder you now. With some information, maybe we can discover what it is. She raised her eyes to his once more. If you would be prepared to talk to a healer woman, that is, my lord. Her teasing question had him smiling another time, finding there was something impossible to resist about her. I will tell you all as you wish. Chapter 5 Arabella what is it you are writing there? Lord Wareham asked, leaning out of his chair and coming toward Arabella. He'd often come near her in this meeting. The effect it had was rather startling. He was a presence in the room she couldn't deny. She rather imagined if she and Lord Wareham had met in a busy room crowded with people, she would have been just as struck by him then. Her eyes flitted up to him, tracing the cinnamon hair on his head and the unruly cropped beard on his chin. It's not double-double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble, if that's what you fear it is. She teased him, finding it was strangely easy to be mischievous with the Marquis. He laughed at her, quoting Macbeth another time. I'm writing notes on everything you have told me. She lifted the pencil from the notebook on her lap tracing the details she had written on the Marquis condition. They'd spent many minutes discussing the case. He'd gotten through two cups of tea in that time, and had even remarked that the taste of the fennel tea was not so awful by the end of it. The case itself was one that fascinated her. The Marquis's health had grown ill when he was fifteen. He'd rallied in his twenties and gone travelling. Though the occasional coughing fit still bothered him, he was able to ride, and be athletic until he had returned home. Since then, he'd been on a gradual decline. The ride he'd taken outside with his sister a few days ago in the cold had worsened his case still. Something is aggravating it. Arabella looked around the chamber, curious as to what it could be. There was only one logical conclusion for her to take. Yes, the Marquis of Wareham had a condition with his lungs that had to be managed but there was something he was reacting to in this house, something that made him worse. What do you reckon then, Dr. Spencer? he asked, leaning back in his chair as he gulped the last of his tea. She smiled at the name he gave to her. Do you reckon you can help me now you know the full details? I do, she nodded and placed her notebook and pencil back in her leather case. If you permit, I will return tomorrow to look at you again, for today I think it is important you rest. You clearly had a bad night's sleep. Are you blaming that for my grouchiness? He asked, a small smile on his lips. Shall we? She raised her eyebrows. Let's. It sounds better than me just admitting I'm a foul-tempered man. He sighed with the words and pinched the bridge of his nose. She recognised this was a habit of his, as if he was blocking out the world for a few minutes. So he was alone with his thoughts. Then that is what we will say. She stood straight, looking to Lady Clara, who stood too, with excitement so much in her manner she could not stand still. I'll return tomorrow at the same time. Until then, Miss Spencer. Lord Wareham stood. 
My lord, you do not have to get up. Despite her words, he stood anyway, looking pale for the effort, before he bowed to her. You do not have to bow to me, my lord. I am just a healer, and you are a marquis. If I did not, then I'd regret it, he said simply, standing straight once more. I may be foul-tempered, but I don't believe I've lost all propriety just yet, he offered a smile. Goodbye, Miss Spencer. Good day, my lord. She curtsied to him, feeling a strange knot in her stomach at the thought of leaving him. Breathing deeply, she turned and parted from the room, with Lady Clara following at her heels. At the door, Arabella couldn't fight the urge to look back at the Marquess. She found he had returned to his seat and was looking at her too, those light brown eyes of his. Well, that was certainly interesting, Lady Clara declared as she walked away from the door, encouraging Arabella to follow. I cannot thank you enough for coming to see him and putting up with his mood. He was not always as stubborn as he is now. I fear his illness has made him so. I understand. Arabella paused at the top of the stairs before following Lady Clara down and glanced back at the closed door of the chamber. She half wondered if Lord Wareham's stubbornness was a disillusionment of the world. For someone who had once been incredibly active in life, feeling confined to a room and a chair, must have been infuriating. She hurried to follow Lady Clara once more, startled by the draw she felt back toward Lord Wareham's chamber. Betchy, Betchy! Lady Clara called to her maid as they reached the entrance hall. That was certainly interesting. A productive meeting, my lady, Betchy asked, looking between Lady Clara and Arabella. Not only productive and helpful for my brother, but what struck me the most was the effect you had on him, Miss Spencer. Lady Clara looked at Arabella and clasped her hands with utter delight in her manner. Effect? Arabella spluttered in surprise. He was not so pleased to find me in his chamber this morning. That aside, I cannot remember seeing him smile or laugh so much, especially when he's ill, Lady Clara said in a rush. You did that. You seemed to draw him out of himself completely. I did. Arabella shifted her weight between her feet and held her leather case in front of her, as if it were some sort of shield. She saw in the way Lady Clara and Betchy looked at one another there was much they wished to say. They found amusement in the idea, both of them smiling. I think I just startled him. Yes, startled him. But in quite a manner, Lady Clara said with enthusiasm. I rather suspect my brother has a fondness for you. Truly? Betchy said beside her, bobbing on her toes. Oh, yes. Lady Clara nodded, yet Arabella was already shaking her head. I was merely a distraction to him this morning, that's all. She spoke quickly, with her words running together. Arabella looked down at herself, suddenly aware of the plainness of her dress and the creases in the skirt. She tried to flatten them out with the palm of her hand. She had never worried too much about how she looked in the past. Just as she preached to other ladies, she felt it was important for a woman to be comfortable in her own skin, and she was, but she also knew what she saw in the mirror. She was fair enough, being neither excessively plain nor very beautiful, but she was hardly some great beauty that would catch the eye of a future duke. That is a wild idea that could certainly never be. She laughed thinking her own thoughts quite wild, despite the way it made her heart thud harder in her chest to imagine Lord Wareham was as affected by her as she was him. I was glad to distract him from his illness, Arabella said, looking between Lady Clara and Betchy, who had mischievous twinkles in their eyes. You certainly did that, Lady Clara agreed, prompting Betchy to giggle beside her. I shall return tomorrow, then. Shall I return as discreetly tomorrow? Arabella asked. For now, please do, Lady Clara said slowly. I need to speak to the butler about asking the staff to keep your presence a secret. So far now, I will look out for your arrival tomorrow to keep it a secret. Very well. 
Arabella moved to the door, eager to escape before any more could be said about her and the Marquis of Wareham. He would not look at me in such a way, never. After all, I am the daughter of a poor merchant, that is all. Good day to you both. Good day, Miss Spencer. Lady Clara hastened to follow her to the door. Oh, and let me say another time, thank you so much for coming. I know my brother is not the easiest of men, but I love him dearly. And if you can do anything to help him, I'd be very grateful. I shall certainly try. Arabella smiled, knowing she had done little so far. She'd simply given the Marquis a few herbs and a breathing exercise to help manage the condition. What she truly wished to do was get to the bottom of what had aggravated his illness. Good day to you both. Good day. Lady Clara waved at Arabella in the doorway, followed by Betsy, who offered just as an animated wave. Arabella turned on the doorstep and hurried down the drive, feeling the cold air bristle at her skin. She pulled the shawl she carried tight around her shoulders, and as she walked away, another sensation made the hairs raise on the back of her neck. It was a sensation of being watched. Turning, she glanced back at the house and tilted her eyes toward the windows on the top floor. A figure moved in front of the window and was then gone. Was Lord Wareham watching me? Sitting in the kitchen, Arabella listened to the stew bubble that she had placed on the fire. It was the warmest the kitchen had been for some time, thanks to the fire she had prepared to help make dinner. Sitting close to the fire, she counted up the coins Lady Clara had offered to her before she parted. It was a healthy amount and certainly much more than she had received in the past for her work as a healer. She realised that if work continued with Lord Wareham, then the money could certainly go some way to alleviating the stress on their finances. Standing, she moved to the cauldron of stew and placed some in a bowl, then took the money and carried it with her upstairs. Without any hands to carry a candle, she moved by the light of the moon that shone through the windows, fearing what extra cost it would be if she had lit a candle to accompany her anyway. She found her father sitting in the drawing room, huddled over a writing bureau. Ah, there you are, he said distractedly, looking up at her briefly as she entered before returning his focus to the papers in front of him. I have put our money in the investments I told you of today. All will be well soon, Arabella. You'll see. I pray you are right. Though she noted he had already lost interest in her presence and was busy scribbling notes once again. Harold's jacket was haphazardly thrown over his shoulder, and his hair such a mess. She feared he was not taking care of himself properly. Now he no longer had a valet. Here, father, some money for you. She placed down the stew, and then the coins on the table too. Where did you get that? he asked, then took the coins. Well, I did a little work in town. She trailed off, not explaining what that work was. Harold was already counting out the coins. This is good, he said, nodding in approval. We can put this toward our food for this week. Do you have any more? I might do tomorrow. Excellent, yes, excellent indeed. He reached up and patted her on the arm, a smile on his features. That smile lit something warm inside her chest, pleased to have her father's approval but the sensation soon faded when Harold turned back to his notes. He clearly had little interest in talking to her tonight, much like any other night. I miss Franny. Arabella longed for conversation. She wished to tell her father about all that had happened to her that day, and the strange meeting with Lord Wareham. Yet the only sound between them was the scratching of her father's quill pen on the paper in front of him. I shall return to the kitchen to eat my dinner. If you need anything, you can call for me, she said, inching back toward the door. I will. Thank you again, Arabella. The words were a kindness, though briefly said. At the door she glanced back at her father was, yet he was tapping the feather end of the grey quill against his chin, lost in thought and seemed unaware she was still in the room at all. Turning her back on him, Arabella left the room and headed toward the stairs, returning to the kitchen. 
Basked in the light of the fire, Arabella huddled close to the grate and poured out some stew for herself, eating hungrily and barely taking a breath between each mouthful. Only when she was done did she breathe deeply and draw forward the notebook on which she had made notes about Lord Wareham's condition earlier that day. As well as the history of his condition, she had also written down observations she had made herself, deep guttural coughs from the chest rather than the throat, has a tendency to panic when he can't clear his throat, and could benefit from some more breathing exercises, fast heart rate when having a coughing fit, sometimes wheezes when he breathes. None of the symptoms added up well, but Lord Wareham overall had had a healthy hue to his skin and an easiness to his temper that she longed to believe made light of his condition. She'd seen such sicknesses before and had heard Franny talk of those that suffered with their lungs for their whole lives. It was not something that would ever completely go away, but many could live long lives as long as they managed things properly. Something is aggravating it, I am sure of it, Arabella muttered. She grew distracted, pausing as she looked through the book, thinking back to the man she had met. At first, she thought of his ill temper, finding herself growing heated and angry at his rejection of her help. Then everything shifted. She thought of the way he had laughed at her challenging words, his easy smile, and the way he had leaned toward her repeatedly, either to hear her better or just to be closer to her. Oh, this is inconvenient. She closed up the book and tipped her chin back, as if she could look through the ceiling and up to the heavens themselves, where God sat and could hear her prayer. I should not be attracted to Lord Wareham. I should not think highly of him or with any fondness. Such things can only spell disaster. I am certain of it. She half wondered if God would answer her, but no sound came, and the only noises in the room at all were the cracking of the fire in the hearth beside her. This is a professional relationship only. Yes, that's it. She let the book thud to the table beside her, determined to keep to her resolution. Chapter 6 Daniel, I shall go downstairs. For God's sake, the stairs are not difficult. Yet even as he spoke to himself, Daniel stumbled across his room and reached for the mantelpiece over the fire. Clinging to the marble, he held himself up and breathed deeply. Or maybe it is. I warrant it won't be by the end of the week. At the familiar soft voice, Daniel jerked his head to see Miss Spencer had returned. She stood in his doorway, smiling as she held onto her leather case, with Betsy standing beside her. Oh dear, bad time? she asked, gesturing to Daniel. There doesn't seem to be a better one on the horizon. He sighed and turned his head away, trying to hide his disappointment. There had been a time when meeting someone like Miss Spencer would have done much to him. He would have gone out of his way to try and impress her, but such things seemed impossible now. Forgive me, Miss Spencer, I do not think I can get down the stairs. You will, by the end of the week, she strode into the room. Betchy, could we have some hot water again, both in a bowl and a teapot? Of course. Betchy hurried off, though she left the door open, so technically Daniel was not completely alone with Miss Spencer. Clara seemed to be hovering about in the corridor, watching them from a distance. Now, Lord Wareham. Miss Spencer put her bag down on a dumbwaiter table and curtsied to him before gesturing to his standing position. You're up, which is at least a good sign. Would you tell me how you fared in the night? Awfully, he said, his voice deep. The lack of sleep was making him grumpy again, and no matter how much his good sense told him he should not be taking it out on poor Miss Spencer, his voice was still sharp. I'm sorry. Apparently my manners have left me. I've heard sharper voices. She reached his side and took his wrist. He jolted, shocked by the touch, but he didn't pull away and angled his head toward her. Your heart rate is calmer, at least. Come, sit down. 
Let's talk about what your other doctors have prescribed for you. She sat down on the footstool, much as she had done the day before, and Daniel took the armchair. He gestured to the table, to a smoking box where he kept one such remedy. That seems to be a favourite of the doctor's recommendations, he said, his breathing heavy as he sat back. This? She opened the engraved wooden lid of the smoking box. Then her jaw fell open. They have told you to smoke. The doctors say it clears the airways, he explained with a shrug. He'd barely finished the words when she closed the lid loudly on the box. You must stop smoking at once. I beg your pardon? He laughed, rather startled by the audacity of the order. Is that a request or an instruction? She smiled and raised a single eyebrow. Ah, the latter, I see. Audacious for an untitled woman to order around a Marquess? Perhaps, yes, but when he's doing foolish things like smoking, I think it justified. The boldness of her words had him laughing, startled by how easily she could lighten his mood within just a few minutes of being in the room. Smoking clogs up the lungs, it doesn't clear it. Whoever recommended it to you does not know the true nature of what smoking does. With respect, Miss Spencer, how can you be sure? Aren't these doctors educated to the highest level? He felt guilty the moment the words were out of his lips and extended an apologetic hand toward her. But her eyes had already widened. And what education could I possibly have? That's not what I meant, he hurried to say, but she cut him off. Tell me, my lord, when you smoke, do you cough? she asked, leaning forward and resting her chin in her hand. Yes, he nodded recalling that each time he inhaled the smoke, he coughed. And do you feel a tightness across here? She gestured to her own sternum. Yes, he murmured, his voice growing graver. Have you ever coughed up anything black? she asked. His eyes widening must have been the only answer she needed. Then you do not need the education of a doctor to know smoking is poor for the lungs. My advice, forget this box even exists. She took the smoking box and stood discarding it across the room. Daniel was so amused by her firmness that he let her do it without protest. He had never liked smoking anyway, and having the irritating habit taken away from him was something of a relief. Is there anything else I should do or not do as the case might be? He asked, keen to see where she would go next. There are a few things I'd like to try. With her hands on her hips, she strode toward the windows and suddenly opened them wide. What the... He jerked back in his armchair, just as Clara poked her head through the doorway, clearly with equal concern. Miss Spencer, it was the cold air that set me off last time. We keep the windows closed. Fresh air does wonders for every illness, she explained with a wave of her hand and moved on to the next window. It may be the case the cold air caused you discomfort, or something else could have been the trigger last time. Either way, sitting in a room stewing with your own dust and breathing in your own expelled air will not do you any good at all. Do you see? She turned back to face him. The words sounded so reasonable, so logical, that he couldn't argue. He sat forward, resting his elbows on his knees and nodded slowly. You are certainly different to the normal physician, Miss Spencer. His voice had deepened. Thank God for that, she said with vigour and threw her arms out wide. Her dramatic manner was captivating and he watched her incessantly, smiling at her. I would consider it an insult to be thought just another stuffy old doctor. I would too, he agreed with her. She hurried back to his side and sat down on the footstool, coming close, though he did not lean away from her. Now, here is what I shall tell you after perusing your notes last night. She brought out her notebook and laid it on her lap. In my opinion, there's a pattern. A pattern? What kind? Of being in this house. She gestured to the room around them. When you were travelling... You had your setbacks, but you were largely fine, yes? Yes, he agreed, speaking slowly. 
I've seen people with such conditions before, my lord, who have triggers. Something in the air that their body reacts to. I believe you may be one such case. She gestured toward him. Daniel blinked, noting once again how logical her words were. No doctor ever suggested such a thing. Why not? The fact they hadn't seemed quite mad. He had to accept the truth that often when he was in this house, it was when his condition worsened again. You will make a believer of me yet, Dr. Spencer, he gestured toward her. What would you have me do? No more potions, I hope. Just more fennel tea. She laughed at his words. Fair is foul and foul is fair. She quoted the witches from Macbeth again, prompting him to laugh with her. She is quite a wonder. Very well, what could be these triggers you speak of? He gestured toward her, encouraging her to go on. Let's see. She stood to her feet and moved around the room. First, she stepped toward the mantelpiece and prodded a finger at the marble. Your room might need dusting more often, for dust hanging in the air can worsen a cough. Are there animals in this house? My father has dogs, Daniel explained. They are mostly looked after by the groundsmen at present, but they come into the house. Then sadly, they might have to stay out of this chamber, she motioned to the room. Sleeping in the same room with so much animal hair can pose a problem. I have a feeling I'm about to face many instructions this week, he said, sitting forward. Are you content to follow them, my lord? she asked, returning to face him. I realise this may be forward. Even bold of me. Certainly, he said, watching as she hung her head forward a little, an embarrassed flush spilling into her cheeks. Yet you will hear no complaint from me. Do as you wish, Miss Spencer. I am in your hands. The smile that lifted her cheeks had him mirroring that look. I told you, my lord, one week and we would have you downstairs. Miss Spencer walked ahead of him, striding down the stairs. Daniel clung to the banister with one hand, sticking to the landing for a minute and not following her. What a week it has been. At the beginning of the week, he was happy to think of her both as ambitious and a little mad for suggesting he would be able to come down the stairs, but not now. He felt capable of doing so, having followed her instructions all week only to discover his lungs felt clearer than they had in a long time. Each morning he did some breathing exercises, concentrating on the flow of breath to maintain control. He also spent many minutes breathing in the scented steam, helping to clear his nose and any stuffiness. He slept with a window open for part of the night, to keep the air circulating around his room, and the maids had dusted the space twice that week. One night, when the dogs had tried to come in, They'd been shooed away. I cannot believe how I feel. Daniel stood tall at the top of the stairs, taking a deep breath in through his nose and out through his mouth. It was clear, with no temptation to cough, lingering in his throat at all. Miss Spencer stopped as she reached the bottom step, turning to face him with the loose tendrils of her auburn hair flicking over her shoulder. Ready, my lord, she called to him. Daniel strode down the stairs with surprising ease. The steps felt like no challenge at all, and he was something of his old self. So much so that when she reached his side, she clapped her hands together. I should have placed a wager on you being able to do the stairs, for I knew it would happen. I would have happily paid up. He laughed and turned in a circle, gesturing to himself. I can't believe how much stronger I feel. Excellent, but a step at a time. She beckoned him to follow. I asked Betchy to set up your tea for you in the drawing room. She led the way to the drawing room and he followed, finding one of the maids hurrying out of it, having just dusted the place. His usual fennel tea was placed on a table in the middle of the room and another maid hung in the corner ready to chaperone. Miss Spencer moved to the window and opened it wide. The memory of what the cold air had done to him still had him a little nervous about the chill of the air. Fear not, it will not be open for long, she assured him and moved to the table. 
Daniel sat hurriedly and poured out the tea. There was fennel tea for him, and Miss Spencer poured herself mint tea. He could have talked to her about the progress he had made, but Daniel found no wish to. All week they'd found themselves talking about other things besides his condition. It was surprisingly easy to talk to Miss Spencer, and Daniel felt that same longing to talk to her so freely now. Can I ask, what made you wish to work as a healer? He asked, passing her some biscuits that had been freshly made that morning. You wish to know? She seemed surprised, her eyebrows shooting upward. Of course. He gestured for her to go on. I confess, I'm curious about you. Is that so wrong? He laughed at himself, rather distracted by the pleasant blush on her cheeks. It hadn't escaped his notice that week how different Miss Spencer was to some of the other young ladies he knew. Many a woman on the continent had shunned him for his ill health, and he knew just as many ladies who spent their days fussing over the clothes they wore and their accomplishments, such as learning to play the pianoforte a little better. Miss Spencer was an entirely different woman. Not once had she fussed over her gown or concerned herself with how she looked. She thought only of her work, and it seemed busied herself with the task of making him smile. What other woman would concern herself so much with that? He waited for her to go on, admiring her intently as she brushed the loose locks of her auburn hair behind her ear. It started when I was young, she explained. After my mother died, I ended up spending a lot of time with Franny, our cook. The smile on her lips spoke volumes of the tenderness of her friendship with this cook. A good friend to you, Daniel observed. Just so, she nodded. Franny showed me the power the natural world could have. She talked of how it could bring health, and with it, happiness. She leaned forward, her body so animated as she talked, and waved her hands. She seemed to forget about the biscuits and the tea. Seeing the difference she could make to people's lives, that was everything to me. I remembered once how my mother said we should always help others, and the thought of being like Franny, helping others in such a way. It was a powerful thing, my lord. She abruptly hung her head, looking down at her plate. I'm prattling on. Nonsense, of course you're not. He dismissed the idea with a wave of his hand. I'm enjoying listening to you. Thank you. She looked up once again. I always wanted to help people, my lord, and this... She gestured toward him. It seemed the perfect way. What better thing could there be in this world than to bring health, and with it, a smile? He blinked, stunned at her words. The true altruism and the kindness within her were something that baffled him. I do not think I've ever met another lady like you, my lady. His words clearly shocked her, for she sat taller in her seat and busied herself with picking up her teacup. What, a witch? I fear you suspected me once of being one on that first day of our meeting. I shall have to brush up on my Macbeth knowledge, for I fear I am running out of quotes. Her mischievousness made him laugh. No, I mean, someone who is so eager to help others. His voice became deep. I've seen much of the world these last few years in my travels, and to my shame, I have to say that extent of kindness is not something you find very often. That's a cynical way to look at the world, surely, she said, putting her teacup down so hurriedly that it chinked in the cup. Maybe cynical? Maybe practical? He considered the answer as he looked at her. Let us say it is refreshing to be in the company of a lady such as you, Miss Spencer. She smiled so broadly that Daniel found it difficult to look away. What is this feeling? He may have only known her a week, but Daniel had already noticed he looked forward to seeing her each day, and in their meetings, he barely took notice of the chaperones in the room. Even now he had forgotten a maid sat in the corner, busying herself with some embroidery. I am forming an affection for Miss Spencer. It was not a fact he could escape, nor did he wish to. 
for it was such a natural feeling. If I may, there is something I wish to give you. He reached into the pocket of his tailcoat, hurrying to find something. He'd observed that despite his first fear, she would be a woman full of superstition. Relying on myths, when it came to remedies, she was nothing of the sort. Miss Spencer's remedies relied firmly on science and botany. Here it is. He pulled out a book that was usually found in their library and proffered it toward her. What's this? she asked, taking the book and peeling back the cover. A gift? I brought it back from London on my last journey. I have a feeling you will treasure it more than I ever could. He softened his voice, feeling a strange warmth spreading through his chest as he watched her eyes dance across the title page. The Botany Dictionary. She delighted in the title, her eyes widening. I have heard of it but never read it. My Lord, I cannot accept this. Why not? he asked, disappointed as she tried to give the book back to him. Her movements became quite frantic, trying to put the book in his hands. Consider it my thanks for your help this week. You already pay me for my work, she reminded him. He placed a hand over the book and calmly pushed it toward her. When their fingers brushed, her gaze shot to his. There was something intense in that look, something he hadn't felt before, but he had no desire to look away. It is my personal thanks. Please keep it. He released the book, knowing he had to stop touching her soon. She smiled and wrapped her arm around the book. Thank you so much, my lord. I can't tell you how happy this makes me. Most ladies would want gifts of pearls or some fine jewellery, he commented, offering her the plate of biscuits as she burst out laughing. As I said before, my lord, I am not like other ladies, she said, taking some biscuits. No, indeed. He was delighted to find she was so different. Chapter 7 Clara Betchy I cannot be the only one who has noticed it, surely. Even Horatio said something last night, Clara said eagerly to Betchy as they climbed down from the carriage. He came to collect me from the house, only to comment that Daniel seems much changed. He smiles a lot. The effect of a week in Arabella's company, it would seem, Betchy said with a giggle and then hid behind her hand. I should not say such things, should I? You know you can always say such things with me, my friend. Betchy waved off the idea as they left the carriage behind and approached the house. Clara had come for a tea party at one of her friend's houses, though in truth she was not sure she would be able to concentrate on the party at all, let alone her friend's conversations. Her mind was absorbed at present by the change in her brother. It wasn't just that in the space of a week Miss Spencer had managed to improve Daniel's health, though it was true. But the way the two of them talked together, that intrigued Clara so much. More than once when she went to chaperone, she had seen them sitting close together, talking openly. It had gotten to the point where they spent so much time together that it could not be kept a secret from the staff anymore. The butler had been told first who was shocked at such a secret being kept from the Duke and Duchess until he too observed the change in Daniel. It struck Clara that since Daniel had started coming downstairs again, the butler had offered no comments. He merely watched over some of Daniel's and Miss Spencer's meetings with a smile on his lips. There is one thing that concerns me, though... Clara confessed as she took Betchy's arm in her own, and they walked up the drive to the house together. Beneath them, the gravel path had practically frozen, making the stones crunch beneath Clara's shoes even more than normal. What is that? Betchy asked. As much as I'm thrilled to see Daniel distracted and enjoying Miss Spencer's company, I fear they will form a serious attachment. Clara's words made Betchy stop at her side. Forgive me, my lady, but is that a great wrong 
if they did. My friend Arabella, she is wonderful, Betchy said, her voice pitching high in defence. I know it. Clara patted her hand in comfort. I have seen it myself and I like her greatly. The reason I worry is because if a serious attachment was to form between the two of them, then my father... She broke off, finding her mouth was suddenly dry. What would my father say about that? She could imagine only one way for such a conversation to go. If Daniel ever expressed a wish to court Miss Spencer, Gregory would no doubt be furious. I have never thought of my father as a particularly proud man, Clara explained in a whispered rush as she directed Betchy forward to the house once again. But he is incredibly conscious of the family's position. When Danielle went travelling, I still remember a conversation my father had with him about the nature of his travels. He warned Daniel who he should mix with. I fear if Daniel wished to court the daughter of a poor merchant, my father would not allow it. Betchy's manner was subdued at once. Where there had been excitement and lightness in her step before, there was now merely sadness and a heavy gait. It's so sad, Betchy murmured. Should two people be so divided who care for one another? We do not know what they feel for one, another yet. So let us take comfort in that. After all, they have only known each other for just over a week. Clara reminded her friend as she stepped toward the front door, bordered with twiggy wisteria, and knocked. To presume an attachment on either side would be forward at this point, even for me. Horatio would laugh at me and say I had been reading too many books once again. She chuckled, but noticed Betchy did not laugh at her side. Betchy, I am sorry, I'm just thinking aloud, that is all. I know, Beachy said, nodding in agreement. It has just struck me how right you are, though, my lady. If my friend was to form an attachment on your brother, she might face bitter disappointment. Clara swallowed, feeling her nerves return. She could recall watching over Daniel and Miss Spencer just the day before. As Miss Spencer had passed a cup of fennel tea into his hands, this time when their fingers had brushed on the cup, neither one of them had moved away from each other. In fact, they'd only jolted apart when Clara had cleared her throat, making her presence known. I fear despite the little time they've spent together, there may be an attachment already. Before Clara could voice any more concerns on the matter, though, the door to the house was opened, and Lady Caroline Walter's butler opened the door and beckoned them inside. This way, Lady Clara Fitzroy. He bowed deeply to her, then carved a path through the house. They appeared in a vast room at the back of the house where two tables had been set up. On one side of the room was a small table for the ladies' maids to gather and chat. Betchy hurried off to take her seat, talking with the other maids, as Clara turned her attention to the vast table where at the head her host sat holding court. Ah, Lady Clara. Lady Caroline jumped to her feet and came to greet Clara, holding her hand and kissing her on the cheek. I am so glad you are here at last. I thought you were too busy spending time with that handsome husband of yours to come, but I hear you have actually been concerned about the state of your brother. Tell me, are the rumours true? Is he suffering with his health? Well, I... Clara struggled to know what to say. Lady Caroline seemed to be asking out of genuine concern, but Clara couldn't be certain it was not asked purely for the want of gossip. She felt a need to protect her brother. He is recovering well, thank you. Clara smiled, showing she had no intention of saying any more. I'm glad to hear it. Lady Caroline took her arm and led her toward the table. I do so hate to hear rumours whispered of others, don't you? I'd much prefer to have the truth of a matter from the source. Hmm. Clara avoided offering any words, for she sensed what Lady Caroline had truly been intending to do, confirm the gossip. Here, sit, Lady Clara. Lady Caroline took her place at the head of the table, as Clara sat down, allowing her eyes to dance across the table. 
Miss Harriet Pilkington and her sister sat at the opposite end of the table. The former's smoky grey eyes turned away from Clara, not even deigning to glance her way once. Clara bit her lip to stop herself from laughing at the idea, for she knew why Miss Pilkington disliked her so much these days. She had her heart and mind set on Horatio. Yet Horatio had never once looked at Miss Pilkington with any serious heart. He'd laughed preposterously at the idea of him courting Miss Pilkington. Shortly after he and Clara had married, she had pointed out how keen Miss Pilkington was for such a courtship, and he had laughed showing that he had never even considered courting anyone but Clara. There was never anyone but you, Clara, not really. Such words made her smile now and sit taller in her seat, determined not to be saddened by Miss Pilkington's dislike of her, especially when it was merely based on envy. Her eyes danced across the group where she saw others that she knew. There was Miss Withers sitting close by, with glossy black hair and dark eyes that were as beautiful as ever. She dominated conversation as much as she always did. I am certain of it. Nothing will change my mind on the matter. Miss Withers sighed with the words and fluttered a hand in front of her face as if overcome. Oh, you poor dear, Lady Caroline said and reached toward her, performing the role of a sympathetic friend rather aptly. My heart is taken by a man, I am convinced. For what other reason could I be thinking of him all day as I do? Her words prompted Clara to lift her teacup and hide her smile behind the rim, taking a small sip. From what she knew of Miss Withers, the lady put as much stock into financial affairs as she did a person's character. It made Clara wonder if Miss Withers truly did love a gentleman or his wallet. I'm quite distracted by him, yet I do not know what to do about it. I fear he does not know I exist. She bemoaned the idea and tipped her head back dramatically. I am sure that isn't true, Lady Caroline said with feeling. For whom could not notice you? He has not, I fear, Miss Withers said miserably. I heard a tale in the village the other day about a local woman who makes love potions. Have you heard of her? Miss Pilkington's words caught Clara's interest. She sat forward in her chair, attentive to the words. Love potions? Surely such things don't exist. Clara tried to laugh off the idea, but Miss Pilkington went on as if she hadn't heard her. A local woman, or witch, they say, Miss Pilkington added with a wistful voice. She must be someone quite powerful to ensnare the senses in such a fashion. Love potion! That is interesting, Miss Withers said, chewing her lip in thought. Who makes these potions? Do you know her name? No. Miss Pilkington shook her head. I heard a whisper, though, from the village. My maid heard something whispered between the other maids, something about Dea or Dea. I'm not sure. I could ask my maid if you like. Oh, if you would, that would be wonderful, Miss Withers gushed at the idea. Clara nearly dropped her cup twice. Not only was she shocked at the idea of Miss Withers actually engaging someone to make a love potion for her, but the name had caught her interest. Bonadea. She's talking of Bonadea, of Miss Arabella Spencer. Clara's mouth had turned dry and no matter how many times she sipped her tea, she could not quench that dryness. Her mind kept turning back to Miss Spencer and the help she'd given Clara. She is no witch. The woman provides tonics, certainly not love potions to bewitch a gentleman's mind. Clara was so startled that she barely said a word for the rest of the tea. She merely sipped her drink and ate her cake. Even when she came to depart and Lady Caroline laid a hand to her arm in concern, Clara made her excuses quickly. Are you sure you are well, Lady Clara? I do hope it is not concern for your brother that is worrying you. I am quite well. Thank you for the invitation, my lady. Clara offered her customary curtsy, then hastened from the room, waving a mad hand at Betchy as she did so. Betchy scurried behind her, and the two hastened out onto the path in front of the house. With Clara striding forward so fast, Betchy had to practically run to keep up with her. It was fortunate the sun was shining today, 
making the wintry frost begin to break, otherwise Clara might have slipped more than once in the ice. Goodness, what is wrong, my lady? Betsy asked, hurrying at her side and clutching to the bonnet on her head to stop it from flying off in the wind. I can scarcely believe what I have just heard, Clara said in a hissing whisper as they reached the carriage. They actually talked of Bonadea in there. They did, Betsy asked and nearly fell into the side of the carriage in her surprise. Do be careful, dear, in you condition. Clara offered her hand to Betsy and helped the maid into the carriage. Betsy sat heavily on the bench and laid a hand to her rounded stomach, clearly caring for the unborn child. They did not mention her by her real name, did they? Betsy asked, her nerves straining her voice. That is her greatest fear. No, they did not, Clara said as she followed her lady's maid into the carriage. Yet in my opinion, there is another greater fear now. Betsy. They suggested that she makes love potions. Potions? Betsy repeated, her jaw falling slack. She's a healer, not a witch. Yet they seemed to think she might be. Oh, it was absurd. One lady even looked fascinated about the idea, as if she desired nothing more than to seek out one of these love potions herself. Clara shook with anger as she sat beside Betsy on the bench. As the carriage set off, that anger stayed with her, not dissipating for one minute. I am worried, Betsy. As am I. Betsy murmured in a whisper. If people are already whispering that Bonadea is a witch, what if that rumour was to spread further? Those ladies talk as greatly as the wind blows and probably with more energy too, she said with wit, then shook her head. What if the rumour was to spread far? And God forbid anyone should truly discover just who Bonadea is. Clara was careful never to say Miss Spencer's name, just in case her voice carriage beyond the windows of the carriage, to any passers-by. What would become of her reputation then? Let us hope it is a fear that is unfounded, my lady, Betsy said, though her hands began to fidget over her swollen stomach, not resting for a second. I pray Arabella is safe, and such rumours will never come to pass. Yet Clara could not be satisfied with such prayers. She had seen firsthand how the ladies and gentlemen of the ton could become enamoured with a story and spread it through friends, foe and staff. Within days, people could be whispering of a witch in Wareham and her powers to ensnare a gentleman's heart in love. Chapter 8 Arabella 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 Goodness, Betsy. You do not need to squeal so I can hear you. Arabella laughed as she opened the kitchen door and beckoned her friend inside. Quick, hurry by the fire as I'm cooking. It will keep you warm. Why are you still walking so far in your state? Do you not grow tired? The tiredness is worth it. Yet as Betsy hurried to sit by the fire with the flames basking her in an orange glow, she sighed deeply and yawned. Arabella feared her friend was putting herself to too much trouble. Here, sit for a while. I have something that will help you. Arabella reached into one of the kitchen cupboards and retrieved a tin in which she had placed some cakes. She pulled out a small bun and proffered it toward Betsy on a plate. Made with banana, cinnamon and yoghurt. It's good for one's energy levels. Truly? Oh, in which case, thank you. Betsy took the cake and ate a hefty bite, so much so that she ended up with spongy crumbs all over her lips and cheeks. I blame the baby. They are making me hungry wherever I go. Eating for two, as they say. Arabella chuckled at the idea and drew a second chair to the fire, sitting down with her friend. She was glad for the excuse to smile after the afternoon she'd had. That morning, she'd gone to see Lord Wareham again, 
and pass the time in a very pleasant way. As she had administered his usual tonics, they had not talked of anything to do with his condition, but other things entirely. She had listened to the stories of his travels, where in particular he talked of his rides and the wonders he'd seen. When he'd asked her if she had ever gone riding, she'd confessed she'd never had a chance to, though she'd always wished to learn. It had been a happy time indeed until she had returned home to find her father quite miserable. Sat on the doorstep in the frost that was melting, he hadn't even made it into the house. His trousers were coated in the melting frost, as he told Arabella that his latest investment had gone sour. He had to get rid of the groundskeeper, just about the last member of staff they kept. The reality of how shockingly poor their financial situation now was grated deep within Arabella. When she had offered up some money to her father, she chose not to give it all. She gave him just a few coins and placed the remaining amount in a tin that rested on the mantelpiece over the kitchen fire. She intended to create a store of money for emergencies, when her father didn't have a single bean left. If I am to create some savings, I will need another customer somehow. You have come a long way to see me this evening, Arabella observed, watching Betchy eat ravenously. I take it you didn't come just to eat my cakes. I wish I had, Betchy said around a mouthful, before taking another smaller bite. I came to issue a warning to you. A warning? Arabella muttered in surprise. She busied herself, leaning forward and stirring the casserole she was cooking over the fire, letting some of the steam from the pot waft over her face and heat her cheeks. Lady Clara went to a tea party today and you should hear what they said. Arabella listened with perfect stillness to what her friend had to say. The rumour was not a good one. If whispers were spreading of a witch in town, someone who claimed to have love potions, then that boded ill indeed. Love potions do not exist, Arabella said once her friend was done, wrinkling her nose. The whole idea is absurd. It is not science, but superstition. I know. Betchy sighed deeply. Yet I'm still relieved to hear you say that. I fear some people will approach you because of these rumours, hoping for such love potions. I will not oblige them by providing such fripperies and nonsense. Arabella sat back and folded her arms firmly, thinking the whole idea quite ridiculous. She could imagine just what Lord Wareham would say about the matter. He would laugh, pointing out that the line between science and people's faith sometimes seemed to be a blurred one. Since when did I start imagining him in conversations he was not a part of? The thought caught Arabella's interest and had her sitting taller in her chair. She supposed it had something to do with the fact she missed Lord Wareham when she was not with him. He was easy to speak to, and his good humour had a way of lightening the load on her shoulders. Yet you may get customers out of this, Betchy said slowly, dabbing a finger at the crumbs on her plate. Surely that is a good thing. If I am approached, then work is not something I can turn down, Arabella confessed in a whisper. My father sent away the groundskeeper today, and that is just about the last of the staff. If he continues to make such poorer investments, then we will surely not be able to stay here. She gestured to the house they sat in, thinking it quite strange that she and her father were still here. She supposed if her father was a wise man when it came to finances, he would have sold the house long ago, but he wasn't wise. He was desperate and someone who liked to cling to the dream of being wealthy again. She guessed her father kept the house in the insane hope that tomorrow morning everything would be well again and his coffers would be full. Fools and their money, they are often bedfellows. These were words Lord Wareham had said to her in passing over the last few days, when they had become lost down a rabbit warren of conversation. Realising she was imagining he was part of the conversation once again, she shook herself and leaned forward, devoting her attention to the casserole. I cannot turn down work, but I will not provide love potions, Arabella said slowly. 
You could provide your tonics for people as you did with Lady Clara and others before her, Betchy encouraged. There is nothing wrong with those. That is true. Arabella paused with the spoon deep in thought. Yes, if such work is needed, I'm happy to do it. Her eyes flicked to the tin where she had placed inside a few coins from Lord Wareham. If she could add to the hoard, then at least she could offer some sort of cushion for her father's financial errors. She could buy them food even when he thought they could not afford it. I shall simply have to be more cautious, Arabella continued on, taken up by the thought. You used to use the oak tree in the village for your communications, Betchy said, leaning forward with excitement. You could do that again? Yes, I could, Arabella nodded in agreement. You must also seek to stress that what you do isn't witchcraft, Betchy pleaded, her hand gestures becoming animated. Of course. Arabella nodded, thinking and planning fast. Any communication I have, I will stress what I really do. It is a matter for science, not myth and magic. That is wise, Betchy said in agreement. I will cling to the pstonym as much as I can, and I will be especially careful that no one shall discover my identity. I guess I must just pray that no one at Lord Warraham's house will start whispering about my visits there and begin to suspect. She shifted, uncomfortable at the thought. Lady Clara has sworn all the staff to secrecy. They know you're a healer, but they do not know the name Bonadea, so I do not see how they could cause trouble for you, Betchy said with eagerness. I think this could be a good thing in the end, Arabella. Yes, the nonsense about love potions is a complication, but if people are talking of you, then you may get some new customers, may you not? Yes, you are right. Arabella stood and laid a hand to the tin of coins. She didn't open it, but rested her finger upon the lid, thinking of the few things the money could buy her. Maybe some fresh coal for the fire, or seeds that she could plant in the kitchen garden now that the ground was beginning to thaw. With more herbs and more fresh food that was homegrown, she would not have to go shopping so much then. Thank you for coming to tell me, Betchy. I believe you are right. This could lead to good things. I truly hope so, Betchy declared and moved to her feet with the empty plate, before her face dropped as she looked at its emptiness. I don't suppose you have another small cake, do you? She asked with hope. I believe I may have another for you, Arabella said and took the plate. This way, my lord. Arabella thrust open the double doors that looked out onto the lawn from the garden room and stepped out. Today was the first day in many weeks where she had felt some heat in the sun. She stood a little way from the door and tipped her head up toward the sun, feeling it warm her cheeks. Yes, thank you, Miss Spencer. I know the way to my own garden, Lord Wareham said dryly. She couldn't help smiling as she glanced back at him over her shoulder, noting the way he hovered back from the door inside the house, with his arms folded. Then, why are you not stepping out into it? she asked, watching as he smiled a little too. This often seems to be our way. In the last two weeks that she had been attending to him, she had seen time and time again how his dry humour could be shifted by her challenging comments. He also smiled at her comments, rather than dismissed them as the audacious remarks of a member of staff. Strange, I do not feel like a member of staff when I'm with Lord Wareham. A walk will you do no harm, my lord, I am sure of it, she reminded him and stepped back further into the garden. I would like to argue with you on that. His honey eyes danced across the garden warily, making the skin around his eyes crease. If you wish to argue with me, then you shall have to catch me in order to do it. She smiled and walked off into the garden, aware that his eyebrows had shot up in amazement. Turning her feet toward the nearby borders, she trailed between them, looking back intermittently to see what he would do next. Eventually, Lord Wareham stepped outside. He turned the collar of his jacket up against the chill and pressed his face into it, preferring to breathe in through the fabric rather than the cold air. Trust me, my lord, 
she called to him. I wouldn't let any harm come to you. Debatable, he called back. Do you not trust me by now? Her words seemed to capture his interest. He stared at her across the garden with such a level gaze that she felt pinned to the spot, wondering when those eyes had developed the power of such intensity. Lord Wareham began to walk forward, his tall figure eating up the ground quickly. He no longer looked like an invalid. There was a healthy pinkness to his skin, and as he walked his long legs took the strides with ease. Within seconds he had caught up to Arabella in the garden. There now, was that so difficult? she asked, gesturing toward him. Not yet, he murmured, a wariness still in his tone. Very well, if you are testing me, for I hazard a guess that is what you are doing. I do not deny it, she said playfully, watching as his smile grew. Then let us test me properly. He clasped his hands together and strode forward, walking freely through the garden and tipping his head back. Of course you'll have to keep up with me now, Miss Spencer. That is an unfair challenge. Your legs are much longer than mine. She had to practically run to catch up with him, chasing down the sound of his laughter. Soon they fell into step together, walking with ease, and Arabella quite forgot the fact they'd walked out of the house and away from their chaperone. She supposed it was not so important. After all, anyone could look out of the house windows and see them together, chaperoning them from a distance. This feels surprisingly good, Lord Wareham said after a minute or so. Tipping his head back, he breathed in deeply, and he didn't cough with the effort to do so. I feel like me again. I'm thrilled. I can even smell things clearly, this I can smell this. He turned and gestured to a lavender box. Lavender, Arabella explained as he pressed his fingers to the leaves and lifted them to his nose, inhaling deeply. So I can walk again freely. He turned in a circle and held out his arms, as if on display on a stage. Are you not pleased with my progress, Miss Spencer? He stopped turning and looked at her with an artful smile. Do I not impress you? Very much. She found she couldn't look away from him. The attached gaze stole her breath away, and she was the one whose breath hitched as she at last ended that look and turned from him, continuing her walk. Perhaps you could even ride again soon, she pointed out. I know how much you love to ride. You think I could? he asked, a little trepidation in his voice as he hastened alongside her. Why could you not? Riding was what set me off last time, he said, his voice deep as he looked ahead at their path. I thought you said it was the cold weather, she murmured, looking at him as they walked. It was all too easy to trace the handsome lines of his features and the way he turned a smile on her, even when she hadn't said anything amusing. Well, can I now argue it was both? he asked, shrugging. I think something set you off that day, but I do not see why you can't go riding now as long as you take it easy and manage your condition, my lord, she explained with care. Breathe your fragrant steam before and after your ride. Also, you must not do this for long periods of time. She reached up toward him and flicked down the collar of his jacket so he could no longer breathe through it. His gaze snapped toward her and she jumped back, realising how close she had come. I'm sorry, it's just... Tongue-tied, she struggled to know what to say. Ahem. If you breathe in through your jacket or breathe the horse's hair too closely, that could clog your lungs too. She walked ahead, increasing the distance between them, aware how jittery her hand was at having come so close to him. Is there a reason you're running off from me now, Miss Spencer? He called and hurried to catch up with her. No reason I am merely testing you further, she lied, relieved when he didn't press her. She often came close to him and had to in order to attend to him when he had an attack or a coughing fit, but that brief touch was something different to the rest. Out here, they were unchaperoned. There were no watchful eyes to be wary of those touches. 
The touch had made her heart thud in her chest, and the heat of his gaze upon her had her wondering if he had felt that jitteriness too. No, it is all in my imagination, for why would a Marquis ever look at me in such a way? I am only his healer. They walked on in silence for some minutes, though Arabella was careful to keep a little distance between them. Perhaps I could try riding again, he said eventually, being the first to break the silence. If I tried a short ride first. He glanced toward her. Maybe we could even give you a lesson. A lesson? Me? She stopped walking, so startled by the words. He seemed to take great enjoyment in her reaction, chuckling as he gestured toward her. You'd think I had suggested teaching you to fly and flap your arms like the birds over our heads. It is not that. It is just... She chewed her lip, nervously. She had always wanted to learn to ride. Ever since she was young, she'd been fond of the idea. But the opportunity had never presented itself. I couldn't, my lord. I am here as your healer. Yes, and you wish to learn to ride, do you not? He asked, holding out his hands as if it were a very simple thing. Perhaps just one short lesson? We'll see. I have to keep a close eye on my patient first. She nodded her head toward him as they started walking together again. This patient is feeling surprisingly on excellent form. He puffed out his chest and breathed in deeply. I'm beginning to think you truly are capable of magic, Miss Spencer. When shall we three meet again? Arabella began her oldest jest with the Marquis, quoting Macbeth. In thunder, lightning, or in rain? He took over the quote and laughed deeply. Your recent quotes have made me read it again. I'm beginning to think that maybe I could actually go and see a performance soon, without disturbing the audience by coughing through the entire thing. What do you reckon? Is it possible? Certainly. Arabella busied herself thinking what it could be like to be the one on Lord Wareham's arm as he attended such an event. No other thought had put such a smile on her face before. Chapter 9 Daniel Ah, I am not sure of this. Daniel hovered by the carriage, looking up to where his sister was sitting, waiting for him inside. Daniel, if you do not get in this carriage soon, we shall be late for the picnic, she insisted, poking her head out of the carriage door. Do I have to drag you in here myself? It's preposterously early in the year for a picnic, Daniel pointed out, and lifted the scented handkerchief Miss Spencer had given him that morning, pressing it to his nose. There was something about the scent of mint, ginger and rosemary that gave him comfortingly deep, lungful of breath. How on earth can she make such things as this happen? It's too cold, he said to his sister and lowered the handkerchief once more. All the frost has thawed. It is the first truly spring day we've had, Clara said with wide eyes as she gestured out of the carriage door. Look, the garden is coming up in daffodils and tulips. You do not need to turn your head to look at them, for I know you've seen it in all your walks with Miss Spencer this week. Daniel jerked his head back toward her, feeling a little self-conscious when his sister pointed this out, plainly in front of the driver and footman to hear. Clara, Daniel hissed. He was happy spending so much time with Miss Spencer. She was a pleasant distraction from the world, perhaps an indulgent one, but one he didn't wish to be without. The last three days he and Miss Spencer had gone walking through the garden. On the second day he'd had a coughing attack, but Miss Spencer had been there to calm it down. Determined not to see him set back by it, she had insisted on him walking for a third day. What? Clara shrugged innocently from her place in the carriage. Do you not like me mentioning your friend? My healer, Daniel reminded her, casting a glance at the footman and the driver, who were attending to the horse, and were at least pretending not to be interested in the conversation. Daniel, you can't spend every day here with your healer. You must go out and see the world you live in, Clara insisted, then sat back in the carriage. Daniel's eyes shot to the door of the house, thinking he'd much rather stay here with Miss Spencer than attend this picnic. People would stare at him, 
wondering why he'd been absent from events for so long. At least here with Miss Spencer, he could talk as he wished to, smile as he wished to. As if she'd been summoned by his thoughts, she stepped out of the house with a thin Spencer jacket over her shoulders and the leather medicinal case she had carried to his that morning in her grasp. It struck him the case was getting old and frayed. She could do with a new one. When she saw him, her face lit up into a smile. The effect was sudden, making his palms clammy. Ah, why does she have such a hold over me? I wish you a good day, my lord. On your picnic, she said, hurrying toward him on the driveway. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. You are a more optimistic soul than I am. He lowered his voice to a whisper and stepped toward her, speaking playfully. Care to come with me? Me, she said, her eyebrows shooting upward. At least then there would be some pleasant conversation here, he explained with a laugh. She giggled and hung her head forward with her cheeks turning a pleasant, blushing shade. You and I both know that I cannot go, she said, raising her head once more. A healer. No one wants one of them at a picnic. It bodes ill luck. Or it means when someone twists their ankle on their walk, we have the perfect person for the task with us, he pointed out as she curtsied to him. If only, my lord. If only, indeed. He bowed, wishing she would abandon all the rules and climb in the carriage with him. Until tomorrow, she passed by him, coming so close that her arm brushed his. He felt a shiver, something akin to delight running up his spine at the touch. Then he turned to watch her as she left, hastening down the driveway toward the gate. Daniel! Clara called from the carriage and sat forward once more. Goodness, sister, you trying to give me heart trouble? He rubbed his hand on his chest. I think your heart aches for another at present, Clara said mischievously. Clara, he hissed once more, glancing at the staff who took no notice of them. As Miss Spencer turned at the end of the drive and disappeared from view, he stepped up into the carriage, sitting beside his sister. You shouldn't make such jests. They are inappropriate. On the contrary, I think they are very appropriate. Oh, look, the sun has come out at last, Daniel said, and pointed through the window. You are changing the subject. Clara elbowed him in the side, but Daniel took no notice of her. I think you're right. Maybe we will have a sort of warm day after all. Goodness, Daniel, you're going to have to slow down, Clara said and pulled on his arm. You would think he hadn't been ill at all, Horatio's voice came from her other side. Daniel angled his head to look at his brother-in-law, seeing there was something of a mischievous smirk on Horatio's lips. It had been there ever since Horatio had turned up at the picnic, after checking on his tenants that morning. That healer must be doing wonders for you. Shh, Clara pleaded. This time, she released Daniel's arm and pulled on her husband's elbow instead. We do not want it known by everyone that Miss Spencer attends to Daniel. Why not? Daniel asked, intrigued by the idea. As far as he was concerned, he was happy to speak of her. She had done wonders for him, so much so that in the space of a couple of weeks, he was striding up this hill, looking for a place to set up their picnic. Then he considered perhaps it was not such a good idea to talk of her, for the news would circle round to his parents at some point, who would not approve. Well, you do not want her time divided now, do you? Clara asked as if the answer were an obvious one. Talk of her praises too much and she might have to attend to other paying customers. Her tone was teasing. Hmm. Daniel said nothing, though the thought bothered him. As the group they were with chose a spot on the side of the hill, perched where the sun was just beginning to warm the ground through, Daniel thought of what his sister had said. The idea of Miss Spencer not coming to see him every day, for she had others to attend to, grated, though he couldn't explain why. There's an attachment there, one that should probably not be. 
He tried not to bring up the matter of Miss Spencer again. He helped the footman set up the chairs, along with Horatio and the other gentlemen gathered. Then he took his place on a blanket, whilst Clara and some of the other ladies took the chairs. Horatio sat beside Daniel, leaning against a tree behind him. The lunch passed pleasantly enough with much conversation between the groups. Whenever Daniel was asked about his absence, he explained he had a passing illness only, for he didn't want people prying into his business too much. Yet by the end of the lunch, Daniel was all too aware of the empty space beside him on the blanket. He could easily picture Miss Spencer knelt there, pulling at one of the cakes that was being passed round. She'd no doubt challenge him if she caught him staring at her, pointing out that he should be looking at the food, not her. Ah, if only she was here. You seem lost in thought, Daniel, Horatio said, snatching his attention away from the empty space. Is all well? Yes, thank you. Daniel took the scented handkerchief from his pocket and breathed in the fragrance a few times. The walk up the hill had tired him a little, and he didn't want to give his lungs a chance to revert to their old ways. It's all about management, just as Miss Spencer says. He's probably bemoaning the loss of someone's company, Clara said from the seat nearby, prodding at the cake on her own plate. Are you brother? She's good company, Daniel explained, shrugging with the movement. She said the most amusing thing yesterday about... What? Daniel broke off, noticing the way his sister and brother-in-law were staring at him. Why are you looking at me like that? No reason, Clara said and looked away. Because you can guess the reason well enough. Horatio chuckled with the words, only to receive a wave in the air form his wife. Daniel fell silent and leaned back a little, pushing the handkerchief back into his pocket. Am I not capable of talking about anyone else at this time? Lord Wareham, would you like one? Miss Withers appeared, walking through the other guests. Daniel shifted his focus toward her, recognising her as one of the ladies from his sister's circle of friends. She had dark black hair and rather deep brown eyes. She was a beauty that couldn't be denied, but he knew her very little. She lowered a silver tray for him to see what was resting on the top. They were cupcakes, glistening with freshly done icing. I made them myself, Miss Withers said, turning her chin up with pride. You did? Clara asked, though her voice stammered a little. Yes. Miss Withers turned her nose up even higher. The result was a rather abrasive and proud look, though Daniel tried not to think too much of it. Perhaps she was just especially pleased with her effort to make the cakes. Yes, I'll have one. Thank you. Daniel took the cupcake, startled when he noticed Miss Withers didn't offer the cakes to Horatio or Clara. She presented him with a sweet smile, then turned away, wandering through the other guests. Curious at the strange action, he didn't eat the cake right away. He merely sat there, watching Miss Withers go. She keeps looking at me. What's the flavour? Clara asked, leaning forward in her chair. I'm sorry. The cupcake. What flavour is it? Clara murmured, rapt with her attention fixed on the cake. It's... Daniel paused and sniffed the cake. He smiled a little, realising how much easier it was to smell things these days thanks to Miss Spencer's work. I smell rose water. He lifted the cake to his lips, about to take a bite, when the cake was abruptly knocked from his hand. Well, ow. He adjusted the knuckles of his hand, noting that in her effort to get rid of the cake, Clara had struck him across the hand rather hard. Were you so desperate for rose-flavoured cakes, sister? that you actually had to hit me to get it. Horatio laughed at his side, just as Clara kicked the cake subtly away. What on earth are you doing? Daniel asked, trying to reach for the cake. 
What a shame. It's covered in grass now. No longer edible. She glanced across the group, apparently checking Miss Withers was looking elsewhere, before she booted it with the toe of her shoe. This time, it rolled firmly away down the hill, landing far away in a rabbit burrow. Startled, Daniel stared at his sister, shaking his head, aware that Horatio's laughter was filling the air beside him. What did you do that for? Daniel asked, gesturing to his sister before he turned to face his brother-in-law. And why are you laughing so much? Something amused me. Horatio tried to stop himself form laughing but couldn't. Clara, it was just a cupcake. Yes, but I have heard of such cupcakes. She fidgeted in her seat, looking so uncomfortable in her scale of fidgeting that Horatio thought the chair might fall to pieces beneath her. Have you not heard of them, Daniel? Of cakes? I'd say they're supposed to be delicious and sweet-tasting, but I can't be sure as the proof has just been taken away from me, he argued, pointing toward the lost cupcake. Don't be tart, Clara warned, pointing a finger at him. Don't steal my food, Daniel said playfully, prompting his brother-in-law to laugh even more. Those cupcakes are made by women who wish to impress men, Daniel, Clara said. There was something in her manner that was awkward as she glanced toward her husband. If a lady hopes to make a man fall in love, it said these cakes are made round these parts in order to impress him. Sounds like a lot of nonsense, Daniel said with an abrupt laugh of his own. I agree, Horatio said and stood to his feet. In fact, I will go and have one of those cakes myself just to prove it. Horatio! Clara leapt to her feet, and he playfully tried to get away from her, but she managed to loop her arm through his and hold him fast. So uncertain of the constancy of my affection, Horatio teased her. Do I have to watch you two play out the bickering of a happily married couple when I'm hungry? Daniel asked, sighing as he looked toward the cake further down the hill. You're just missing your own objection of affection, Horatio murmured. What was that? Daniel said, snapping his head toward Horatio, uncertain if he'd heard him correctly. Nothing. Frog in my throat. Horatio coughed, just as Clara released his arm and bent down toward Daniel once more. I speak the truth, Daniel. Whether it works or not is immaterial. Those cupcakes are made to impress gentlemen, she said with full sincerity. I'd be wary of Miss Withers if I was you. I'd say she's out to capture your heart. Miss Withers? Daniel looked around his sister, trying to catch sight of Miss Withers. She was sat talking to her friends, laughing pleasantly, but there was something off about the picture. Daniel found himself imagining wild auburn hair and a heart-shaped face. Realising that he was thinking of Miss Spencer, he shook himself and turned back to face his sister. No cake has power over men, Clara, not even to impress, let alone fall in love, he said simply. If a man is impressed by a lady's baking, then he may forget it by the time the next cake is presented to him. You need fear, not for the state of my heart. At his words, Clara looked comforted as she returned to her seat. Daniel thought no more of the cupcake from Miss Withers, but looked at the empty space beside him once again. Chapter 10 Sarabella, this seems quite mad. Mad. Mad, you call me. Arabella pretended to be offended and turned round to face Lord Wareham, her lips parted wide. Well, if I am mad, Perhaps I should abandon the idea altogether. She tossed one of the herb sprigs she had in her grasp into the air. Lord Wareham laughed and hurried to catch it for her, pressing it back toward her. Did I touch a nerve? He played along with her jest, following behind her as she bent down to the ground and picked more herbs from his kitchen garden. Perhaps a little one. She bent down and picked some chamomile leaves pressing them together between her fingers to encourage the scent to leap into the air. 
Surely by now you trust my work, she asked as she stood and walked through the kitchen garden again. You know I do. Lord Wareham's voice had deepened to such an extent that the tone seemed to reach all the way inside of Arabella. She shivered, feeling thrilled by it. Are you cold? Just a little, she lied, not wanting him to know the true reason she had shivered. She collected some valerian root from the end of the kitchen garden, then turned her gaze on the walled space. This is a stunning kitchen garden, my lord. Is it? Lord Wareham turned round, staring at it with a small smile on his face. Is it odd that I have never really considered it in such a way before? No. I believe we only truly value what we have sometimes when we have lost it, she confessed, picking up some more valerian root. When I was very young, we had a vast kitchen garden so full of herbs and plants. Walking into it was an assault on the senses. A pleasant assault. Ha! It hardly sounds pleasant. He laughed at her words and opened his palms to her, so she could pass him some of the herbs to carry. She tried to ignore the jolt up her arm when her fingers touched his palm. What happened to the garden? Franny maintained it as well as she could, but it is a lot of work for one person. I now maintain a few borders only, she whispered, realising how odd it was to talk of such things to a Marquis. He did not know what it was like to have to tend borders himself. I'm sorry I should not talk of such things. Why not? he asked, looking at her with a crease between his brows. You can talk to me about anything you wish to. I can. She froze, startled by the words. Of course. To be frank, Miss Spencer, you've seen me at my worst in many ways, have you not? he said with a small smile playing at his lips. When I'm grumpy and quite hateful to be around. You were never that! That is your kindness speaking. He nodded toward her. You've also seen me when I can scarcely breathe for myself, quite the invalid. I like to think that there are no barriers between us. He paused, his eyes on the herbs in his hands rather than looking at her. Don't you? Y yes, she stammered, trying to cover up her nerves. I like to think so too. She turned and collected some more herbs. This tonic will help you sleep. You do not need to think it mad. I guess I'm just baffled by the idea, Lord Wareham said with a sigh. When I can't sleep, I'm either coughing or laying there in fear of coughing, staring up at the ceiling, wheezing. Pleasant image, isn't it? He shook his head at himself. Do you ever drink tea or coffee before going to bed? She asked, walking back to the house with him following her. Yes, regularly. Then avoid doing that in the future. They can keep one awake at night, she explained simply. The herbs I'll put together in this tonic will help to calm your mind before you go to sleep. It's a gentle thing. Nothing strong and also delicate in taste too, but it offers some help. As they stepped into the house, she laid the herbs out on a table, just as Lord Wareham did the same beside her. Ah, well. As much as I look forward to trying this tonic of yours, it will have to wait to be made. He clasped his hands together, looking suddenly excited. Why is that? she murmured, pulling some of the leaves off their stems. For I have a surprise for you. He stepped out toward the door once again. She was pleased to see he no longer had qualms about stepping outside, though she had seen him occasionally raise one of the scented handkerchiefs she had given him to his nose, as if in anticipation of a cough. Mostly, she figured the warming of the weather was aiding him not to fear the outside. Don't you wish to see your surprise? He halted and turned to look at her, waiting for her to follow. Oh, it's all too easy to follow him. She trailed after him, hurrying out of the house. He beckoned her to follow him all the way around the building until he arrived in the stable courtyard at the side of the house. Three horses had been prepared in the courtyard, and a maid was already sat in one of the saddles, clearly intending to come as a chaperone, though she looked just as uncomfortable in the saddle as Arabella soon feared she would be. Heavens!
she murmured and stumbled to a stop, looking at the mare before her as Lord Wareham gestured to the animal. How about that riding lesson, Miss Spencer? he asked, patting the neck of the animal, though she could see he was careful to follow her instructions for he didn't place his face too close to the animal's hair. I didn't think you were serious about that, my lord. You didn't. Why ever not? He walked toward her, leaving the mare behind in the care of a groom who had hold of the reins. I... Arabella struggled for words. There was something intimate about the idea of Lord Wareham teaching her to ride, and though her heart thudded harder at the thought and she longed to say yes, there was a part of her mind that was wary. Is this a wise thing? You said you wished to learn, did you not? That you'd always wished to know how to ride, he murmured, his voice deepening. You have remembered my words exactly, she realised, turning her chin up toward him. That is because I pay attention to you, Miss Spencer. He winked at her and turned away then, hurrying back to the horses. Such a thrill coursed through her that she found herself following him, hastening toward the animals. We will... Go for a short ride, only. Both so that the first lesson will be an easy one, and for my own sake, too. He glanced toward the tall steed held by the other groomsmen in the courtyard. He was a soft grey, with long white hair that had been plaited. You ride that one, Arabella said in amazement, staring open-mouthed at the tall animal. I used to take such things in my stride he whispered in her ear, leaning toward her so that the grooms could not hear their conversation. I admit, I fear a little how I am to respond today. So, she looked up at him, sensing some nerves had made him halt. You wish me to be with you on your first ride, she asked, her voice barely audible at all. Yes, he confessed, his smile just glimmering through. That and I still wish to see you ride. So come on, no more objections. First off, I just want to ask, oh my goodness. Arabella had no further chance to ask anything, for Lord Wareham had taken her waist and lifted her onto the saddle. She struggled to sit straight and calm her erratic heartbeat as Lord Wareham released her. Do not think of that touch. She levelled a glare at him instead as he laughed beside her. I wanted to ask a few things first before you put me up here she pointed out, her voice tense. The best way to learn to ride is to ride, not to talk of it, Miss Spencer. He shook his head, clearly still amused by her put-out look. I wanted to ask how not to fall off, she said in panic. That, that is easy. He stepped toward her and took her hands from where they were wringing together. He prized them apart slowly and wrapped them around the reins of the horse. Hold on tight. The touch of his hands made her warm before he released her and turned to clamber onto his horse. He as good as leapt up onto his own steed, swinging his leg over the saddle. Seeing the athletic prowess had her swallowing, thinking about the nature of his illness. It must get him down so much, to know what he can do, and have his illness hold him back so. Now, Miss Spencer, are you ready? he asked, moving his steed to stand alongside her own. She couldn't answer as she began to tremble atop the horse, remembering what had happened the last time she had gotten into a horse's saddle. Shall I take that silence as a yes? If you must, though, I'd rather give another answer, she muttered. Trust me, he said, leaning toward her, as I do you. The words had her so captivated that she hadn't even noticed he took the reins of her horse until he flicked them gently encouraging the animal to walk. Now, go with the movement of the horse and hold on tight. This should be an interesting lesson. I'll just be glad if I don't end up on the earth, Arabella protested, earning a soft laugh from Lord Wareham at her side. The lesson continued for a little while and Arabella began to grow used to the movement of the horse. She followed all of Lord Wareham's instructions, and he proved himself a good teacher. He was not only patient when she didn't understand things, but explained them again with kindness. When she also grew fearful, he was able to distract her quite brilliantly by teasing her. 
A short time later, they came to a stop in the garden of the house, looking down from a lofted position at the expanse of the estate, with their chaperone following behind them on a mare. You can see it quite well from up here, Lord Wareham said and pointed toward the walled kitchen garden. I have never noticed that before. I must admit I'm fascinated that you learned of this world of botany and plants from your cook. She is the kindest and best of women, Arabella said as she too looked out onto the garden. She always believed there was such power in the natural world. I wish I could see her more often. I hope you do soon. Lord Wareham's voice was soft before he began to chuckle. What has amused you? Arabella asked, looking toward him. I was just thinking of something ridiculous that happened the other day. I would be glad of your opinion on it. You reminded me of it for you talked of the natural world having power, he said, putting on a theatrical tone. What of it? she encouraged him on. I know you work in science and botany, Miss Spencer, but it seems there are some out there in our county who believe in something altogether more magical. He still laughed at the idea. Perhaps they're superstitious and think a black cat crossing their path is bad luck too. Perhaps so, she murmured, still intrigued by his words. What has prompted these thoughts? The other day at our picnic, he paused just long enough to draw his horse close to hers. The proximity of him had Arabella's mouth turning dry, thinking of the chaperone close behind them. A young lady offered up a cupcake for me to eat, and Clara batted it away. She did, Arabella murmured, her voice lilting high. Yes, she's convinced it's a cupcake used to impress a man to make him fall in love. Ha! What a notion! He laughed raucously at the idea. Can you imagine people believing in such things, Miss Spencer? They'll be talking of love potions next. Ah, yes, I suppose they will. Arabella swallowed nervously. This last week she had been approached by three different ladies who asked for tonics. Two of them just wanted assistance with their health, asking for the wise counsel of Bonadea, but the third had asked for love potions. Arabella had written back, leaving her letter in the oak tree, and explained there were no such things as love potions, but she offered up tonics and other tricks to make one feel more confident around a man. The recipe to make wonderfully tasting cupcakes was one such thing. It is not a love potion. It is simply a nice tasting cake. What lady gave you the cake? Arabella asked, realising what was afoot. The lady who had written to her wished to ensnare Lord Wareham's heart. Such jealousy coursed through Arabella's veins that she began to fidget with the reins of the mare restlessly. Miss Withers, a young woman from town and a friend of Clara's, he explained in a rush. I didn't eat it. Oh, I see. Arabella turned in the saddle, looking straight at him. What is she like? Her shoulders slumped a little as she feared her jealousy would be noticeable. I haven't paid that much attention to her in truth. I will have to keep a close eye now if she thinks she can give me love potions. He still laughed at the idea, finding it absurd. Yes, how mad, Arabella whispered. At least he does not think of her much. Come on, let us ride back to the house. Lord Wareham breathed deeply. You have done excellently for your first lesson, and I'm beginning to feel a little tight here. He placed a hand to his sternum. Then ride slow, my lord, she pleaded with him, hitching the reins and following him. Remember to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth, circular breathing. I will, Dr. Spencer. As he rode down the hill gently back toward the house, Arabella wasn't certain which feeling overtook her more. Was it the urge to protect Lord Wareham that had her hands itching to reach out toward him and pull him down from the saddle, now that he had claimed some discomfort? Or was she still feeling anger at Miss Withers? It's jealousy, oh no, despite everything my rationality has warned me of, my heart has run away with me. I'm quite attached to Lord Wareham. Chapter 11 Daniel As the carriage approached on the driveway, Daniel closed up the book he'd been reading and hurried toward the window. 
Glancing up and down the drive, he looked for any hint of Miss Spencer, but she was nowhere to be seen. Perhaps she is seeing to other customers today. Daniel tried to hold back his disappointment as he walked to the door and stepped outside. Spring had well and truly got its hold on the estate now. Either side of the drive, the ground was golden with yellow-headed daffodils, and the grass was damp with morning dew, rather than cold and hard with frost. The carriage moved easily down the drive before coming to a stop in the very centre. Unwilling to wait for the footman, Daniel hastened forward and opened the door himself. Welcome home, he said grandly, waving an arm at the house. Daniel. His mother sat forward, clearly startled. You look so well, but Clara's last letter said you had taken to your bed. Then my letter since must have gone astray. Daniel took Marianne's hand and helped her down from the carriage, aware that behind her his father looked at him with equal shock, his eyes wide. I am much improved and my stay in bed was some weeks ago. Come, come, I want to hear all about your travels. Later, Gregory said, jumping down from the carriage and clapping Daniel on the shoulder. I want to hear of you first. Look how well you are. He turned Daniel round in a full circle. You even have more colour in your cheeks than you've had in weeks. Nice to know you thought I was as pasty as a ghost, Daniel jested, prompting his parents to chuckle. Marianne reached up on her toes and kissed him on the cheek, evidently thrilled to see him. What is the cause of this improvement? she asked, scarcely able to release him. I sought some excellent medical help, such help that I cannot praise enough, in fact. Daniel was uncertain how to approach the subject. He'd heard before the way his father had callously talked of women healers. Daniel had had the same opinion at one point in his life, but that was before he had met Miss Spencer. She has changed so much in my life. My thoughts and opinions, they are quite altered. Even at the thought of her, he couldn't keep the smile off his face. That is wonderful news, Gregory said as he stepped back. You see, all you needed was the right physician. I knew it would be the case. These men train for years with such educations in London, Edinburgh and Bristol. Those that travel too have the greatest of knowledge. That education is worth something. Well, Daniel trailed off knowing he couldn't tell his father the truth. My father might not allow Miss Spencer back in the house again if he knew. Yes, I suppose it is. Daniel cursed inwardly the moment the words were out of his lips. He supposed it wasn't a lie what he said, after all. Some men did train hard for their qualifications, yet he was not speaking his true opinion on the matter. Come, let us get you inside and you can tell me all about your travels. He beckoned them into the house, eager to change the subject. The bags were brought in behind them and sent up the stairs. Soon enough, Marianne was recounting the tales of their travels with vigour. Daniel was pressed into an armchair in the sitting room with a tea in his hands and felt stuck there for a while. His mother sat before him, barely taking a breath between her sentences. Oh, and you'll never guess who we met on our travels. Well, it was... I see I will not be given chance to guess. Daniel jested, earning a chuckle from his father across the room. Marianne tapped his arm in reprimand and reached for her own teacup in her lap, sipping eagerly now she had a break to do so. I am glad to see you enjoyed yourself so much. It was a trip worth taking, as you said, Gregory declared from across the room. He was wandering around, ambling and looking at everything in the space, as if it had somehow changed in the time he had been away. I'm glad we did it, though. I cannot deny that for the first week or so your mother struggled to settle. Gregory paused in his walk when he came across something on the mantelpiece. Daniel froze when he saw it was a small vial from one of Arabella's medicinal bags. The glass vial was inlaid with her handwriting, though he couldn't see what was inside. Struggled to settle? Why is that? Daniel cleared his throat with the words and tried to draw his parents' attention toward him. Oh, 
All I could think of was you. Marianne waved dramatically toward him. Me? Whatever for? Daniel moved to his feet, aware that his father had now lifted up the glass vial and was examining it, turning it over in his palm with a frown on his face. Daniel, you had been bad with your illness for so long. Marianne released a shaky breath. It felt like a betrayal to go travelling. Nonsense. Daniel waved away such an idea. I'm the one who said you should go, that you shouldn't put it off. He tried to take the vial out of his father's hands, fearful of Gregory asking questions, yet Gregory merely held the vial away, examining it high in the air so that the sunlight through the windows fell upon it. You were right, Gregory said hurriedly. We should not keep putting off doing things, as you shouldn't either. I hoping you have not spent all your time in this house whilst we have been gone. He lowered the glass vial a little and peered over the rim at Daniel. You have been out, I hope. I went to a picnic. Daniel swallowed the last of his tea and put the teacup down on a tray nearby before trying to take the vial again. A picnic? In all the weeks we've been gone, you've only been on a picnic. Marianne twisted in her seat, cricking her neck, for she turned to look at Daniel so quickly. Yes, mother. Once more, Daniel tried to take the vial. Gregory smiled at him, clearly finding his attempt rather humorous. He tossed the vial to his other hand out of Daniel's reach, then lifted a plate of biscuits off the tray and passed it to Daniel. You're eager to have hold of something. Have a biscuit, he said with a smile. Father, that vial, it belongs to your physician, I suppose, Gregory said with interest and raised it close to his face. Curious. There appears to be dried lavender sprigs in here. Daniel pulled at the collar on his throat as it was suddenly tighter. He took a bite of the biscuit so he did not have to answer his father. But, Marianne was most perturbed, shaking her head as she spoke. If you have only been on a picnic whilst we have been gone, you will have seen few ladies of the ton, Daniel. I've seen ladies enough. Daniel tried to keep the smile off his face, though it was a failing task. It creeped through regardless. He had a habit of thinking of Miss Spencer, even when he tried not to, and now was one such time. He thought of the last time she'd been here and how he had taken her on that riding lesson. It may have ended with him struggling a little with his lungs, but she had said that was to be expected after he'd been so long away from the activity. What pleased him most was the excitement there had been in her expression as they had gone riding. It was nice to do something for her after all that she had done for him. Ladies on this picnic hardly counts as many ladies. Marianne dismissed the idea, waving her hand at him before she lifted the teacup to her lips and took a quick sip. How else are you to marry and produce us some grandchildren if you do not meet more ladies? Some crumbs off the biscuit shot down Daniel's throat in surprise. He began to choke on it and had to lean forward, spluttering hard. Gregory put down the glass vial, returning it to the mantelpiece before he clasped Daniel on the back. Daniel, is it bad? Gregory said in panic. Daniel held up his hand as he tried a few of the breathing exercises Miss Spencer had taught him. He breathed through his nose and out through his mouth, then cleared the blockage managing to splutter into a handkerchief before he looked with narrowed eyes at his mother. Marianne had an innocent expression playing in her features. Oops, she whispered. Well, how was I supposed to know the mere mention of marriage and grandchildren would shock you so? At her words, Gregory laughed heartily. Daniel was just relieved to see Gregory had put the vial down. He picked it up hurriedly now that Gregory's back was turned and slipped it into his pocket, so his father would not have a chance to examine it again and notice that the handwriting was not their usual physician's. Mother, I'm hardly in a hurry to marry. Daniel coughed as his parents turned to face him. He tried not to reveal that the choking had actually discomforted his lungs. He breathed deeply thinking of expanding his diaphragm as Miss Spencer had taught him to do. Yet there must be an heir at some point, Marianne said matter-of-factly. 
Mother, I am just talking, dear. She shrugged her shoulders, as if it was no great matter. You cannot expect a lady you wish to marry just to turn up at your door one day, unannounced, can you? Something in her words dumbstruck him. When an image of Miss Spencer appeared in his mind, he struggled to get rid of it. He busied himself with pouring out a second cup of tea, his movements so harried that he could feel Gregory's eyes on him across the room. He refused to return his father's look, rather fearful of what the expression would be. I think you have upset him, Gregory said, moving to sit beside his wife. I am not upset. Daniel stood in front of the mantelpiece with his teacup in his hands, still breathing deeply and trying to expand his diaphragm. Yet I hardly see the importance of hurrying into marriage. Not hurrying, dear, Marianne said softly. Yet there would be no harm in you at least considering the idea. Daniel swigged his tea, trying to delay his need to respond. He couldn't explain why Miss Spencer appeared in his mind again. Only this time he was picturing her in a wedding gown, walking toward him down the aisle of a church. What is wrong with me? Since when did attraction lead to sudden thoughts like this? I do not need to marry yet, Daniel said stubbornly, aware that he might have sounded a little petulant to his parents by now, but he hardly cared. His mind was more preoccupied with thinking of Miss Spencer. There's no harm in looking, Gregory seconded the idea with a shrug. Meet a few ladies, enjoy their company. You never know, you might be one of the lucky few who fall in love. At his words, Marianne placed a soft hand on his arm. Daniel looked away, staring down into the fireplace that had been lit that day, offering a little warmth into the room. The last time he'd stood in this room for tea was with Miss Spencer. They had done his breathing exercises together before she had pointed out that he did them with such vigour now that he practically created gusts of wind in the room. He had laughed heartily with her at the idea. You might meet a beauty, Gregory went on. Father, I would not be looking for beauty. He shook his head, realising how strange it sounded. I mean, marriage is about more than that, is it not? I'd wish to marry a lady whose company I could enjoy, who makes me laugh, who I can make laugh in return. Surely that is the sort of happiness I should be seeking, rather than that which just comes with looking at a pretty face. Spoken like a true romantic, Marianne said with sweetness. You've been reading Shakespeare again? Gregory asked, laughing to himself. You usually get such notions in your head after being to one of his plays. I haven't been reading his romances. Daniel put down his teacup, thinking of Macbeth and how often he talked of it with Miss Spencer. How about this? Marianne declared with enthusiasm, sitting so far forward in her chair in excitement that she nearly fell out of it. We are to attend the Withers' house next week for dinner. Mr. Withers, the merchant, Daniel said in surprise, knowing he'd heard that name a lot as of late. Yes, he and I might do some business, Gregory explained nonchalantly, before his eyes settled on Daniel with more keenness. He has a daughter. From what I hear, she's a friend of Clara's. Daniel paused with his cup lifted in the air, thinking of the last time he had seen Miss Withers. She had proffered forward one of those cupcakes, one that had made Clara speak of recipes to impress men. Love potions. Ha! Like such a thing could exist. If you are to invite me to join you, I'm not sure that is a good idea, he said hurriedly. Why ever not? Marianne asked. You could have a merry evening and you cannot continue to stay here all the time. I know, it's just... Daniel sought out a way to object to the situation. Miss Withers had certainly been fair to look at, but she was not the lady whose company he desired. That particular lady he was thinking of now, as he kept glancing toward the windows in the effort to catch a glimpse of her when she arrived today. We shall have to sneak her in through one of the servants' doors now, so my parents cannot see her. I do not know Miss Withers, Daniel said in the end, hoping that was enough of an excuse. Then you have the opportunity to get to know her next week at dinner.
Gregory spoke with finality, showing the discussion was at an end. You never know, you might enjoy her company. Daniel wasn't convinced. Chapter 12 Daniel Could you be fidgeting any more? Clara said pointedly at Daniel's side as they walked toward the Withers' house. Horatio on her arm was smiling, clearly doing little to hide the expression. I think he's uncomfortable, love. Horatio nudged her as he lowered his voice. What was your first clue? Daniel muttered. Looking away from his sister and brother-in-law, he turned to see his parents striding ahead toward the house. This last week our mother has not stopped talking of Miss Withers. Everywhere I go in the house, she follows me, talking of this lady I hardly know at all. Now I have to talk to her all evening, well aware why I'm being dragged along here and that my mother will probably as good as push me into this lady's lap, if she can. Now that would be entertaining to see, Horatio laughed just as Clara narrowed her eyes at her husband. Horatio, you are not being helpful, she warned. I'm practically his brother now. Since when are brothers helpful in situations like this? I thought they were always better for teasing. Horatio continued to smile, drawing his wife toward the house. Thank you for your friendship, Daniel said wryly, earning another deeper laugh from Horatio. Cool your blood, Horatio said after a few seconds of Daniel balling his hands into fists and letting them unfurl again at his side. The tension of the evening was making him restless, unable to stand still. You are meeting the lady. I do not even think your mother expects you to propose in one night, though I don't doubt she would jump for joy if you did. Propose, Daniel spluttered. Both Clara and Horatio laughed at his reaction, just as the door to the house was opened by Mr Withers and his wife. Gregory and Marianne were bustled inside, followed by Clara and Horatio. Daniel was glad to be the one to dally at the back of the group, finding he could summon little excitement at all for going into the house. This is not where I want to be. The whole of the last week he had spent his time not as he wished to. He had seen Miss Spencer a few times, but it was no longer every day. They'd arranged to meet on a walk in the grounds once, so her parents would have no knowledge she was there, and the other two times she had crept in through the servant's kitchen, coming to see him. Daniel had tried to explain as gently as he could that they had to do this, for he feared his father's reaction to the news of him using a local healer. He had hardly been blind to her response, though. She had put upon a smile and nodded, saying she understood perfectly, then jested about the lack of foresight in some men's opinions. Through the facade, Daniel could see the true pain the words had caused. I'm making her creep about the house as if she were some sort of mistress. What kind of man am I? The idea of Miss Spencer and the word mistress together suddenly put a heat through Daniel he was not prepared for. He pulled at his cravat, finding it rather too tight, and cleared his throat. What is wrong with me? Desist thinking of Miss Spencer at once. Striding into the house, he soon had his request. Miss Withers practically pushed past Clara, though she deemed herself to be Clara's friend, and stopped hurriedly in front of Daniel. Lord Wareham! She hastened to curtsy and lifted her chin high. I'm so happy to see you again. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. Daniel was polite and bowed to her in return. He had to admit there was something different about her this evening. She held herself with more confidence than she usually did. Her chin was higher, and she looked him in the eye, rather than demurely bowing her head and gazing away. I prefer the confidence. I hope you will sit with me at dinner. She took his arm, a bold action, but one that was rather charming, for I long to hear of your travels. I might bore you he said with a grimace. I am sure you could never do that. Prepare yourself for trying to hide your yawns, then. His jest brought a sudden laugh to her lips. Daniel was glad to follow her with the others through to the dining room, 
but despite the change in Miss Withers' manner and the effect her new confidence had on her beauty, Daniel was unmoved by her. He sat beside her as he would sit with any other friend or acquaintance. They were polite with one another and occasionally inquisitive, yet he frequently fell silent, uncertain what to say. He would find her staring at him so openly on occasion, too that he had to look away, discomforted by it. Seeking out an ally in the room, he looked to Clara and Horatio across the table who were deep in conversation. They were repeatedly glancing his way, clearly humoured by how cornered he was by Miss Withers. They offered him no escape route or any other avenue of conversation. Any other tales from the continent, my lord? Miss Withers asked, leaning so far out of her chair toward him that he actually leaned back in his. It made the chair creak beneath him, and he felt his mother's hand on his other side nudge him back firmly into the middle of the seat. Mother. He shot a dark glare her way, though she didn't appear to notice, before he returned his eyes to Miss Withers. I have told you many already. He shrugged off the idea. For some reason, recounting his stories to Miss Withers wasn't as entertaining as telling them to Miss Spencer. Miss Withers merely oohed and aahed at the appropriate moments, as if she were visiting some fine fireworks display. Miss Spencer always engaged with what he had to say, frequently throwing her own jests into the tales and making him see them in a new light. There must be another you could tell me. Miss Withers now leaned so far forward that he caught the scent of something in the air. Is that her perfume? Orchid perfume, isn't it? He'd only found that scent in one other place before. Clara had worn it once, some time ago. He could remember it vividly. He'd returned from his trip to the continent to find Clara sick. That scent of orchid perfume had hung around the room, and it brought back the painful memories of seeing Clara laid out in bed, too exhausted to move. How about we shift our conversation? Daniel sat forward and picked up the carafe of claret from the table, topping up his own glass and Miss Withers' cup too. By doing so, she was forced to sit back completely in her seat and reached for her glass, giving him some breathing room at last. Her fingers moved to the glass with such speed, he rather thought she was trying to catch his hand, as if by accident. He retrieved his hand so swiftly he nearly dropped the carafe, but managed to catch it with a flurry of fingers. The only people who seemed to notice at the table were Clara and Horatio, who smiled at one another. His parents, along with Mr. and Mrs. Withers, were too absorbed in their own conversation to look his way. How about you tell me something of yourself instead, Miss Withers? Daniel tried to move the conversation on. Perhaps what interests you have? Interests? She seemed so baffled by the idea that he nearly laughed. Chewing on the side of his mouth to stop such a thing happening, he motioned toward her to go on. Well, I... I enjoy the pianoforte. An admirable accomplishment. Daniel kept to himself his true thoughts on this matter. How many ladies had he come across in his life that professed to be excellent piano players? He rather thought they said they were interested in such a thing because their parents had told them it made them sound accomplished. Yes, and I... I... Miss Withers grew a little flustered. She blushed and reached for her glass before sipping it heartily. I am fond of fashion as well, my lord. I am always keen to see the finest gowns, as you can see. She motioned down to her own gown and waited, as if she expected him to make some comment on it. Am I supposed to compliment her gown? He saw nothing remarkable in it. If anything, it was too fussy, with an excessive amount of ruffles around the short sleeves and too many pink ribbons across the empire line of the bust. It was a far cry from one of Miss Spencer's gowns. Miss Spencer could not afford dresses such as this, he knew that, yet she always managed to dress well. Her gowns were simple, elegant, and flattered her in such a way that sometimes they could be rather distracting, even when he was trying to keep his focus on their conversation. A subtle kick to Daniel's leg had him looking across the table. Clara barely looked at him as she kicked through she fiddled with the sleeve of her gown, trying to make a point. Daniel took the hint and offered Miss Withers a smile. You're wearing a fine gown tonight. 
Thank you. That is kind. Miss Withers smiled, excessively so, as if he had said something rather wondrous, as opposed to the thin compliment it had been. As dinner drew to a close, Daniel was glad the ladies retired to the other room. It gave him a chance to breathe easier. Horatio came to sit beside him and offered up a rather large brandy glass. You look like you need this, Horatio said with a big grin. Why are you enjoying this so much? Daniel asked as he thanked him for the brandy. I don't know, I guess it's rather amusing to watch you squirm so much. Daniel, you hardly have to marry a woman just because your parents have brought you here. Horatio's hasty whisper had Daniel nearly choking on the brandy. He just managed to stop it. I know, he whispered slowly. It doesn't make this evening any easier. What is difficult about it? Horatio asked, holding his hands out wide as he waited for an explanation. All that is happening is you are talking with a lady who is rather eager for your attention. Oh, and those two are fond of looking at your progress. He pointed toward Gregory and Mr Withers near the head of the table that were talking quietly together, now clearly onto the discussions of their business. God's wounds, they have hope in a match already. If they had their way, they'd have me married by the end of the week, Daniel muttered harshly and took a gulp from the brandy. No bad thing in being married, Daniel? Yes, but at least you are fond of your wife. Ha! Huh. Is that what you think? Horatio laughed and reached for his own brandy glass. I love my wife. I am not just fond of her. I know, I know. Daniel held up a hand, not needing to hear again about how good a match Horatio and Clara were. They had something Daniel always thought he wouldn't have. A true bond with a woman. Very well, I will ask you again. Horatio said, with something of a mischievous glint in his eye. What is so awful about this evening if all you're doing is putting up with a little irritating attention? It is not just that, Daniel muttered hastily. What else is it then? It's... Daniel trailed off, unable to put it into words. He could hardly declare openly to his brother-in-law that it felt like a betrayal to be here, when he didn't even understand why he felt that way. He had made no promises to any other lady, no offer of courtship, yet it still felt wrong. It was as if he was somehow being cruel to Miss Spencer by being here. She's my healer, nothing more. He found himself imagining she had sat beside him over dinner. He didn't doubt then he would have happily leaned out of his chair closer to her. When he talked of his travels, she would have made jests, pointed out the folly of his ways, even teased him. He rather liked that. He preferred it intensely to the way Miss Withers stared at him as if he was something to be admired. I know what it is, Daniel said with suddenness and turned completely to face Horatio. When I talk with Miss Withers, I feel I am the Marquess I am. I fear she just looks at me seeing that someday I might be a duke. And that is why she talks to me at all. Unlike others. Others, Horatio prompted him on. Well, there are some ladies who would talk to me because of who I am, not what I am. He lifted the brandy glass hurriedly to his lips. These ladies have names, Daniel. Or is it just the one lady you were thinking of? Horatio's smile showed he could guess well enough the name of the lady. Daniel downed what was left in his brandy glass, just as Gregory and Mr Withers stood from the table. They directed the group toward a nearby door, showing they were to rejoin the ladies in the parlour. Striding into the room, Daniel was a little relieved to find Miss Withers wasn't there yet. Any relief he might have had that he was about to get a moment of peace quickly vanished as Clara took his arm and dragged him to the corner of a room, with her fingers pressing hard into his elbow. Ow! Ow! Again! Sister! Daniel shook his arm out of her hold as they came to a stop. What is the matter? You're all... He paused, taking in her appearance. She was flushed, breathing a little heavily, and quite skittish in manner. 
Frantic. Miss Withers is using Belladonna. I beg your pardon. Daniel had heard of Belladonna before, but uncertain what it was, he merely shrugged, none the wiser. Belladonna drops. Clara pointed at her eyes with harried movements of her fingers. They make one's eyes appear larger. It's a beauty thing. She's trying to make you notice her. Clara, are you truly back to this tale of love potions? Daniel laughed and shook his head. That is nonsense. It's not a love potion, Clara said hastily. It's a beauty trick. She motioned toward her eyes another time. Miss Withers is trying to manipulate you into noticing her. That is what is happening here. It makes her eyes shine. Daniel felt perturbed. His body stilled and his hands fell limp at his sides. He knew there was nothing so wrong in a person trying to capture another's attention, but it was the use of the belladonna that rankled him. It was as if she was trying to deceive him and be something she wasn't. She's trying to manipulate me into caring for her. How is it you know about these things, sister? You seem to know such about them. Daniel's question made Clara hesitate. Her lips parted and closed before she shrugged. I am a lady. I have friends who gossip and whisper about such things, she rushed to explain. Yet he had seen the hesitation and it piqued his curiosity. I just do not wish you to be hurt by such tricks, Daniel. Rest assured, sister, I will not be swayed by such a trick. His words calmed Clara instantly, who sighed, with her spine softening. Once more, Daniel thought of another woman, another who would never use such a cheap trick. I would have rather spent this evening with Miss Spencer. Chapter 13 Arabella And this one? Lord Wareham held up the latest flower he had picked up from the garden, continuing with their game. Dogwood, she said, simply, watching as his nose instantly wrinkled. What? You do not like the name? Look at it, he laughed and walked toward her down the garden path. This is a delicate flower. He thrust the bloom toward her, prompting her to admire the soft white petals. Yet it has been given the ugly name of dogwood. It's not quite a rose, is it? Now that is a fine name. Ha! I had never thought of that before. Arabella continued to walk down the path, with Lord Wareham at her heels. This far away from the house, they were able to walk at ease with one another. A maid scurried far behind them as a chaperone, but here at least his parents couldn't see the two of them together. I imagine the mugwort flower must really upset you then, she jested watching as Lord Wareham tipped his head back and laughed heartily. Good Lord, I swear some people just want to give ugly names to flowers. He shrugged off his tailcoat and passed it over his shoulder. Seeing him striding out so confidently into the garden now without a care or a worry brought Arabella as many smiles as their jesting had. He's come so far. When he pressed the dogwood flower close to his nose, inhaling the scent, she leapt forward. Placing her fingers to his wrist, she urged him to lower the flower again. In the sudden movement, they had come very close to one another, and both stopped walking abruptly. You mustn't do that, my lord. Why not? he asked, his honey-coloured eyes meeting hers. Suddenly, all the laughter between them had vanished. There was a sudden tension thanks to the proximity, and despite the reasoned voice in Arabella's head, telling her she should step back, she couldn't. Neither could she drop her hand from his wrist. I have a theory, she said suddenly. I think some may be allergic to the pollen in flowers like these. This time of year is the worst for such afflictions, and I worry that it could also upset your breathing. Ah, I see. He lowered his eyes to the flower, though she wasn't certain if he was looking at the soft white petals or her hand on his wrist. You are quite protective of me these days, Miss Spencer. Don't think I haven't noticed it. 
Abruptly, she took her hand away. His smile faltered at the loss of her touch, but she rather thought that could have been in her imagination. Well, I take pride in my work. She smiled and walked on down the path again. Imagine how I'd feel if you suddenly relapsed. Oh, my pride couldn't handle it. She mocked herself, prompting Lord Wareham to laugh as he hastened to catch up with her. Someone with less pride in them I have yet to meet, he said hurriedly. What are those ones here? What are they called? Between a bank of silver birch trees on their left, there was a dappling of blue and dark pink flowers. Well, the blue ones are bluebells and the dark pink are milkweed, she explained, watching as Lord Wareham laughed again. Milkweed, he repeated in disbelief. She copied his expression, wrinkling her nose. I've never noticed what ugly names some of them have before. Now you will never not be able to think about it, he said, as he tossed the dogwood flower to the side where it fell among the other flowers in the grassy bank. Very true, she said softly. When their path began to turn back to the house, she expected him to change the subject, to say it was time for her to go home now, but he did not. Instead, he led her down a different path, deeper into the forest, with their chaperone hurrying along behind them at a distance. This feels strange, hiding from the house and his parents inside it. She understood his need to hide. A duke might be outraged at the idea of her treating his son, but it didn't mean she had to like sneaking about as if she was something scandalous. Speaking of names, Lord Wareham began, clearing his throat in such a way that she snapped her gaze toward him, worried. He immediately shook his head with a soft expression, showing he was fine. You jump like a mother bird watching its baby. I'm protective of you, as we have just said. Hearing the words falling from her own lips made her blush all the more. She laughed at herself and looked away. You said something about names. Yes. As we are talking about the names of plants. He moved closer to her side as they walked so near that she could practically feel his arm brushing hers just once. Did he mean to do that? It feels strange to me to keep calling you Miss Spencer, he said conversationally with his tone nonchalant. It suggests you are very much a member of staff, merely someone I pay for a service, rather than someone I would consider a friend. At his words, Arabella was completely distracted. She no longer looked at the flowers in the grassy bank, nor the trees in the path ahead. She stared only at him. In contrast, he looked out to the trees. She had a perfect view of his profile and the strong jawline. I was wondering if you would permit me to call you something. What else do you wish to call me? Arabella felt a little breathless, though she tried to hide it. Shedding her formal address felt like an intimate thing indeed. Would you object to me calling you Arabella? he asked, his eyes turning to her at last. No, I wouldn't object. She smiled, finding it took over her face so much that her cheeks ached, though she hardly cared about that pain. She was so busy looking at him and not paying attention to where she was going that she tripped. Her foot became lodged in a tree root, poking up through the path they were walking on. Whoa! Lord Wareham jumped forward, his hand catching hers. She took hold of that palm firmly, grasping to it to stop herself from falling any further. Are you all right? he asked, stepping closer to her. Yes, I'm fine. You'd think by this age I could at least look where I'm going. She jested. A soft chuckle escaped his lips. Turning her head up toward him, she noticed how close they were standing, even nearer than before. He had to notice it at the same time, for his chuckle stopped too. Arabella. At him using her Christian name, her heart leapt, but it was not something she could indulge in. Daniel, are you out here? Lady Clara's unmistakable tone called from further down the path. Arabella leapt away, tripping on the route a second time, though she managed to sort herself out on this occasion. 
mean to fall at my feet? Lord Wareham teased her. She waved a hand manically to urge him to be quiet and desist from the flirtation. He only smirked before turning his attention down the path. Daniel. Lady Clara appeared at the edge of the path, then sped toward them with Betchy at her heels. Good Lord, Clara, do you need to shout my name so loudly? He asked, holding his arms open wide. I'm not that difficult to find out here. I thought you were intending to be difficult to find, Lady Clara said pointedly, glancing between him and Arabella. I have no choice. Lord Wareham's voice deepened as Arabella stepped firmly over tree root, not intending to trip again. She waved in greeting to Betchy, who moved toward her side. If father knew... Lord Wareham trailed off, glancing once at Arabella. He would not allow me to continue to use Miss Spencer's services. The fact he had returned to Miss Spencer again made her stomach knot. Ah, I will only ever be Arabella when we are alone. The thought affirmed to Arabella, who she would always be to Lord Wareham. Any intimacy they had would not cross the barrier that was between them. He was a Marquess, and she was in his service. I know, Clara sighed deeply and waved a hand in the air, clearly thinking the idea quite mad. It is actually Miss Spencer I have come to talk to. So, my apologies, Daniel, but I am stealing her away from you. Stealing her? Lord Wareham actually moved to stand in front of Arabella. She was so startled by the movement she peered her head around his arm. Did I need a guard? Arabella teased him. It seems that protective thing we discuss goes both ways, he whispered to her, though the words were plainly heard both by Lady Clara and Betchy, who exchanged a glance. I will return her later, but for now, yes, she is being stolen from your side. Lady Clara stepped around him and took Arabella's arm, dragging her away down the path. Clara! Lord Wareham called after them as Betchy trailed at their heels. Arabella wasn't sure whether to be humoured at Lord Wareham's put-out expression as he waited impatiently at the end of the path or irked at Lady Clara's interruption. Lord Wareham paced and kicked out at the long grasses, before turning to stare at them again down the path. When they were some distance away, Lady Clara released Arabella. What is happening? Arabella asked, sensing there was a degree of panic between the two ladies. Betchy laid a hand to her stomach and breathed deeply, showing how difficult it had been to keep up with them. Forgive me for intruding in this manner, Clara said hastily, just as Arabella tried to urge Betchy to sit on a tree stump nearby and rest. At first, Betchy showed signs of refusing, until Lady Clara took her other arm, and they steered her back together. I'm afraid I had to speak to you. What about? Arabella encouraged her on. Miss Withers! The name suddenly sounded familiar to Arabella. An image appeared in her mind. It was of her and Lord Wareham when they had gone riding together, and how he had spoken of the cupcakes Miss Withers had made. Oh! Arabella felt a tightening in her gut. Yes. Oh, Lady Clara repeated in panic, mimicking the exact sound Arabella had made. I am sorry to intrude in your affairs, she grimaced, showing how much it pained her to do so. Yet I must ask you not to make your tonics again. At the words, Betchy's head jerked up, equally as astonished as Arabella. Why not? Arabella said softly. It paid her well to do such things. At the moment, the money was all that was keeping her and her father from starvation. In his madness when it came to money, he barely seemed to notice that she produced food, as if from nowhere, for he was so caught up in his own affairs. Miss Withers is using them to try and catch my brother's eye. She glanced toward Lord Wareham down the path. I realise what a hypocrite I sound like, believe me. I would not accuse you of being such. Arabella shook her head firmly, seeing the pain that rippled off Lady Clara. The lady could not stand still and repeatedly wrung her hands together. I know I used them myself before you wrote that letter to me and everything fell into place. Seeing it from the other side, though, she glanced at her brother again, who was in the distance still kicking out at the long grasses. 
I now realize how it can be perceived by others. When people are whispering of love potions and they gossip of your pseudonym too, I fear what can come of it. If my brother is to marry someday, I wish him to make up his own mind on the matter, not to be swayed by a pretty lady using belladonna drops. Rest assured, my lady. Arabella stepped forward, with her tone soft. Those things can never make a man do what he does not wish to. They are for the woman, not to ensnare the senses of a man. I know, Lady Clara sighed deeply, yet I fear it anyway. Please, I beg of you, do not make these tonics for Miss Withers again. Arabella didn't know what to do for a few seconds. All she could think of was the money. It wasn't a case of the simple cash being in her hand, but of what it could do. Refusing to work with a woman who was already a customer would mean less food on the table for her and her father. Yet as Arabella weighed up her options, her eyes flitted to Lord Wareham down the path. He was distracted now, looking at one of the flowers nearby. When he coughed just once, she flinched, fearing the pollen of the flowers was getting to his lungs. The mere idea of her not being here to watch over him any more. But that task being given to Miss Withers instead pained her more than she could say. Envy ran through her as if it were a poison, enveloping each part of her body. As you wish, my lady, Arabella said and nodded firmly. If she did not make the tonics for Miss Withers, then with a little luck, perhaps she would not continue her attentions to Lord Wareham. I will not work with Miss Withers again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lady Clara stepped forward and took her hand. I'm well aware I ask for a lot, and I apologise for it. Think nothing of it, my lady. Arabella's eyes were only on Lord Wareham now as he coughed again. Excuse me. At once she ran down the path, with her skirt gathered in her hand to aid her pace. When she reached his side, Lord Wareham was leaning forward, his hands on his knees. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button this way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Breathe, my lord, breathe. In through the nose. They returned to one of the breathing exercises, and as his tailcoat slid off his shoulder, she picked it up from the earth and rifled through the pockets, looking for the handkerchief she had soaked that morning in herbs. Take this. At once he pressed it to his nose and breathed deeply. His eyes flicked to her over the cloth as she bent down to the level he was now at. Thank you, he whispered once the coughing had passed, and he lowered the handkerchief. What would I do without you, eh? You need not think of that, I'm here, my lord. I hope always to be. As Arabella returned to the house, she took off her pelisse and bonnet that had been sodden in the rain. Returning them to the hooks by the door, she caught the sight of rips in both of them where the material was fraying. If she had the money, she would buy something new, but it was not something she could do now. That evening, on her return journey home, she had stopped by the oak tree in the village and left a letter in a nook within the tree for Miss Withers to find. She apologised profusely, but said she could no longer provide the lady with her tonics. Mere seconds after she'd left the letter, the heavens had opened and it had not halted raining on her since. Father, Arabella called, seeking him out. Stepping into the front room, she caught sight of her father. Strangely, he was not working at the writing bureau as he so often did. He was sitting staring at the empty fire. Can we afford the coal, do you think? At his words, she stepped toward him. His cheeks were pale and his hands too, thanks to the chill of the room. Spring may have arrived, but the air was not yet warm with the heat of summer. Yes. Arabella lied and made up the fire for him knowing she had to keep him warm. As she took a tinderbox and set the fire going, she glanced repeatedly back to her father in the chair. He was haggard this evening, with dark shadows under his eyes. You're sodden, Arabella, 
Did you get caught in the rain? His words startled her, urging her to sit straight on the hearthrug. He noticed. Yes, I did. Make sure you have a hot bath this evening to warm through. The words urged her to smile, though she didn't agree with what he said. Using the coal now meant she wouldn't be able to afford the coal again later tonight. Swallowing uncomfortably around a lump in her throat, she thought of the implications of what she had done that day. Despite the difficulty of their situation, how close they were to hunger. She had refused a customer. Why? It wasn't just because Lady Clara had asked her to, but because she had not wanted to think of Miss Withers trying to charm Lord Wareham. When did this happen to me? Arabella turned her head and stared into the fire, watching as the flames took hold of the coals. When did my foolish heart start to imagine that maybe Lord Wareham would see me as I do him? She repeatedly told herself off for the foolish notion, fidgeting with her skirt and screwing up the hem in the palms of her hands as she reminded herself of the reality. The fact remained that no Marquess would ever marry the poor local healer. Chapter 14 Arabella You are distracted today, Arabella, Lord Wareham said, sitting forward in his chair. What is it? Something has upset you. She stiffened in her seat, uncertain what to say. All morning that she had been with him, she was well aware she had not been herself. The laughter from the day before on their walk seemed a distance away. Is it all this sneaking about? Lord Wareham asked and shifted in his seat before raising a hand and scratching his jaw uncomfortably. I know it is not a good thing, but you do see why I have done it, don't you? I wouldn't want my father to send you out of the house. I understand. Believe me, I do, Arabella assured him. She sat calmly on the footstool before him as she reached into her medicinal bag and made up a fresh herb-filled bowl of hot water for him to breathe in the steam. At the edge of the room, they were being chaperoned by a maid who was busy tidying. The only reason Arabella had been allowed up to Lord Wareham's chamber today was because his parents were out with Lady Clara and her husband. It hadn't stopped either of them repeatedly glancing toward the windows, clearly both nervous about a carriage returning. What would your father say, do you reckon, if he was to find me here? Well, Lord Wareham sighed deeply before a smirk appeared on his lips. I imagine my father's words would be difficult to hear over my mother's squeals of why I had a young lady in my chamber. They both laughed together. Arabella dropped some fresh herbs into the bowl of water before she pressed it into his lap, encouraging him to breathe. Scandalous indeed, she said mockingly. She would think so. The idea that you could be here at all to help. They would probably dismiss, as casually as they would, a dog. He mimicked what he thought their action would be, sitting tall in his seat and waving a hand in the air. Never have you looked so haughty, she said, smiling at his impression. The truth is, I do not like to think of my parents as proud people. In many ways, they aren't. And then every now and then they do something that reminds me they are accustomed to certain things. He coughed a little, before she pointedly glanced down at the bowl. Yes, Arabella. His voice softened as he breathed in the steam. Hearing her name spoken in such a way had Arabella jittery, aware of how her heart pounded in his chest. Oh, I need to get a hold of myself. She had barely slept the night before, for she had told herself repeatedly what a fool she was being. Whatever affection, admiration, even devotion she had to Lord Wareham could never be returned, and she only stood to be hurt by allowing herself to continue to think of it. She had quite decided to stop the affection, if only she knew how to. She stayed with Lord Wareham for some minutes more, encouraging him to breathe in the steam before she stood up to leave. You are going so soon, he said. Missing me already, she teased, lifting her bag under her arm. You have to go to accomplish that. He laughed with her, resting back in his chair. You have not long arrived. 
I am afraid I have things to do today, my lord, messages to collect. Yet you do not need me here today. She glanced toward the maid and checked the lady was busy, dusting some fine vase on a windowsill, before Arabella stepped toward Lord Wareham and placed a hand to his shoulder. You are managing your illness well these days. You could even do this all without me if I gave you the right herbs. You think too little of yourself, he said, his brows furrowing together. I'm not sure I could. The maid cleared her throat and Arabella stepped back. She felt herself blush, a heat creeping up her cheeks, just as Lord Wareham looked down and breathed in the steam from his bowl again. Until tomorrow, my lord. Until then, Arabella. The softness of his voice stayed with her as she left the chamber and the house. Nervous of a carriage approaching on the main drive and catching sight of her, she left through the servants' quarters. The staff had become so accustomed to seeing her now that they waved cheerily in parting before she stepped outside. Striding out across the estate, she took one of the smaller paths out to the forest and toward the village so she could avoid the driveway and any chance of meeting a carriage altogether. When she reached the village, she bought a few supplies, counting out a few of the coins she had saved up. With just a few vegetables in a basket and one lone leg of lamb, she covered them with a muslin cloth, hiding them from others' views. It was not much but she could perhaps make it stretch for two dinners for her father and herself. Before she headed home, Arabella cut back to the oak tree to see if anyone had left her any fresh messages. Repeatedly did she glance back over her shoulder as she approached the tree along the riverbank, wary of anyone seeing her. Yet, the village was so busy that day, everyone was more concerned with their own business than looking where one lone lady went. Walking down the river bank, now hidden from the view of the village completely, she found the oak tree and reached inside the nook. She had a couple of messages from customers who needed healing tonics. She resolved to pick up some herbs on her walk back home to make such tonics when the third letter caught her attention. That is Miss Withers' handwriting. Stepping away from the oak tree, she concealed herself completely in a clump of trees before she opened the letter, her hands moving in a rush. Whatever hope she'd had of Miss Withers forgetting their arrangement and moving on vanished within seconds of reading the opening words. Dear Bonadea, I must confess myself shocked by your letter. We had an agreement in place, and we cannot go back on it now. I paid for your services and it is imperative that you oblige. Allow me to make things clear. Continue to provide your tonics and remedies for my use, or I will make it known to the county who Bonadea really is. I do not doubt you have worked long and hard to keep your identity a secret. For why else would someone come up with such an absurd pseudonym? The Roman goddess for healing, it is quite laughable. You will provide your tonics again, or Wareham Town's scandal sheet and paper might find a new topic to discuss. Yours sincerely, Miss Withers. Arabella, do sit down. You are making me restless. Betchy's pleading had Arabella pausing for mere seconds before she began again. Betchy was sat by the open fire in the house she shared with her husband James on the Fitzroy estate. Arabella had come to see her about the letter, not bothering to stop home first. The letter was now clutched in Betchy's hands as Arabella paced up and down in front of the fire, feeling the warmth radiating into the room. It is much larger than any fire that Father and I can afford at present. Sit, Betchy said again, pointing to a stool in front of the fire. You're making this child kick nervously. She smiled a little as she placed a hand to her stomach. Arabella couldn't find her own smile, though she felt some comfort to know Betchy's child was doing so well. Gingerly, she sat on the stool, though she only took the edge, something that was noticed clearly by Betchy. Slowly, she returned the letter to Arabella. Do you believe her? Betchy asked slowly. That she knows who you really are? I do not know, Arabella cried in panic. I have always been so careful. Only a few people know that I, Arabella Spencer, am a healer, 
They all live in the Duke's house. The staff are so kind there and have been so secretive. That doesn't mean a few people won't whisper, Betsy said as she chewed her lip. Oh, have you heard them gossip? Arabella sat so far forward that she tipped the stool over. Heavens! Betsy moved to her feet and reached down, trying to help Arabella up. You are in a state! I'm hardly going to pull you over as I'm trying to get up, am I? Arabella softly knocked her friend's hand out of the way and stood herself, returning to the stool quickly. You've heard them gossip. No. Betsy shook her head firmly. I've seen none of the Duke's staff whisper at all, but that doesn't mean it has not happened. Yet even if they did whisper, there is something I do not understand. How would they equate your healing services for the Marquis of Wareham with the name of Bonadea? I don't know. I can't explain it. Arabella fiddled with the letter repeatedly in her lap, running the risk of tearing it. I'm afraid she knows something, though. What if she does? What if she sends it to the scandal sheets? It's difficult to know what to do for the best. Betsy's tone was as panicked as her own. Unable to settle, Arabella moved to her feet again and returned to pacing. Well, at least I am getting good exercise out of this, Arabella jested, trying to find some sort of joke that would lighten the air, but she made neither of them smile. What should I do? She abruptly stopped walking and turned to look at her friend. Betsy lifted a mint tea from beside her, one Arabella had prepared for her the moment she had arrived. Betsy took a slow sip, plainly weighing up what answer she should give. If you follow through with your resolution not to provide any more tonics, she could reveal who you are. What then? What's the worst that could happen? Betsy! Arabella spun on her heel and turned to face her friend. The whole town would know that the daughter of the poor merchant Mr. Spencer works as a healer. He would be humiliated. I would be ostracised, for let's face it, who really likes to talk of healers these days? We're discarded as women of myth and magic, not minds of science and botany. Betsy grimaced and hung her head forward. I fear you are right, she murmured. When people are whispering about a witch in town who provides love potions too, they would invariably link that to you. Oh my God, I cannot believe it has come to this. Arabella sunk down into the stool, nearly missing it completely this time, but just managing to grab the sides of the stool to stop herself from falling over on the hearth rug. There is no such thing as love potions. Neither is there such a thing as witches. People don't need proof to believe it, Betsy whispered. The words cast a silence between them. Arabella sat very still with her lips parted as she listened to the fire crack behind her, knowing what Betsy had said was completely true. Yet if I provided more tonics to Miss Withers, what then? she murmured, her voice much quieter now. I would be defying the specific request of a lady I respect. She thought of Lady Clara and the panic that had consumed the woman as she had asked Arabella not to sell the tonics to Miss Withers any more. I don't like selling them either. She fidgeted with the letter, then let it fall limp in her lap. You do not? Betsy asked, leaning forward. No. Arabella shook her head. Look at what happened to Lady Clara last year when she took the Belladonna tea. How close she came to... She shuddered unable to think of what a tragedy it could have been. What is it worth, really? None of the others are dangerous, but that one can be. All of it is in aim of someone's confidence. That is not worth risking taking Belladonna. Then you will not give them to Miss Withers again? Betsy asked, looking for clarification. Have you made your decision? Arabella didn't answer right away. She picked up the letter from her lap, read it, then folded it up so small it was just a crumpled mess in the palm of her hand. As well as all the reasons she had discussed with Betsy, there was another reason why she did not wish to help Miss Withers any more. What if she has truly set her cap at Lord Wareham? 
Arabella didn't consider herself impeding Miss Withers by not providing the tonics. She simply wouldn't be helping another lady to catch the eye of the man that she cared for any more. My heart will not let me do it. I cannot imagine it. She imagined the way Lord Wareham had been with her that morning. How he'd leaned toward her out of his chair, sensing something was wrong. In that moment it had been so easy to persuade her foolish mind that he cared for her, as she did him. I'm utterly devoted. When did that happen? Somewhere between caring for him, laughing with him, walking the grounds and making jests about the flower names and other such nonsense, all of that had become the parts of her days she cherished most. Good God, I'm falling in love with him. Arabella? Betchy whispered her name, still waiting for that answer. I will not give the tonics to Miss Withers. Arabella turned and threw the letter onto the fire, watching as the yellow flames engulfed the paper and the scent of burning filled the air. I cannot do it, for my own sake and for another's. Then you are willing to run the risk of what she will do next. Arabella turned back to her friend and nodded softly. As far as I see it, I have no choice. I will just have to wait and see if her threat was an empty one or if it was very real indeed. Arabella sat still on the stool as her friend stood from her chair and moved toward her. Betchy wrapped her arms around Arabella and embraced her tightly. Arabella clung back. It was a little difficult with Betchy's stomach so rounded now. She couldn't have been far off the day the child would greet them all. Yet Arabella held on as tightly as she could, needing her friend in that moment. Chapter 15 Daniel They still do not suspect anything? Arabella asked. Not yet. Daniel smiled as he encouraged Arabella to sit down beside him at the table. The maid had brought in tea a short while ago, and he was using it as a pretext for Arabella's visit. Already that morning his mother had seen Arabella arrive, but Daniel had explained away her presence by saying she was an old friend who had come to see him. It had settled Marianne's curiosity for a short while, as she simply shrugged off the matter, claiming she was getting forgetful and wondered why she couldn't remember the face of one of Daniel's old friends. This feels like a great risk, Arabella said, leaning toward Daniel across the table. Distracted by that movement, he froze her with the teapot, his eyes on Arabella alone. Her gaze was furtively turning to the doorway every now and then, for she was plainly fearful. I thought you did not want your parents to see me at all. Well, things change. Daniel shrugged as though it was no great matter and returned to pouring out the tea. There was a sound in the corner of the room from a maid moving about the one that had been sent by Marianne to chaperone, the two of them. Daniel found himself glancing toward that chaperone with resentment. It's not like being alone with Arabella, is it? I wish you to keep coming, Arabella, he whispered to her, glancing at the maid who was busying herself with embroidery and not paying attention to them at all. And I do not wish to insist on you having to sneak about all the time. If my mother and father can see you as my friend, then they'll think nothing more of your visits, as long as they know nothing of your visits to my chamber. He smiled with the words, but he was aware something was off. Since the moment Arabella had arrived, she was fidgeting constantly. Her hands either reached for the auburn curls of her hair and twisted the loose locks or she kept reaching down to the medicine bag she had hidden under the table in the parlour. Arabella, Daniel whispered and laid a hand over her wrist. She at once stilled, her eyes going wide, though she didn't reach for the medicine bag again. Is something wrong? It's nothing. She sighed with the words, tilting her chin downward. He could have sworn she was looking at the gentle hold he had over her wrist. She's not pulling away. You know you can tell me anything, Daniel continued. When a sound passed the open door of the sitting room, 
He retracted his hand, and Arabella reached for her teacup abruptly. Out of the corner of his eye, Daniel could see his mother wandering the hallway. She was clearly using it as a pretense to check up on him. She will ask me many questions about Arabella later. I do not doubt it. Yet Daniel had made a decision. He had no wish to keep Arabella a secret forever. Perhaps if he could change his parents' minds gradually about the idea of local healers, then she could be welcomed into this house. How are you faring today? Arabella asked, continuing to fidget as she turned the teacup around in her saucer. Once Marianne moved on from her position by the door, Daniel laid a hand over her teacup. The movement had Arabella jumping in her seat, turning to look at him. Better than you by the looks of things. His jest managed to bring a small smile to his lips. Something is wrong. Will you not tell me what it is? It's nothing. She waved away the idea. Oh yes, that was believable. His thick sarcasm made her eyebrows quirk, though she didn't quite manage a full smile. I see I'm not going to get the truth out of you, am I? It is my worry alone, my lord. She offered a weary look, her fingers falling still around the teacup as he released it. I would not burden you with it. I wish to be burdened. His deep voice made her shift in the chair. For a second, a blush bled into her cheeks. He held himself very still, realizing it could have been because he had leaned toward her. Do I have the effect on her that she has on me? What kind of friend would I be to you then? Arabella asked, mimicking his position and resting one elbow on the table to lean toward him. They came so close that their arms brushed together. One that lays extra weight on your shoulders? I would not do that. I'd be a supportive friend to you then, he said, keeping his voice deep. Arabella, you and I have spent many a minute in this house together. We've jested, and each day I see you smile. You think I cannot tell when my jests are not making you smile today? She forced a rather comical smile that had him laughing. Well, I stand corrected. He mimicked her smile, and they both fell about laughing together. At least I can still manage to make you laugh then, even when something is upsetting you. You are kind. Arabella held his gaze. There was a moment where the two of them said nothing. They just stared at one another. Daniel was glad his mother was no longer looking through the door, nor was the maid paying them any attention, for had such a look been observed by others, it would have probably been thought scandalous. Arabella was the first to look away, busying herself by looking into the teacup. If I cannot discover what it is that is upsetting you, then I shall continue to try to cheer you up, Daniel said with finality, and sat straight. First there's cake. He took one of the plates from the centre of the table and proffered it toward her. Secondly, there's more tea. He topped up her cup, watching as her lips turned upward into a smile. Thirdly, there is something I must tell you. What is that? she asked, tucking into the cake with her fork. It's about these last few weeks. Daniel felt abruptly heated as Arabella looked up from the cake fork at him. I should tell her the truth. He was no fool. Spending this much time with her had led to not only a bond but a strength of feeling on his part he had not thought he would ever experience. She deserved to know something about it. I wanted to tell you what a difference this time has meant to me. His whispered words had her pausing in eating with her eyes rising to meet his. You mean the tonics? Yes, well, I... Pausing, he pulled at his cravat, finding it was suddenly too tight. He cleared his throat and crossed his arms over his chest before he went on. You must have seen when you first came I was not in a healthy state. You have changed that, considerably. She smiled at his words. There now, that's the smile that's been missing. He nodded toward her, watching as she sat back in her seat. She at last looked comfortable. There's something more I wanted you to know too. He pulled at his cravat, 
wondering how he was to go about this next part. I have to tell her something. I must. Daniel couldn't continue with this constant silence on the matter of what she truly meant to him. She had flirted with him often enough, had she not? She blushed. She smiled at him. She was always here when he needed her. Was he so much of a fool to think he might have hope for her returning his affection? Or was it a hope with good reason? Arabella, he whispered, and sat forward abruptly, returning to his position of resting an elbow on the table and leaning toward her. Yes, she murmured, mirroring what he had done. These last few weeks they... Daniel! Daniel! Marianne's sudden voice had Daniel holding his breath. Gritting his teeth, he winced, watching as Arabella looked between him and the doorway. Your mother, she whispered. My mother, he confirmed with a heavy sigh. They both put distance between them and leaned back, just as Marianne hastened into the room. Daniel, have you seen this? Yet, as Marianne appeared, she was not alone. Clara must have arrived for a visit, for she trailed at their mother's heels. Startled by his sister's entry, Daniel looked to the window behind him, where he could see her carriage on the driveway. He'd been so caught up in thinking of Arabella and her visit, he hadn't even noticed the arrival of the carriage. Mother, now is not the time. Clara darted around Marianne and offered an apologetic look to Daniel and Arabella. She attempted to snatch something from Marianne's hands, but she had little success. What is going on? Daniel asked distractedly. He was aware Arabella had returned to her fidgeting, her fingers running up and down the handle of the teacup. Something is wrong with her today. It is too interesting to be ignored, surely, Marianne said, managing to keep the scrap of paper in her hand before Clara could take it. I'm sure Daniel's friend will be interested to read it too. She walked around her daughter, waving the paper in the air. Mother, Daniel is busy with his friend. Clara tried again. Unable to snatch the paper away from their mother, she walked all the way to the stable and elbowed Daniel in the shoulder, clearly instructing him to send their mother away. Can it wait? Daniel asked his mother, being careful not to spill tea over the rim of his cup after Clara nudged him. The action was plainly observed by Arabella, who tried her best to hide her giggle behind her teacup. I'm busy, mother, and I have no interest in... He paused, seeing what was in their mother's hand as she stopped on the other side of the table. Scandal sheets. At the words, Arabella nearly dropped the teacup beside him. Daniel's eyes turned toward her, wondering what had spooked her so much. Oh, I know you have no interest in them. Marianne waved the paper dismissively in the air. Yet this is fascinating. Here, let me read it to you. Pray, mother, do not. Clara pinched the bridge of her nose in frustration before rounding the table, reaching for their mother. What has gotten into you? Marianne asked, taking the paper away from Clara's reach. Perhaps I just feel this is not the right moment. Clara glanced at Arabella with the words. Daniel was lost, confused as to why Clara was so insistent on getting the paper away from their mother. Before Daniel could think much more about it, their mother cleared her throat and began to read from the scandal sheet as if she were some orator on stage. Listen to this. Local woman unmasked as a witch. At Marianne's loud words, Daniel stilled. There is surely no such thing as witches. He was not a superstitious sort, and despite what whispers that had been, he had never believed in such things. A witch, he repeated and laughed. That is quite a mad idea. It is merely gossip. Wouldn't you agree, Ara? Miss Spencer. He corrected himself before he could say her Christian name. His mother plainly didn't notice, but Clara did, whose gaze darted quickly between the two of them. Yes, 
I would, Arabella said hurriedly, though she put her teacup down and pushed it away across the table. The action was done rather hurriedly. It goes on. Marianne returned her focus to the scandal sheet. The witch is much talked of at present, for she is selling love potions to men and women. All be warned what you drink and eat at present. A sip of wine, and you might find yourself falling for a man whom you would usually avoid and feign a headache to refuse a dance with. What a notion! Marianne laughed incredulously and thrust the scandal sheet into Daniel's hands. Daniel! You must be careful of such a thing if there's a witch in the village. Mother. Clara's warning tone was clearly missed. I do not believe in witches, Daniel said easily, though he took the article from her and let his eyes scan over the article. It went on in some detail about the potions, talking of cakes intended to ensnare a man's senses. Despite Daniel's words, he was left uncomfortable. He shifted in his seat, thinking of the cupcake Clara had knocked from his hand that day of the picnic. Maybe it was a good thing I did not eat it. Men beware of the witch, he read aloud from the article. They say she would bind a man to a woman he does not love just for a few shillings. Ha! The idea is laughable, don't you think? He turned the article to Arabella, hoping to get her view. Only she moved to her feet. Her eyes didn't dart to the article, not once. If you would excuse me, I'm afraid I have to go home. Arabella curtsied with the words. She took hold of her medicine bag from under the table and held it behind her as she walked away. What? So soon? Daniel thrust the scandal sheet back to his mother as he moved to his feet and hurried after Arabella. Goodness, that was a quick visit, Marianne murmured to Clara and stepped around her, clearly intending to follow Daniel. He was relieved to see his sister held back their mother, not allowing her to follow any further. Arabella. Daniel used her name as he caught up with her in the hall. She was hurrying to pull on a Spencer jacket and a bonnet, her movements so harried that she shook as she tied the bow of her bonnet and dropped the medicine bag. He managed to catch it in the air and held it out for her again. Is something wrong? I'm so sorry, my lord she said hurriedly. I have just remembered I promised to see another patient this morning. I'm already late for them. I must go. But, Daniel reached toward her. The last few times they had said goodbye to each other, he had taken her hand, or there had been some sort of moment passing between them. Either Arabella dwelled on the spot for a minute or two, continuously looking at him, or he pleaded with her to stay, making jests that had laughter falling from her lips. Today, things were different. Arabella hurried out of the house so fast, Daniel did not even have time to utter the word goodbye. He watched as she scurried down the drive, heading back to the main road. Was she really late for a patient? Chapter 16 Daniel Oh, I'm an idiot, Daniel muttered to himself. Holding a cloth over his head, he breathed in the steam from the bowl. He'd used the herbs Arabella had left with him that morning. They were already helping to clear his lungs. Since she had left so hastily, he'd felt tightness across his chest. Holding himself so stiffly had plainly had a bad reaction on his lungs. Breathe, you fool, he murmured, bending further over the bowl. Daniel? Marianne's voice travelled down the corridor, moving closer to his chamber. Daniel sighed but didn't respond to her right away. That afternoon he realised what must have urged Arabella to leave so quickly. His mother had talked of a local witch. Such stories as this must give women like Arabella, local healers, a bad name. That is the last thing I want to do. He was already planning on assuring Arabella that he didn't believe in such nonsense the next time he saw her. Daniel. His mother tapped on the door with the word. Yes, he called, flicking the cloth back round his neck as he lifted himself up from the bowl. The door opened and Marianne bustled in, her eyes flicked down to the steam with apparent worry. Is it your lungs? Are they upsetting you? 
She rushed across the room and reached for his shoulders. I'm fine, mother. He patted her hand in reassurance. This is about management. That is what my, my doctor says. He was so tempted to tell his mother the truth, but fearful of her reaction, he held back about who his doctor was. What has you in such a flurry? Our plans for tonight. Oh, Daniel, you are still feeling well enough to go for dinner, are you not? Miss Withers will be most disappointed if you do not come. Marianne gushed and released his shoulder, clasping her palms together. Ah, I had quite forgotten about tonight. Daniel stiffened in his seat. Feeling that tightness return, he breathed deeply and bent over the steam bowl again. Must we go? We had dinner with the Withers family not that long ago. And they have invited us again. It is a kindness, dear, she reminded him good-naturedly. Besides, I believe Miss Withers has formed quite an attachment to you. Would it be so wrong for me to hope that something could come of it? Yes, Daniel said swiftly, standing from the bowl. I'm afraid whatever attachment you hope for between Miss Withers and I must be forgotten. I could not consider the woman as anything more than a friend. He circled the table where the bowl of hot water was placed, trying to put distance between him and his mother, but she followed him. You have not spent much time with her, Marianne pleaded. You cannot rule her out entirely. It is merely that you do not know much about love, dear. Not yet. You might be surprised when you do feel the pangs of it some day. Pangs. There was something in the word that shook Daniel to his core. He faltered, not quite walking away from his mother any more. That was what he had felt that day when Arabella had run from the house. There had been a deep ache in his chest. This talk of witches made her leave, that was the problem. Perhaps I should come tonight, Daniel murmured as a sudden idea struck him. Miss Withers had tried to make him eat a cupcake. It was just possible that she had gone to this supposed witch and asked for her potions. Maybe some good can come out of talking to the lady. What was that, dear? Marianne asked distractedly, reaching down to the vials of herbs that were beside his water bowl. Nothing. He lied, his mind working fast. He put together a plan. If he could persuade Miss Withers to be open with him, perhaps he could discover who this witch was. Maybe then he could do something to ensure Arabella's reputation was not spoiled by this talk of a witch. Yes, very well, Mother. I will come tonight. That's excellent news. Marianne clasped her hands together delightedly before she hovered by the vials of herbs once more. With interest, she picked one up and held it into the light. What are all these things, Daniel? I do not remember seeing your doctor with these. They are the new solution suggested by my physician. They are working. He hurriedly took the vials from her and replaced them on the table so she couldn't look too closely at them. What about your smoking? Dr. Robertson always said that smoking could clear the lungs. I have not seen you smoke since I have returned, Marianne said with interest. That is because I have stopped. Daniel shook his head as he collected the vials and hastened across the room, hiding them in a drawer in his bureau. My new doctor believes smoking could have the opposite effect. Really? Marianne tried to follow him to the drawer and peer inside, but he shut it hurriedly. He knew tucked away in that drawer were note cards written by Arabella, where she had described exactly how much of each herb to add to his steam bowl. Her name could be clearly read on some of them. Well, that's done. He turned his back on the bureau and blocked his mother's path to the drawer. What time are we to leave for the Withers' house? In an hour. I'll see you downstairs, dear. She parted from the room in a happy manner, practically humming the tune from the wedding march. 
She'd have me walking down the aisle tomorrow if she could. The mere thought had Daniel looking back at the drawer full of Arabella's things. Miss Withers, I must confess a desire to talk to you. At Daniel's words, Miss Withers blushed and held her head high. She looked so happy that it made his gut writhe with guilt. This conversation is a means to an end. As he led her away from the main group, now that dinner was finished, the two of them sat side by side in the window seat of her family's front room. Miss Withers clutched to a port glass in her hand and leaned forward, her whole manner suggesting anticipation. Daniel purposefully leaned back, increasing the distance between them. Have you seen this odd story in the scandal sheets about a witch? he asked, prompting her on. Oh, I see. Her lips pressed together momentarily, clearly disappointed with the topic. I heard you have a thorough knowledge of the village. He attempted a compliment to smooth over the conversation. I could not think of a better person to ask what the truth of the matter was. He offered a smile, one that made her beam. She leaned toward him once more and he stiffened. It's not the same as when Arabella is near. The scents were entirely different. The smell of orchid perfume now hung in the air and he disliked it intensely. It was rather too strong and made his lungs feel tight. Well, I do like to keep informed, and I have many friends in the village that tell me things. I am a great confidant of many. She hung her head forward a little as if attempting modesty, yet Daniel had heard the pride in her words regardless. There is a witch, my lord. A real witch? His eyebrows quirked high. Forgive my reaction. I am not one for superstition. Well, there is superstition, and there is that we simply do not understand. But many have been executed in these parts over the years for witchcraft, right back to the 16th century. Have you not heard the tales, my lord? Once more, she moved toward him, yet she shuffled along the bench this time. As subtly as he could, Daniel shifted the other way, stopping her hand before it could brush the side of his leg. I've heard the tales, but stories can be exaggerated when they are passed between people. One impressive act to one man would become witchcraft to another. Daniel shrugged, thinking nothing of the historical tales. Do you know who this witch is? Well, I... Miss Withers paused and looked to their families who were talking so avidly in conversation they paid no attention to Daniel and Miss Withers together. I confess I have had some interaction with her. Is that not thrilling? Me talking to a witch? That is how I know it to be true. Truly? Daniel thought only of the cupcake. His certainties began to shift a little. You used her services? Oh, not in that regard though the way she blushed and looked down into her port glass suggested it was very much what she had done. As soon as I realised who I was dealing with, I broke off the arrangement. Yet I exchanged letters with the witch for a while. You did? How? Daniel asked with interest. There's an old oak tree at the edge of the town, where the river curves away past the bridge. She hides her letters in there in an attempt to keep her identity a secret. Miss Withers rolled her dark eyes, clearly scoffing at the idea. You would think a witch would think of something more inventive. She laughed, clearly thinking she was impressing him. He forced more of a smile, making it seem as if he was impressed. What did you use her for? Daniel was aware of Miss Withers shuffling toward him another time. He inched away, dangerously at risk of falling off the window seat. She provided me some tonics. That is all. Miss Withers sipped her claret eagerly. Once she offered me the love potions, I of course refused and broke off the connection. It's true then. Daniel was still not sure what to believe. She offered you actual love potions. She did. Imagine that. She laughed at the idea. She would be so willing to trap a man in marriage to a woman just so she could earn something. Miss Withers continued to giggle as Daniel fidgeted. 
The words the lady had used were so similar to what had been in that scandal sheet, he was made abruptly uncomfortable. Is this what people will think of all local healers now? Is this what people will think of Arabella? It is not to be borne. I can scarcely believe I have communicated with her, Miss Withers said with childish delight. To see her mentioned in the scandal sheets, what a thrill. It's good to know such witches will not be allowed to succeed in this world, do you not think? Hmm. Daniel had no words. His mind could not settle on one opinion for long. He kept telling himself he did not believe witches were real, then a momentary doubt would creep in. Either way, whether this woman was a witch or not, her name was being dragged through the mud. As Miss Withers continued to laugh, this is what caught Daniel's attention. Miss Withers was happy to see another woman's name ruined. The mere thought of it did not concern her at all. She lacks kindness in her. No, Miss Withers is not a woman for me, no matter what my mother may hope for. The thought had Daniel imagining there was another sitting beside him in the window sill. He thought of Arabella. He imagined that when she lifted her head, the few loose locks of auburn hair from her chignon would fall past her cheek. Those hazel eyes would crinkle as she laughed with him. My lord, did you hear me? Miss Withers's question had him shaking himself. And what was that? I was saying how glad I am you have come to see us tonight. When she reached out toward him, her hand could have fallen on his leg. It was audacious indeed, and he could not allow it to happen. Fearing scandal, he shuffled so far away he stumbled to his feet off the windowsill. Miss Withers stared at him in amazement as they drew the attention of some of those in the room. Clumsy me, Daniel muttered and stepped away from Miss Withers. I shall keep my distance from her. Chapter 17 Arabella I will be quick. It is not nice, but it must be done, Arabella muttered to herself repeatedly as she walked toward the Duke's house. She had fidgeted so much with the leather bag in her hand that her palm was clammy around the handle. Tired thanks to her sleepless night, she kept raising her hand to cover her yawns. I cannot bear this. How can I go on like this? The revelation of the scandal sheet the day before had changed much. Arabella feared any moment another sheet would appear that bore her name. Already Miss Withers had spread rumours about her. This witch was being talked of in the village as the familiar of the devil, someone out to cause mischief and misery. They have demonised me. Good God, I'm hated. Arabella knocked on the door and stepped back again. She knew if she was to survive this scandal and avoid discovery, she had to stay hidden as much as possible. Already that morning she had been to see Betchy, who had confirmed many people were speaking of the story. Arabella had resolved to spend as little time in the village as possible, and most of her time at home. This will be a short visit with Lord Wareham. Then I will be on my way. What would he think if he ever knew Miss Withers was talking about me? The door opened, but rather than the butler or one of the maids opening it, Lord Wareham stood in the doorway. Lord Wareham, she said in surprise. My parents are out, so there is no secrecy today. He beckoned her inside. Come, and no running off either today. Do not think I didn't notice how you scurried out of here yesterday. I was seeing a patient. Yes, of course you were. He took the medicine bag from her, his hand brushing hers. She tried not to think of the jolt it made to her hand. The power he has over me seems to get stronger every day. She bent her head and avoided looking him in the eye, trying to hide her blush. He helped her off with her Spencer jacket and the bonnet that he placed neatly on a coat stand, then beckoned her into the sitting room. Just as the day before, tea had been set up yet an entire luncheon had been prepared with it. Oh, Arabella murmured, moving forward in surprise as she carried the leather bag with her. Such a spread prepared would make it doubly difficult for her to leave so quickly. We are to share lunch? 
we are. He took the leather bag from her again and placed it on the nearest chair. For a minute there is to be no talk about medicines. Why not? she asked in surprise. Because I, I wish for us to sit and talk. I'm afraid I... Arabella was already reaching for the medicine bag. She lifted it up again, turning to find Lord Wareham in front of her. He was so close that she broke off what she was saying, her hands clutching the bag between them. Arabella, you hold the bag like it's a shield, he whispered with an amused grin. Do you really need that here with me? You are being mischievous again, she accused, prompting him to laugh. Looking round, she noticed there was no maid with them. Where is our chaperone? The maids are busy. I have left the door open. He waved at the door, showing it was proper enough. Besides, I wish to talk to you alone, without fear of anyone overhearing our conversation. He stepped back from her and moved to the table. Arabella followed, but she took the bag with her. As Lord Wareham sat down, he gestured to her to do the same, but she could not. She reached into her bag. I have some things for you to try, she explained in a rush. Here, this is a new breathing exercise for you. She pushed forward the note card bearing some instructions. He picked it up, turning it over distractedly. These are some new herbs for your steam bowls. She passed him some vials. He took them, fumbling, and nearly dropping them. This is an unusual one, too. She presented him with a small jaw of orange powder. This is turmeric. I've seen how it can reduce inflammation. I think prepared in a tea it could help you. She passed him another note card detailing the instructions on how to prepare the tea. Oh, there's also this... Whoa! Arabella, take a breath, I beg you. Lord Wareham laid everything on the table before he stood to his feet. You are rambling. I'm not. She took a glass vial from the bag and turned it over in her palms. He raised his eyebrows in clear dismissal of her words. I'm not rambling. Yes, and the Pope isn't Catholic, is he? His jest had her smiling yet only a little. Goodness, can you not crack a full smile at all? Something truly is upsetting you. I'm fine, my lord. I'm fine. He playfully narrowed his eyes. Those are not good words to hear. In my experience, Clara only ever says that when she's not fine, but doesn't wish to talk about it. Well, at least you can translate very well. Arabella smiled, just as Lord Wareham pointed at her. At last, a jest from you. He took the bag from her grasp and laid it on the chair behind her. If I cannot persuade you to speak of what has you in such a tiz at the moment, then sit with me a while and eat, please. Maybe that will make you smile, even if I'm not doing particularly well at it at the moment. You always make me smile. Arabella found the words falling from her lips in a rush. It clearly caught Lord Wareham's attention as he held out her chair for her. He stood taller. Well, that has made my day, he whispered in her ear as she sat and he pushed the chair in for her. Now, sit. Let us talk of other things for a while. Yet Arabella could not settle easily. Each time she and Lord Wareham relaxed into conversation, she thought again of that scandal sheet. She feared what could happen and what he'd think of her if he were to discover the truth. I couldn't bear him disliking me for it. I couldn't. I am no witch. At one point in their lunch, she merely stared at him as he spoke, lost in thoughts. She was admiring his features and the rather unruly cropped beard. When she found herself fantasising about drawing a hand through the cinnamon hair across his temple, she lowered her eyes from him. Ah, well, I thought that story might make you relax, but it plainly hasn't. Lord Wareham smiled. Arabella, he whispered. Please, talk to me. I wish to, she confessed in a whisper, 
yet it would be wrong to. Why? Because... She paused and jumped to her feet. She reached for the bag behind her, something that made Lord Wareham sigh deeply. I am your healer, and you are a Marquess. Does that make us not friends, then? Lord Wareham's words had her gut tightening. We are always friends, she whispered, wishing she could describe him as someone so much more intimate to her. Always. Then speak to me, he pleaded and moved to his feet, standing so close she felt heated at the proximity. If there is something worrying you, then share it with me, I beg of you. I... She nearly did. The truth was, on the tip of her tongue, but it didn't quite appear. I fear his reaction too much. If he knew that she was the one who had constructed that cupcake recipe Miss Withers had tried to give him, what would he think then? He might fear I'm the witch they believe me to be. I have to go, she murmured. Lord Wareham, I'm so sorry. Giving in to temptation, she reached for his hand. Desperate for a single touch, she took it momentarily. He grasped at it. When she turned and left, he held on to it for longer than she did, clearly trying to keep her there. You don't have to go yet, he pleaded with her. I must. Until tomorrow, my lord. She bobbed a curtsy and hurried from the room, feeling as she ran away as if her heart was growing taut and tight in her chest. He can never know. Daniel. Daniel sat in the parlour for a long time. So restless his knee bobbed up and down repeatedly. The way Arabella had run from him again was making him ache. She's afraid that must be it, he whispered aloud. She's afraid of all this talk of a witch and what it means for her. It angered him more than anything that Arabella couldn't share her worries with him. Yet he also knew he had given her no cause to be so open with her. Was he not the one who has insisted their connection remained a secret from his own parents? Had he not made her sneak around, even creeping in and out of the house through the servant's door? Why would she share a confidence with such a man as me? Daniel moved to stand, so restless that he found it impossible to remain sitting. I have to do something. I must. Once the thought had occurred, he could not stop it. If there was a way to make this witch abandon what she was doing, selling these love potions, then the gossip would fade in time. The village would find something else to talk about, and they would desist all their whispers about witches and local healers. Arabella's reputation would be safe. Flinging himself from the room, Daniel snatched up his tailcoat from the hooks by the door and requested the butler send a message to the stable yard for his horse to be prepared. Returning to the parlour momentarily, he snapped up a handkerchief he had soaked in the herbs Arabella had left for him that morning. Inhaling the scent, he found peppermint, ginger and rosemary tickling his nose. It was an odd mixture, but he breathed deeply, straight after it. She's a clever woman, Arabella, to know all these things. Stuffing the handkerchief into his pocket, he left the house and found his horse. Determined not to suffer atop the horse, he rode carefully and didn't push himself. He tested his capabilities at first, doing a few short rounds of the lawn to ensure his lungs did not react, before he urged the horse toward the drive and rode out of the estate. The path toward the village was a wide one banked with flowers on each side, now that spring firmly had its clutches in the ground. Yet despite the warmer weather, a storm was coming with it. Even now he could see the grey clouds in the distance. They were swarming, like bees over the village, and he could have sworn he heard the rumble of thunder in the distance. Miss Withers talked of an oak tree. If I am to find this witch, then that is where I must look. He rode all the way through the village without even hesitating until he found the bridge on the other side. Here, barely anyone walked about. It was late afternoon and most people had returned home, but with the storm moving in, what few people remained now ran to their houses. 
Some gentlemen held frock coats over their heads, and even a few ladies waved their shawls in the air. Daniel did nothing to stop the rain falling on his head as it began. He supposed Arabella would reprimand him tomorrow, risking getting a cold in this weather, but he was determined to do something for her, as she had done for him. It was worth the risk. Leaving the horse by the bridge, he tacked up the reins to a small gatepost and walked under the bridge, finding the river. It was a small thing, more of a babbling brook, that now trickled faster with the rain coming down. Keeping the river on his left, he walked slowly down the river bank, with his hessian boots slipping in the mud every now and then. A bank of trees fell away, revealing a small nook in the land where one lonely oak tree stood. Daniel stumbled on his feet when he saw it. Part of him had wanted to believe the entire tale of the oak tree was a lie. So then he could persuade himself the witch was a lie too. He was about to walk toward the tree when a figure moved to it first. Dressed in a dark cloak, neither their figure nor face was visible to him. They were completely hidden, apart from the slender hand that reached up into the knot of the tree and pulled down a bundle of letters. That hand was thin, unmistakably a lady's hand. Halt! Daniel called to the figure. At once she froze, with the bundle of letters clutched in front of her. She's the witch. I must speak to her. I must ask her to end this. For Arabella's sake. He hurried toward her. The woman moved off, stumbling away, her back turned toward him. I said halt, he called again. The woman must have known he could outrun her if they came to it, for she stopped and turned around. Her head hung so far forward he could still not see her face. Are you the witch they all talk of? Are you she? When the woman didn't answer, the rain came down harder. Lightning flashed overhead, and it was followed by the deep rumble of thunder. The woman flinched at the sound, with the droplets running off the edge of her cloak and onto the ground, creating a puddle of water between them. Tell me who you are, Daniel pleaded with her. The woman said nothing. Her hands merely fidgeted around the letters. There was something so familiar about that action, it had Daniel's gut tightening into a knot. That is not possible. Reaching forward, he tugged on the head of the cloak, pulling it backward to reveal the witch's face. As she lifted her head, the auburn hair fell away from her cheeks, and her hazel eyes stared at him. Arabella Chapter 18 Arabella Arabella? Lord Wareham said her name a second time, clearly in disbelief. How is this possible? How is he here? She blinked, but he did not disappear. This wasn't some awful figment of her imagination, and the rain was too cold and wet on her skin for her to mistake it for a nightmare. My lord, please, she whispered, her voice barely audible above the loud rain. It is not what you think. He backed up from her and shook his head a little, his eyes turning to the tree where she had just received her letters. I didn't think it was true, you know. He scoffed and shook his head. I thought the idea of a witch was laughable. It is laughable, she stepped toward him. Yet he mirrored her action and moved back, increasing the distance between them. Witches do not exist. Do they not? he asked. Once before she had seen doubt in his expression. For all his talk of not believing in such superstitions, here he was, fully prepared to believe it. Then explain to me why you are here. He gestured to the tree. I was told about the witch they all speak of. How she talks with her clients using this tree, exchanging letters. He motioned wildly down at the letters in her grasp the wave of his hand a mad and derisive one. It was you all the time. I... She didn't know what to say. Lord Wareham was looking at her with such hatred, his cheeks red and his brow furrowed, she was tongue-tied. Say something, he begged. I'm not a witch. Yet her words made him turn away, walking in a quick circle and shaking his head. I'm not... 
then explain something to me. He abandoned his fast-paced circle and turned back to face her. Explain the cupcakes that I keep being told about, hmm? I even told you of how Miss Withers tried to give one to me. They are not laced with a potion, she said, vehemently, wishing him to believe her. He didn't appear to be listening and was shaking his head. It is nothing of the kind. What of the belladonna? He whipped his head back toward her. Clara told me about that. Belladonna drops. She said Miss Withers was using it. I... I provided the drops, yes, but they are not a potion. Despite her words, he still didn't seem to be hearing her. He was too lost in the anger. You think I have not heard of Belladonna? he asked, waving his arms madly between them. They call it deadly nightshade, don't they? When she said nothing, he goaded her on. We were talking one day about all the weird names they give to plants. I do not believe that one to be misnamed, do you? It was a pleasant day he was reminding her of, but that memory now felt sullied. It's poisonous, isn't it? he asked, his tone growing increasingly louder. Yes, but it's not when it's diluted down. I cannot believe I'm hearing this. He turned away from her again. Never had she thought he would be so angry with her. She hadn't pictured him capable of this sort of fury. The first day they had met, he had been grumpy and foul-tempered. But this? This was a different version of Lord Wareham entirely. You are barely hearing me at all. She stepped toward him, desperate to make him listen properly. My lord, I am not a witch. You have to believe me in that. There is no such thing. Then what are all these things? he asked. The belladonna, the cupcakes, anything else you give to your customers? He muttered the last word derisively and gestured toward the letters in her hands. What do you give them when they ask? Not love potions? she insisted. Why did you do it? He barely gave her time to answer any of the questions. He walked so close toward the river that she followed him. My lord, the water. She reached toward him. I don't understand. He spun round to face her, his boot on the very edge of the riverbank. Why would you give Miss Withers this stuff to use on me? He placed his hands on his chest. She tried to give me a cupcake. She used the belladonna. He waved a hand at his own eyes. Clara saw it all and I was blind to it. Why, if you were ever my true friend, would you give it all to her? I didn't know. Arabella said, matching his loud tone. I didn't know she wished to impress you. She never said your name. He backed up once again, his boot going over the edge of the river bank. My lord. Arabella ran toward him just as he fell in. The brook was so shallow that the water only came up to his knees. He looked down at the river, lifting one leg and shaking off the water that ran down his boot. You must come out of the river, quick. You cannot risk a cold, not you in your condition. It would be worse for you than for others. You would actually try to tell me what to do now for my condition, he asked. He stepped back up onto the riverbank, shaking off the water. She moved away an inch to allow him to move, but she didn't back away from him completely. I don't need the words of a witch. I am no witch. She reached out and took his arm, before he could stride away from her. I have spent nearly every day with you for many weeks. Is there honestly anything about me that makes you believe I'm a witch? He hesitated, looking down at the grasp she had on his arm. Nothing, he whispered. For a second Arabella thought she had persuaded him to look at the real her, to shed all these mad thoughts of witches completely. Then Lord Wareham shook his head a few seconds later. Yet perhaps I was wrong. Maybe witches are just those who use tonics and potions to drug another. They do not have to be magical, but... You think I would sell anything to drug someone? To make them do something they did not wish to? She released his arm in horror at the thought. 
I am not that sort of person. I just cannot believe. He trailed off and turned round, then looked down at his trousers that were soaking with water. My lord. Arabella swallowed around the lump in her throat. She was distraught, crippled by the pain in her chest, but she could not continue this argument when he was putting his health at risk. You need to care for yourself, she said, and gestured to his trousers. You must get warm, and soon. Her words had him stilling, looking at her with wide eyes. I cannot believe you can say something so caring for me in one breath, then hand someone a potion to use against me behind my back. He stepped back from her. That's not what happened. Her words were doing no good. It was plain to her now that Lord Wareham was not seeing her as she really was. He was too in shock, too angered to see the wood from the trees. You are not listening to anything I say. As testament, he didn't respond. He merely repeated that frantic circle on the riverbank he had paced out mere seconds ago. I can't stay here any more. He strode away, heading back the way he had come along the riverbank. My lord. She went to follow him, but a wave of his hand told her not to and she stumbled to a stop, nearly falling into the river herself. She barely managed to keep standing by the water's edge as she watched him disappear around a tree trunk. He was gone, and Arabella could no longer hear even his footsteps, for the rain drowned it out. He hates me, she whispered. Her breath caught in her throat and she held a hand to her mouth, trying to stop those tears before they could fall, though they came anyway. They leaked out of her eyes and passed her hand, drawing hurried paths across her skin. This is why I could not tell him what was wrong when he asked me to do so at lunch. This was the very reaction I feared. She stuffed the letters she'd gathered from the tree into the pocket of her cloak and crept out from behind the trees, following the path Lord Wareham had taken. As she stepped out from the copse, she caught sight of him by the bridge. He was pulling himself into the saddle of the horse. He coughed once. The sight of it had her hands tightening into fists at her side. Yet he didn't look toward her, though the jerks of his head suggested he had realised she was there. He does not need me any more. Turning the horse so that his back was to her, he rode away down the road. He didn't trot, but made the horse gallop fast as if he could not get away from her quickly enough. Sods of mud flew up behind him and soon merged with the rain to form wet clumps on the earth. Slowly Arabella climbed out from her place at the river and found the road. She stared after where Lord Wareham had gone for some time. For one mad minute she considered going after him. Perhaps if she could talk to him again she could make him see that she was no witch in any sense of the word that she had not betrayed him, that she cared for him more than anyone. I love him. The simple thought had her tears coming harder, for she knew the truth. It would never be possible for Lord Wareham to ever look at her as she did him. Even as wild an idea as it was before, now that he believed she had betrayed his friendship, the chance was an impossible one. Lifting the cloak around her head to hide her crying features, Arabella turned and walked the other way down the road. She considered going to the Fitzroy estate and calling on Betchy. It would be a chance to talk about all that had happened, to get another's opinion on the matter. When her feet found the gate to the estate, though, she paused and was unable to go inside. The tears came too strongly, and she soon realised that she had no wish to talk to anyone. The only person she wished to talk to at all had just turned his back on her, and galloped away on a horse as fast as possible. Leaving the Fitzroy estate behind, Arabella walked home. It was a long journey, and with the rain coming down so hard, she frequently ended up walking through flash floods. The water reached her knees and made her gown sodden. She pushed on through it all, with the rain only beginning to slow once she reached her father's estate. Walking up the drive, she was aware of activity inside. Where her father was usually sat alone at his desk working on his finances, she saw movement beyond the windows. It was as if her father was pacing, restless, uncertain what to do. 
Arabella wondered if he'd lost even more money. The prospect of it had her reaching for the letters in the pocket of her cloak, realising what other danger had befallen her and her father now. Lord Wareham would not pay her to be a healer again. Without that income, and with only a little savings to get them by, Arabella could be unable to afford food within a matter of weeks. Chapter 19 Arabella What is this? Arabella froze in the doorway of the sitting room. Water was running off her gown and cloak, dripping onto the wooden floorboards and creating a puddle, though she made no effort to clean it up and her father didn't appear to notice. Harold was waving a thick wad of paper in the air between them, marching toward her. What is this, Arabella? he asked again, waving it so close to her face that she could see what it was at last. I didn't know you busied yourself with reading scandal sheets, she said, her voice surprisingly firm. She'd had enough of arguing. She already felt as if her heart had been cleaved in two, so she had no qualms about talking sternly to her father. This witch. Harold opened the scandal sheet, holding up the article toward her. This is you, isn't it? What makes you say? Arabella, you have talked about your potions for years. Botany, she corrected him quickly. I make tonics. The words seemed to roll right off her father. He folded up the scandal sheet and pressed it close to his chest. I am no witch, and I do not make potions. I knew it had to be you the moment I read it. He was frantic, contrasting her stillness strongly. You were always talking with Freya. Franny. She corrected him again, though he went on as if she hadn't said anything. She despised the fact he couldn't even remember their cook's name. About all this stuff. These things you purport to be medicine. He was derisive as he marched away from her and tossed the scandal sheet on his writing bureau. I knew you sold them once, but the last we spoke of it, you said you were not going to sell them again. What else was I supposed to do, hmm? She tilted her head sharply toward him. You bring in no money, father. What little we have you fritter away on your investments that never go anywhere. It was the boldest thing she had said to him in many years. He stood straight, showing the extent of his height above her. Arabella backed up, reaching for the door frame. At least I was bringing in some money, something that we could use to buy food and eat. There was nothing wrong in that, she insisted. You and I were once respected in this town. Do you have any idea what a humiliation this is? He flickered his fingers down at the scandal sheet, clearly so ashamed of it that he didn't want to pick it up again. If anyone knew your name... If they realised that they spoke of my daughter. He paused, so horrified that he tipped back into his chair, with the wood creaking that loudly beneath him. It was a wonder to Arabella it didn't snap beneath him. They would run us out of town with their gossip. I've had enough of this. Arabella strode further into the room. She'd been belittled enough that day and she wouldn't stand for it any more. Do you honestly not see why I did it? she asked madly, motioning both hands toward him. I was doing it for you. He paused, lifting his face out of his cupped hands. In that moment, his face looked older than it had before. The lines were more haggard, and the eyes were deep set with shadows. It was all for you, she continued on, her voice full of vigour. I couldn't watch you starve yourself, refuse to eat. All for what? What good does that serve? Arabella. Please let me finish, she begged. She fully expected her father to speak over her again, but to her surprise he did not. He sat rigidly in the chair, waiting for her to go on. I am no witch, not in any manner of the word. What I have done these last few months has been to make tonics and healing medicines, that is all. Harold said nothing. His face was impassive, as if a numbness had set over him. Sensing an opportunity, Arabella darted out of the room. She took her medicine bag from where it was leaning against the front door and returned to her father. 
Tipping the leather bag up, she knocked the contents all over his bureau. She could imagine a day where her father would have chided her for such an action. He would have complained his work was being marred, and she risked damaging his letters with whatever concoctions were in these vials. But he said nothing. This. See it? She held up a large glass bottle, wrapped up in cotton. This is a tincture. I give it to old Mrs. Warrington, who lives in the village. It helps her with her sore eyes. She pushed it into her father's hands. See these? She took a solution of lavender oil and chamomile and pressed that into her father's hands too. I give this to our butler, the one you dismissed. He struggles to sleep, and this helps him. She reached lastly for the vials of herbs she always gave Lord Wareham. The thought of him had that pain spreading in her chest once again. This. I give it to a man who struggles with his breathing. His lungs suffer inflammation. He can have attacks of wheezing and breathlessness. These help him to breathe clearly. Her father held on to all the vials in danger of dropping them as he fumbled with them. He looked at them all, dumbstruck. I help people, she said firmly. I do something that's good. There is nothing wrong with trying to help others through pain, is there? No, there isn't. Harold spoke eventually, his voice quiet indeed. Slowly he placed the vials onto the table. They chinked and thudded together before falling still. Yet none of that explains what is spoken of in these scandal sheets. What do they mean when they talk of love potions? Love potions do not exist. Arabella lost the fire of her argument. Now her father was calm, staring at her openly and waiting for an explanation, she slowly reached for a nearby chair and drew it to his side. Sitting down heavily, she leaned forward. Herbs can help balance what is wrong with the body, but they cannot hold power over a man's heart. Love potions do not exist, and even if they did, I would not make them. What I have offered to those ladies, who are low in their self-esteem and confidence, amounts to nothing more than a few tonics that help them smile and look confidently in the mirror. Yet people talk, her father said gravely. They have talked. Exactly, father, they have. It is malicious gossip. She emphasised the words, feeling the truth of the matter sitting heavy in her heart. Miss Withers is the cause of this. I am so sorry, father. I never meant to bring this on us, nor these awful articles. She gestured to the scandal sheet he'd been reading that was still on the writing bureau beside them. It is merely the cruelty of another spreading rumours. What I did, I hope you will see, I did it for us. Ah, Arabella. Harold reached forward abruptly and took her hand. He rested it between his two palms and patted it, with a sorry expression on his face. You never should have had such a cross to bear. It is a father's task to provide for a daughter. You shouldn't have had to think of the money. It is what it is, we must move on. No, let me make my apology, for it has been a long time coming. Harold hung his head forward. The air fell quiet between them, disturbed only by her father's heavy breathing. I've not been the father I should have been, not the carer and provider. For that, I will always be sorry. When he lifted his head and revealed a wetness in his eyes, Arabella leaned forward closer to him. Please do not cry, she pleaded. Not everyone finds life easy. We know that. We are simply a family that have struggled. Yet we shouldn't have. I'm so sorry. Harold held tighter to her hand and bent his head forward again. You never should have had to feel like you should work especially such work that people can take advantage of, spread gossip of, in such hideous articles. He cast a weary glance at the scandal sheet beside them. It sat there like a bottle of poison in the room, not doing any harm at this moment, but having the potential to cause so much more pain. 
I understand why you sold your tonics, and I'm sorry for being angry too. Arabella felt her spine capitulate. It crumpled and she leaned forward, matching her father's slumped position. As she leaned toward him, he opened his arms and they fell into one another, embracing tightly. There, in the safety of her father's arms, all her fears and anger overwhelmed her. Despite the fact her clothes were drenched, Harold never complained that she was getting him wet. He just held on to her and patted her head, stroking her hair as the tears began. What will become of us now? These tears, he said softly. Is it all because of this? She didn't need to raise her head to know he was gesturing to the scandal sheet. Clinging to her father all the more, she buried her head in his shoulder, wanting to hide from the world. There is more to it, she whispered. I have lost a friendship today because of that scandal sheet. Whose friendship? Harold's voice grew deep. Someone that I was helping. Arabella swallowed around the lump in her through, though it did little to quell her tears. She had no wish to reveal to her father just who she had been treating. Harold had been angry enough as it was when he first learned that she had been selling her tonics and medicines. Out of fear of them returning to their argument, she couldn't bring herself to tell him she had been treating the Marquis of Wareham. What would my father say if he realised I felt something more for Lord Wareham? Would he call me a fool for ever deigning to raise my eyes to a man as far above me in stature as the Marquis of Wareham? He's had trouble with his breathing, and I helped him through it, Arabella explained as she lifted her head off her father's shoulder at last. We became friend with time. I believed us to be. When he realised that the scandal sheet was talking of me, he flew into a rage. I've never seen him like that. When fresh tears came, her father leaned forward and dried her tears with his handkerchief. Arabella felt like a child again. She couldn't remember the last time her father had dried her tears in such a way. She had one memory of it, though, when she was very young. It was the day her mother had died. Her father had sat with her for hours that day as they both cried, and he had wiped away her tears in much the same way. Does he believe the article? Harold asked. Will he tell people that he knows they talk of you? No. He doesn't have maliciousness in him. Whether he believes it or not. She broke off as her breath hitched. I don't think he knew what to believe, but the chance it could be true made him furious. He thought I had helped a woman to use such love potions against him. I told him I would never do such a thing, but he was too shocked to hear me out. He was furious. He said such things. Her breath hitched again. Trust me, we all say things in our shock and anger that we do not mean, Harold said calmly and gave her his handkerchief so she could dry the rest of her tears. Maybe your friend just needs time to calm down and understand what he really believes. You may not have lost your friend yet. I am not so sure. Yet the chance Lord Wareham might forgive her for keeping this secret was a possibility her heart leapt at. It began to thump hard in her chest. Any true friend would understand why you did what you did, especially when they knew the whole situation, Harold said softly and reached forward, pushing away one of the locks of her hair that had come loose. It was damp and stuck to her skin. Go to see him again and ask for forgiveness. I cannot stand to see you cry like this, love. I really can't. His kindness made her weak. For so long she had wondered where this version of her father was that she found herself leaning toward him, needing another one of those embraces. Harold didn't hesitate. He embraced her tightly, his arms coming up around her. They sat there for some minutes together with her father offering silent comfort. There now. Why don't you bathe and dry yourself off? You'll be shivering soon in this cold. I will sort some food for us, 
Harold said and moved to his feet. You will? Arabella murmured in surprise. It's my turn to look after you. He kissed her on the forehead and left the room heading toward the kitchen. Arabella smiled softly through the last of her tears before she reached for the scandal sheet on the writing bureau beside her. Taking it in her hand, she looked over the article. Reading the tone of the article, it was hardly a surprise to her that Lord Wareham had been as shocked as he was. It did not hold back in its belittlement of the said witch, describing her as someone almost inhuman, not worthy of people's sympathy. I will try again, she whispered to herself, and folded up the scandal sheet, pushing it far away across the writing bureau. Come tomorrow, I will visit Lord Wareham, and I pray he will let me in to see him. Chapter 20 Arabella I'm sorry, Miss Spencer, but Lord Wareham says he does not wish for visitors at this time. The butler shook his head and tried to close the door on her. The words made her hands quiver around the leather bag in her grasp. He is still angry then. Did you say it was me coming to call? Arabella asked, stepping up onto the front stoop toward the door. I did. He was vehement in his answer, Miss Spencer. My apologies. Good day to you. The butler bowed his head in acknowledgement of her and then closed the door. The sound was loud, echoing in Arabella's ears. Unsure what to say or do, she just stood there on the stone step, staring at the wooden door. How am I to make amends to Lord Wareham if he will not even see me? Slowly she backed down the steps, though her eyes continued to search the windows in case Lord Wareham made an appearance. All night she had laid awake, imagining and rehearsing what she would say today when she saw Lord Wareham. The little sleep she'd had gave her no peace and she'd woken in the early hours of the morning to go for a walk before her footsteps led her here, back to Lord Wareham's house. Please, my lord, she whispered, as if he could somehow hear her in that house and would come running to see her. Backing up along the driveway, she continued to search the windows, but there was no sign of him there. The sound of a carriage behind her had Arabella stumbling to the side. The carriage was a fine one and came to a sudden halt with the horses snorting in greeting to Arabella, who was standing just a few short steps away. Clara, isn't that her? Miss Spencer. The Duchess's voice from inside the carriage made Arabella hurry back, tempted to flee. Miss Spencer. Too late, Arabella was forced to stand still as the carriage door opened and the Duchess stepped down. She was followed by Lady Clara, who stared at Arabella with parted lips, plainly shocked to see her there. Miss Spencer, I must speak to you. The Duchess scurried forward, moving quickly on the balls of her feet as she parted from the carriage. She was in such a rush that she half fell out of the carriage in her movement. When she reached Arabella's side, the Duchess took her hand. Heavens, Arabella whispered, hurrying to curtsy. Forgive me, I have wished to speak to you ever since my son told me the truth of your visits last night. The Duchess' words made Arabella feel small. She longed for the gravel driveway to part beneath her, revealing a hole she could disappear into. He told his family. Now they will all think me a witch. Despite Arabella's fear, the Duchess continued to smile widely, confusing her. He told you, Arabella whispered breathlessly. Well, he told me, though he hasn't yet managed the courage to share the news with his father, that you are his healer. The Duchess chuckled and rolled her eyes. Between you and I, I believe my son may have had a tipple too many last night. He ended up with a loose tongue and told me how Clara introduced you to my son as someone who could help him. Oh, yes, yes, that's right, Arabella said, looking between the Duchess and Lady Clara who was approaching them. It struck Arabella at once that the Duchess had no idea about the fact she was the believed witch in town. He didn't tell her. Lord Wareham kept that secret to himself. Thank God. I'm so sorry. I haven't yet released your hand, but I had to thank you. 
the Duchess dropped her hand at last. Since I have come back from my travels, I have seen firsthand how much Daniel has improved. Every day he does his exercises, and he breathes the herbs. He manages wonderfully. She looked tearful and blinked those tears away. Mother, Lady Clara said, approaching her, you'll make poor Miss Spencer feel awkward. Oh, tush! She's a woman of the world. She knows what life and death is, sickness and health. She knows how such thoughts have the power to strangle a heart. The Duchess dabbed a handkerchief to her eyes before turning to face Arabella again. I do indeed, Your Grace. Arabella smiled sadly. It was my pleasure to help your son. More so than I can possibly say. She glanced at the house where the door remained firmly closed. I'm only sorry that help has come to an end. Aren't you sweet? The Duchess continued to smile at Arabella, never once looking away. You have been to see him this morning? I am afraid not. Arabella tore her gaze from the house. I do not believe your son wishes for visitors this morning. She caught sight of Lady Clara frowning at the news. She does not yet know either. Her brother has kept everything he has learned to himself. Arabella felt a strong desire to barge her way in through the door of the house. Maybe if she could just see Lord Wareham again, she would find the words to persuade him that she was no monster, no demon, no familiar of the devil. I am the woman he always believed me to be. Well, perhaps he is tired. He was up rather late. The Duchess brushed off the words, thinking nothing of her son not wishing for Arabella's visit. I'm so glad I have the opportunity to thank you for everything that you have done. Maybe in time my son will tell his father. Father would not like it, Mother, you know that, Lady Clara said at her side. Prejudices can be cast aside when they are faced with evidence. The Duchess dismissed the idea and continued on hurriedly. It is because of you, Miss Spencer, that we can look to my son's future. We need not worry about his health now. We can look forward. I'm sure he has a wonderful future ahead, Arabella said softly. He has a good heart. The words made both the Duchess and Lady Clara pause. Lady Clara looked at her with a small smile playing at her features, and the Duchess's eyes widened a little. Pray, do not look at me like that any more. She feared that somehow, with their intense examining gazes, they would be able to discover just how much she was devoted to Lord Wareham. I love him. Her breath hitched, but she managed to stop any tears before they came. His father and I were talking just this morning about what his future could be. We have often talked of seeing him married, the Duchess went on, clearly not having noticed Arabella's moment of fighting tears. Married, Arabella repeated, her voice quiet. Yes, just so. The Duchess beamed. Then I'll have two fortunate children happily married. She looped her arm with her daughter, even as Lady Clara was whispering to her. Mother. Maybe this is not the time. Nonsense. Miss Spencer is Daniel's friend as well as his healer. You have assured me of that this morning. The Duchess waved a hand at her daughter, quieting her. She will be delighted to hear of our plans. I do not doubt it. I doubt it, Lady Clara murmured and offered an apologetic look. Does she know how I feel? Arabella shifted her weight between her feet awkwardly remembering all that Lady Clara had said the first day Arabella had come to see Lord Wareham, about there being something of a spark between them. Miss Withers is coming to visit us tomorrow evening, along with her family, the Duchess said to Arabella. She is a fine young woman in town. Is she? Arabella held her tongue, refusing to say all that she knew of the lady. We don't doubt she could make a fine duchess some day. The way the duchess spoke, it was as if the marriage was already arranged. Arabella's lips parted in shock. Is your son betrothed, your grace? She managed to murmur. The formalities aren't yet in place, but I don't doubt it will not be long now. 
Soon enough we'll be sitting in the pews, seeing Daniel marry, won't we, dear? She appealed to Lady Clara at her side, but her daughter wasn't paying attention. Lady Clara was simply staring at Arabella. It is my mother's and father's wishes, Lady Clara said in a rush to Arabella. What of Lord Wareham? Arabella asked. I think there is a great bond between them already, the Duchess said before Lady Clara could reply. On our last visit to their house, they talked for a long time in the window seat together, sat whispering together like a courting couple they were. The Duchess giggled with the words. Arabella felt crippled. Despite everything that she and Lord Wareham had discussed about Miss Withers, it seemed his objections did not stretch very far. He was irate with Arabella for selling the tonics. But apparently that anger didn't go as far as Miss Withers, who was actually the one who wished to ensnare him in an attachment. If you would excuse me, Arabella hurried to curtsy. I must return home. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. The Duchess followed her a step down the drive. Are you sure you won't stay for tea? I'm sure Daniel would be happy to see you after all. I do not think he would be, Your Grace, Arabella said, the words escaping her in haste. Good day. She bobbed a curtsy and backed up. Well, that's a shame. Another time, Miss Spencer. The Duchess was walking after her, but Lady Clara took her mother's arm and held her back. Lady Clara offered such a sad and weary smile that it broke Arabella's heart all the more. She knows. She can see why I am so upset. Arabella had to turn her head away as she walked quickly back down the drive. She wished the heavens would open and the same rain that had come the day before would come again today. But it didn't. At least then the raindrops would mix with the tears on her cheeks and hide them from the view of any passers-by. Yet the clouds remained firmly absent and the blue sky above taunted her. The moment Arabella turned behind the cover of some trees, she ran, needing to feel as far away from the Duke of Gordon's house as fast as possible. She sprinted, tucking the bag firmly under her arm. With each step she took, the tears came faster and heavier. He is to marry. He is to marry Miss Withers. After everything he has said, all that he accused Miss Withers of, he will marry her anyway. When she was far enough away from the house, her footsteps failed her. Not wanting to be seen by anyone walking down the track road, she hurried between the trees of the forest. Her shoes repeatedly became trapped in tree roots, but she pulled them back out again and walked on, putting distance between her and the road. Eventually she could go no further. Capitulating against the nearest oak tree trunk, she flattened her palms to the bark and dropped her bag to the ground beside her. He's to marry. The mere words said aloud broke her heart even more than she had thought possible. With a heavy realisation, she knew she wasn't just fascinated by Lord Wareham. It was no casual fancy or admiration she held for him, but a deep devotion, a love that she could not speak of. I'm such a fool, she whispered. Closing her eyes, she blocked out the view of the tree before her and let her mind wander. In her mind's eye, she could see Lord Wareham standing at the altar of a church. There was a woman walking toward him wearing a beautiful ivory gown. But when she reached Lord Wareham's side and he turned to take her hand, it was the face of Miss Withers that awaited him. Arabella saw herself at the door of the church, staring at the two of them, tearful, but unable to walk into the church. She would not be invited and would not be considered a guest. Lord Wareham turned to glance at her as the ceremony began, but he didn't smile, not once. There wasn't even a flicker to his lips. He will marry Miss Withers now. Arabella pushed off from the tree and headed home. Chapter 21 Daniel. Why do I even bother? Daniel pushed the steam bowl away and glared at the glass vials beside him on the table. Unsure what to think of everything that Arabella had given him, he glowered at the vials. 
Was it possible there was something else in these vials beside herbs? Had Arabella laced them with something else? They call her a witch. Even as Daniel thought the words, he was sickened to his gut. He didn't like to think of Arabella with such cruel words, and though he'd had chance to calm down from his shock, somewhere inside of him there was a voice that acknowledged the idea was mad. Yet there was another voice, and this voice was winning at this time. It would explain things, wouldn't it? Daniel whispered to himself, standing and moving away from the steam bowl. He reached for the waistcoat his valet had left on the bed, along with a cravat, and began to dress for the day. It would explain why I care for her the way I do. He'd believed it was natural, the affection he had for Arabella, but now that angry voice inside him was arguing it wasn't. It was perfectly possible that what was written in the scandal sheet pertained to some truth. It was possible that Arabella had used her potions on him. After all, those feelings had been strong and sudden. Was it natural to have a need for someone in this way? It seemed illogical. Why else can I not stop thinking of her? Daniel, a small voice called from the door. It was followed by a light tap. Daniel, are you still in there? Yes, Daniel turned to face the door as he tied his cravat. You can come in, Clara. She pushed open the door and stepped inside. She looked strangely calm, but her shoulders were slumped and her customary smile was missing from her lips. Did you not use your herbs? Clara asked as she pointed toward the bowl of hot water and the closed vials of herbs beside it. No, I don't think I'll be using them any more. Daniel shook his head, having no intention of continuing with the treatments Arabella had given him. For all he knew, there was other stuff inside those vials. Clara hurried to close the door behind her and stepped forward. Why is that? Daniel, I just met Miss Spencer in the driveway, and she said you have refused to see her. What is happening? Clara held her arms out wide, begging for an explanation. Do not tell me you believe what is in that scandal sheet. Daniel froze, his eyes narrowing on Clara. Wait, he murmured. You knew. The sudden realisation left him breathless. He reached for the chair in front of him and gripped the backrest, trying to breathe deeply. Clara, that scandal sheet says nothing about who the believed witch is. So, tell me this. Why bring it up in a conversation about Miss Spencer? Clara parted her lips and closed them again. She avoided his gaze and looked down at the steam bowl. God's blood, Clara. Not so loud, Clara pleaded, stepping forward. You knew. Daniel strode away from the chair, pointing an accusing finger at Clara. I only discovered Miss Spencer's true identity last night when I found where she exchanged her letters with her customers. Daniel, please. You knew she was a witch? Daniel said, shaking his head back and forth. She is not a witch. Clara matched his strong tone and stood tall. Good Lord, what has happened to you? Have you forgotten the good nature of the woman who has visited for you weeks now, months even, trying to help you? That woman is no witch. Daniel said nothing. His breathing heaved as he moved his hands to his hips. I knew Miss Spencer sold things you might not have approved of, let us say that, Clara said quietly. How did you know that? Daniel asked darkly, his voice quiet yet seething with rage. That does not matter. Clara waved a hand in the air. What I do know is that what she sells does not amount to love potions. What of the belladonna that you knew of, hmm? Daniel urged her on, waving a hand toward his sister impatiently. That's no potion, it's a beauty thing. How is that any different to a lady using rouge? She waved a hand at her own eyes. What of those cupcakes? What was laced in them? Daniel backed up from his sister, remembering the way she had knocked it out of his hand. Nothing. They are simply designed to impress a gentleman, Clara said hurriedly, following him across the room. Then why knock it out of my hand so aggressively when Miss Withers tried to give me one? because I did not like to think of someone trying to impress you in such a way. 
Clara followed him as he moved around the nearest chair, trying to put it between him and his sister. I wanted you to care for someone of your own choosing. Ah, Daniel broke off. He stood tall, towering over his sister, and that silence had her shifting between her feet, uncomfortable. You suggested I should marry, did you not, Clara? I remember it well. Then lo and behold, you brought Arabella here. You call her Arabella, Clara said softly. Daniel, what is so wrong with you caring for her? I never said I did, Daniel snapped and moved around his sister, heading toward the table that bore the steaming bowl of water and the vials of herbs. You didn't need to say you did. It's plain as day for anyone who cares to watch you together. You dance around one another, Clara said, following him to the table. Did you encourage her? Daniel asked, finding rage burning inside his gut. Did you say how happy you were for her to put something in these vials, just to persuade me to see her in a new light? He snatched up the vials and waved them in the air. Daniel, please, she pleaded with him. You are so angry. I do not think you are really listening to me. How can I? He cut her off. When I know that anything I might have felt for Arabella was a lie. His words were firm. And you encouraged it, Clara. You encouraged whatever she put in these bottles. He tossed the vials he had in his hands into the fireplace. Clara jumped back when the glass smashed. The herbs took light, making what had been a slow burning fire into something that now raged. Marching across the room, Daniel sought out more things of Arabella's things. He found a handkerchief laced with her herbs and threw that on the fire too, watching as the cloth turned black and curled up into ash. Clara's soft cries disturbed him as she stood by the fire, shaking her head. I cannot talk to you, she whispered, and fled the room going so quickly that the door slammed shut behind her. The moment she was gone, the blind rage that had overtaken him began to dissipate. Slowly, Daniel sat in an armchair by the fire, though he could not sit back. He stared into the flames of the fire, trying to breathe clearly. I don't know what to believe anymore. He wasn't sure how long he sat there staring at the fire, but eventually he was disturbed. His mother came to check on him, wanting to know how he was feeling today. He didn't have the heart to tell her that there was a tightness across his chest so he kept that secret to himself. Daniel, dear, I long to see you smile again. Marianne moved to his side and patted his cheek. Would you tell me what has upset you? Two days ago, something changed with you. The happy smiles you always wore. They're gone. She was quiet as she took the seat beside him. I'm fine, mother, he lied. Perhaps I'm just in need of a distraction. The latter part was true, for he would have been glad to think of anything other than Arabella and how much he missed her. Why do I miss her? Surely that is an effect of something she put in these herbs. Well, I have a distraction for you. Marianne sat forward with an excited countenance and lips that kept quivering into a smile. We have invited the Withers to come to the house for dinner. Say you'll be there, dear. Miss Withers. Daniel toyed with the name, thinking of what the woman had done. I couldn't marry a woman who would attempt such manipulation of me, surely not. She is a fine woman. A courtship is not such a mad idea, is it? Marianne said leadingly, still leaning toward Daniel. He was desperate to dismiss the idea at once, but the words never fell from his lips. Clearly he was not a man who would generate much feeling from women. He'd seen time and time again when he was on the continent how ladies would give him a wide berth, believing him too sickly. Arabella had given him attention because he gave her money, and she probably thought by giving him love potions that he would someday marry her and make her a marchioness. Miss Withers' aim was probably much the same, all for the money. At least she would be a distraction. Miss Withers seems to care about you, dear. 
Marianne's words made Daniel's spine slump as he rested back in the chair. Does she? He was not so convinced, but the chance that maybe Miss Withers could have a genuine affection for him tempted him. Well, maybe we could consider a courtship then. Marianne clasped her hands together in delight. Daniel, please, may I talk to you? Clara's voice tore Daniel's gaze away from his after-dinner brandy. He'd been happily staring into it with Horatio at his side. At the other end of the table, his father and Mr Withers sat together, intently talking about business. Daniel had mistakenly thought the ladies had retired to the other room, but it seemed Clara had hung back. Now, sister, Daniel said with raised eyebrows. She must have heard the derision in his tone, for she chewed her lips and looked to her husband for help. Hear her out, Daniel. For God's sake, Horatio said tiredly. I can't stand seeing the two of you argue. It's hardly like any other argument, Daniel said quietly. He could guess well enough that Clara had told Horatio what they had argued about, and Horatio didn't exactly do anything to do deny such a presumption. He merely shrugged. Talk to her all the same. He gestured to Clara, who stood between them. Daniel glanced at the head of the table. Mr Withers was smoking a pipe and encouraging Gregory to join him. The smoke that hovered in the room was making that tight feeling across Daniel's chest grow worse. Perhaps a little break from this room would be good. Nodding, he moved to his feet and followed Clara out of the dining room. Rather than following the ladies into the parlour, they retreated to a small room off the side, filled with fine cabinets of silver and porcelain. What is it, Clara? Daniel paused in the middle of the room. Clara lit two candles and rested them on a windowsill nearby. The orange light offered a dim glow between them in the darkness. I wanted to speak to you openly. She cast what appeared to be a resentful glare toward the parlour door, beyond which their mother sat with Mrs Withers and Miss Withers. About the lady you are now, suggesting you caught. What a sudden change of heart you've had. Daniel didn't answer. He folded his arms and stood very still. Daniel, courtship is not something to be taken lightly. She moved toward him. Least of all, do I understand why you would now suggest courting a woman who you, for some mad reason, believed wished to use love potions on you? She never managed it, did she? Daniel reminded his sister. You knocked the cupcake out of my hand. Oh, for the last time, there is no such thing as a love potion. Then if that's the case, what is wrong with courting Miss Withers? Daniel asked tartly gesturing to the closed door. For starters, how about the fact that you do not care for the woman? Clara asked in a hissing whisper, clearly working hard to keep her voice quiet. Or how about the fact that you're plainly in love with another woman altogether? Hearing the words made Daniel jolt. He didn't deny it, he just stared at his sister. I never said anything about love. Nothing. I see you do not deny it. Clara said, raising a hand and pointing at him. I do not need to deny it. The idea is absurd. Why is it? Clara asked wildly. Shh! He reminded her to be quiet, glancing at the closed door. For starters, any affection I might have had for Arabella may have been generated by her potions. I am really beginning to question how smart you are if you cling to this tale of her being a witch. Clara laughed in disbelief and scorn, shaking her head. Maybe I am going mad, Daniel murmured, feeling a little light-headed. Was it the brandy? He rubbed his chest, for that tightness was back again. I think your fear that Arabella might not have returned your affection is what is making you so ready to believe the nonsense you are now spewing. Clara waved a hand at him coldly. I never said that. Yet I believe it to be true. Clara breathed deeply, then stepped toward him, 
clasping her hands together in an imploring stance. Daniel, please. Courtship should not be entered into lightly, and you can still avoid entering one with Miss Withers. I do not believe you love her. Well, not everyone is so fortunate to marry for love, are they? Daniel said to his sister. Perhaps not, but when I did marry for love, that happiness is all I wish for you. Her voice was quiet. He could feel how genuine she was, and it made the anger shift inside him. He tried to breathe deeply, yet he couldn't quite make his lungs fully expand. He did one of Arabella's breathing exercises, breathing in through his nose and out through his mouth. It helped a little. Daniel, please listen to me. Clara reached out and laid a hand on his arm. Love cannot be stirred by any tonic or potion. It's in one's heart, and if you cared for Arabella, it was because you liked her, not because of anything else. I wish to believe you, Daniel whispered, confessing the truth. Then I can prove it to you, Clara smiled, in more than one way. First of all, may I remind you what your response was to Arabella the first day she came here? Do you not remember the spark between you? The conversation? Those looks. Goodness. Betchy and I could not stop commenting on how palpable that tension was. May I also remind you that by that point, Arabella had not given you anything. Daniel remembered that day. He had certainly been attracted to Arabella, but attraction didn't amount to love. He couldn't be sure if what he felt for Arabella now was natural or not. I don't know what to think any more he whispered to his sister. Clara parted her lips, ready to say something more, but before she could there was a commotion beyond the door of the parlour. One loud protest struck up, followed by a hasty shush, then the butler introduced someone into the room. What's going on? Clara murmured. Daniel shrugged none the wiser and returned to the parlour. He flung the door open and strode inside with Clara at his heels. The commotion hadn't just drawn them but also their father, Horatio, and Mr. Withers. They stepped in from the dining room, continuing to smoke on their pipes. The lit tobacco must have really begun to die down to embers now, for the smoke that hovered in the air was thick and visible, with dark grey plumes hovering over their heads. Daniel breathed deeply, trying to taste clean air, but he couldn't. Why did I ever smoke at all? I believed the doctors when they said it would do me some good. Goodness, well, this is hardly the time for social calls, is it? Miss Withers walked in front of her family and moved to stand by Daniel. He looked toward her, startled by the words. My lord, have you seen who has come to call on your family at such an impolite hour? The pride in her words made Daniel's hand tighten at his side. If he was going to court this woman, then he would certainly have to get used to hearing such things and looking at the way she would tilt her chin high as if she was the finest woman in the room. Yes, as pleased as I am to see you, Marianne began, to do what do we owe the visit at this hour? Daniel was too busy glaring at Miss Withers, he didn't look to see who their visitor was. Can I court this woman? Truly. She must have mistaken his glare for a look of interest, for she attempted a smile that was sickly sweet. He moved a small step away from her. Who is our visitor? Gregory asked, striding further into the room. It cast the smoke closer in Daniel's direction, who waved a hand in the air, trying to dispel it away from his mouth. Oh, Gregory, dear, Marianne said, moving to his side. May I introduce Daniel's friend? This is Miss Spencer. Daniel jerked his head toward the doorway of the parlour and stepped forward. Walking around his mother's shoulder, his eyes at last found her. Arabella was standing in the doorway with her medicinal bag in her hand. It had clearly been raining, and the loose tendrils of her auburn hair were stuck to her cheeks. Her eyes found his. Then she looked away at Gregory and Marianne. What on earth is she doing here? Chapter 22 Arabella I know what we must do. 
Harold's words had Arabella stilling. He had come to eat lunch with her in the kitchen today, something he had not done before. Since their argument and their embrace, she'd noticed her father was spending more time near her in the house. He seemed to repeatedly seek her out and even offered to cook food more than once, though he had a habit of burning stews for he did not really know how to cook. You do, Arabella said slowly. She'd been in a world of her own, lost in thought and caught somewhere between thinking of what she and her father were going to do about money and Lord Wareham. I long to see him. We cannot stay here, not any more. The moment the words were out of Harold's mouth, Arabella sighed with relief. For so long she had hoped that he would come to this realisation on his own. I can't afford the upkeep. Selling our house will give us a little money. We'll be able to move somewhere new, buy a new smaller house and begin again. I know it will be a great change, but what do you think? Arabella paused with her stew, her spoon hovering in the air for a second. There was much she would miss about this place. She loved the town, the village, walking through the forest and seeing the beauties of the seaside. But most of all, she would miss the people. She would miss Betchy and Lord Wareham. There is nothing to keep us here, is there? she said in realisation. She and Lord Wareham were separated forever now, and Betchy had a life of her own with her child on the way. They could change their friendship to one of letters and occasional visits. I think it a good thing, father. It is time we move on. Good. I'm glad you agree. Harold reached across the table and laid a hand over her wrist in comfort. I promise this time things will be better, Arabella. They will. I'm done with my investments. Harold shook his head. I have had an offer of a position as a clerk at a merchant's office. I used to work with this merchant. He's a good man. I believe he's taken pity on our plight. He offered a smile. It won't pay much, but it will pay something, which is what we need, isn't it? Arabella turned her hand over and clasped her father's fingers. I think it a wise thing indeed, father. Very wise. It was overwhelming, this relief that Harold had finally let go of his foolish hopes. So, we are to move on. Where are we to go? My cousin in Lyme Regis has said we can stay with them for a while. The houses are cheap that way and it is near where my new position will be. It could suit us well. Harold took back his hand and returned to his food. What do you say? Maybe we could get a house right on the coast. It sounds wonderful, father. When do we leave? If you can be ready tomorrow morning, we'll leave then, Harold said quietly. My cousin has said we can go whenever. It would allow me to open the doors here to buy as quickly. Would you be happy with that? Arabella swallowed uncomfortably. It was not much time, but at least it gave her a little time to sort things out. Yes, I'm happy with that, she said woodenly. As her father returned to his stew, she abandoned her food and stared into the bowl. She put together some quick plans. That afternoon, she would visit all the customers she still had. She would leave them with enough tonics to see them through for a little while, even if they couldn't pay her the full amount for her services. It was important she gave them what they needed. In the evening, she would go to see Betchy and tell her the news. I wonder if I'll be able to see Lord Wareham too. She thought it a mad idea, a wild one. After all, he would probably just turn her away again, refusing to see her. I can't leave without giving him the herbs he needs. I must go, even if it is a painful thing to consider. She resolved after calling on Betchy she would visit the Duke's house. Even if they would not let her inside, then she would leave what Lord Wareham would need on the front door. I must help him even if he cannot stand the sight of me anymore.
Arabella was beginning to think her decision to come was a mistake. As she stood in the doorway to the parlour, the whole party was staring at her in surprise. The Withers family started asking for clarification as to who she was, something the Duke was failing to answer. Daniel, this is a friend of yours. He appealed to Daniel for an explanation. Mr Fitzroy stepped forward and moved to the Duke's side, waving a hand as if attempting to calm him. Once. The cold word had her stomach dropping. She felt as if she had been struck by a stone and looked toward him. His handsome looks were narrowed now but not turned on her. He seemed to be looking anywhere else in the room but at her. Oh, Daniel, for goodness sake, the Duchess began and took a step forward. Just tell your father who she really is. Mother, this is certainly not the time. Lord Wareham turned away and reached for a table nearby. There was a carafe of brandy resting on a silver tray. He sloshed some of the liquid into a glass and lifted it to his lips. Mr Fitzroy moved to his side and tried to take it away from him, but Lord Wareham persisted with drinking it. How much has he had? Arabella found the thought difficult to shift as she fiddled with the bag in her grasp. Miss Spencer? Lady Clara hurried toward her and curtsied, prompting Arabella to bob an even deeper curtsy. Please forgive my brother's foul temper. I am glad to see you here. She is staying for the evening, is she? Miss Withers said in surprise from across the room. Arabella looked toward Miss Withers, feeling a glare naturally forming. Miss Withers stared back at her with equal animosity. Does she know it is my life she has destroyed with her tales? Perhaps she does, perhaps she suspects. Unsure what to think, Arabella opened the leather bag and pushed it toward Lady Clara. As your brother will not talk to me, may I talk to you, Lady Clara? she asked. Of course, Lady Clara encouraged her on. Would someone introduce me to Miss Spencer properly? The Duke asked restlessly. She has been Daniel's healer, dear. The Duchess's simple words made a silence fall on the room. That silence was deafening in Arabella's mind. She purposefully kept her gaze down as she searched in her bag, not wanting to look anyone in the eye at that moment. I have brought things Lord Wareham may need. Arabella addressed Lady Clara alone. Would you please take them in case they are of use to you? Arabella began to pull out various things and handed them over to Lady Clara. There were fresh vials of herbs she placed on a table nearby, new handkerchiefs and fresh mixes of tea leaves. What is all this? the Duke asked with clear suspicion as he moved to the table. Hovering his face over what sat there, he curled his nose. He lifted up one of the vials to look at it closely. It's just herbs, Mr Fitzroy explained and returned to the Duke's side, trying to encourage him to put the vial down again. How much do you need for this? Lady Clara said, not answering her father but addressing Arabella alone. Nothing. I beg your pardon? Lady Clara nearly dropped one of the glass vials in surprise. I'm not asking for anything for them. Arabella didn't look across the room. She was afraid what Lord Wareham's expression would be now. Perhaps he thinks I do this out of guilt rather than love for him. This is an odd hour to deliver such things, Miss Spencer, the Duchess began carefully coming to stand by her daughter. I apologise for my impertinence, Your Grace. Arabella curtsied once again. I am afraid I am to depart in the morning and knew I had to deliver these whilst I still had the chance. You are leaving, Lady Clara said, her voice pitching high in surprise. Yes! Arabella didn't explain why she was going or where she was going to. There's these, too. She reached into the bag and pulled out a few more things, hurrying to place them in Lady Clara's arms. Goodness, the Duchess said in awe, with her eyes widening. You have gone to great lengths for my son to deliver these things tonight. You cannot hand over so much unpaid, can she, dear? She appealed to her husband, who was still staring back in surprise. Dear, I thought you said you had a doctor. A physician, at least. 
The Duke of Gordon's voice was quiet, but there was a tightness to it that betrayed anger. He turned to face Lord Wareham across the room, clearly holding back that temper. He puffed on a pipe in his grasp, one that made Arabella angry. They smoke around Lord Wareham. It will aggravate his condition. She saw Lord Wareham was pulling at the collar of his cravat, loosening it. He didn't return her look, but took a gulp from his brandy glass. I said I had a healer of a kind, he explained warily and shrugged. You need not fear, father. I'm not using her any more. Why ever not, the Duchess said, her voice a little wild with surprise. You have been healthier than you have been in a long time, recently. I suppose I am not wrong in presuming that is all down to Miss Spencer's doing. Her tonics, her medicines, her potions. Lord Wareham's words across the room felt as if they slid through Arabella's skin and straight into her heart. He despises me, yet I still love him. How is that even possible? I can see I'm unwelcome here. Arabella turned her back on Lord Wareham. She looked at Lady Clara and the Duchess alone. Please keep these. They may be of use to him when he does wish to use them again. You must be paid for this, Miss Spencer, Lady Clara said in emphasis, but still Arabella shook her head. I am to move away from this life. Perhaps if my father is able to hold down his job, then I will have no need to sell my tonics again. The idea made her sad, for she would no longer be helping people. Well, if that is all settled, Miss Withers said, clearing her throat across the room to draw attention to her. Shall we return to our evening? Lord Wareham, surely you will join me in a game of whist. She moved to his side. When Lord Wareham's eyes flitted toward Miss Withers, that look made jealousy burn inside of Arabella's gut. Wait a minute more, please, the Duchess said, waving a hand to quieten Miss Withers. Arabella had to fight back a smile when Miss Withers looked chagrined and hung her head a little forward. Miss Spencer? The Duchess returned her focus to Arabella. You come all this way when it is dark out, when it is clearly raining too, she gestured at Arabella's damp clothes to give medicines for my son. Yet you have no wish to be paid for them. No. Arabella shook her head. I wish to help before I am to leave. That is all. That's all, Lady Clara said with a growing smile. It was a look that was matched by the Duchess. The strength of your friendship for my son Knows no bounds, the Duchess said carefully, stepping toward Arabella. It is an attachment I admire greatly. I, Arabella faltered. Her cheeks felt heated, and she wanted to do nothing more than run from this room. The Duchess could see her love for Lord Wareham, and she was making it apparent in this room where so many people were staring at her. Arabella cast a quick look at Mr. and Mrs. Withers, who stood together, whispering. The Duke continued to puff on his pipe, though he looked repeatedly between Arabella and Lord Wareham. Mr Fitzroy was looking at her with something of an amused smile on his lips. Lastly, Arabella noticed Lord Wareham. He was ignoring the way Miss Withers was pulling on his arm, and he was staring straight back at Arabella. I should take my leave, Arabella said and bobbed a curtsy, desperate to depart at once. Forgive me she whispered quickly and stepped away. Miss Spencer, Lord Wareham called to her. Son, I need an explanation for this. The Duke strode toward his son, waving the pipe in emphasis. It separated the two of them. Any hope Arabella might have felt as the Marquess said her name was now gone. You have been using a local girl as a healer? With no medical training? She's good, father. She knew what she was doing in case you are blind to it, Lady Clara called from where she waved a hand at Arabella, encouraging her to stay. Goodbye, Arabella said again and reached for the door. Wait, Lord Wareham called, stepping around his father. 
Arabella hesitated in the doorway just as the Duke stepped in front of his son again, blocking the path. Daniel, we must talk of this, the Duke said insistently. Not now. At Lord Wareham's protest, he coughed. It was a deep cough, one that was guttural, and took Arabella's attention. Her hand slid off the door handle as she turned to look back at him. His eyes were on his father before a second cough came. Breathe, dear, the Duchess called to him. Lord Wareham couldn't. He bent forward as the coughing racked his body. Son, what is it? The Duke held a hand to his son's shoulder, trying to speak to him. I... Lord Wareham could say nothing. His breathing was so heavy, he began to wheeze. He couldn't control it, and it was quickly spiralling out of control. What is happening? Miss Withers asked, backing away from him and heading toward her parents across the room. What is it? Lady Clara murmured at Arabella's side. Arabella was tongue-tied as she stared at Lord Wareham. He was red in the face, not breathing properly. In fact, he was incapable of catching his breath at all, even as his father took his arms and held on to him, trying to make him breathe. Daniel! His father snapped in desperation. Please, breathe! Yet more coughing and wheezing came again. Arabella felt her heart thud hard in her chest. She stepped back from the door and further into the room. I cannot leave him now. Chapter 23 Arabella Stop smoking! Arabella called and marched across the room. The order seemed to jolt everyone. Mr Withers nearly dropped his pipe, and the Duke looked at the pipe he'd discarded on a table close by, no longer thinking of it. Mr Fitzroy snatched the pipe from Mr Withers' grasp and put it out at once. It is making him worse, please, Your Grace, put it out, she begged off the Duke as she reached his side. The Duke was reluctant to release his son. The moment he did, Lord Wareham fell to his knees on the floor. Daniel! the Duchess called and hurried across the room with Lady Clara at her side. Such panicked conversations struck up in the room, with each person asking the other what to do, Arabella had to ignore them. She thought only of Lord Wareham. Dropping to her knees in front of Lord Wareham, she took his shoulders, urging him to look at her as he wheezed into his hands. Breathe, she said softly. He didn't appear to hear her, though those intense eyes bored straight into her own, in through the nose, out through the mouth. He tried to do it this time, bending forward, lowering his hands from his mouth. The wheezing became greater now, but at least he stopped coughing. Leaping to her feet, Arabella hastened across the room to where she had left the herbs in the vials. Lady Clara, I need some water. She orders the lady around as if she's a servant, Miss Withers muttered to her parents. Arabella cast one angry glare at the woman but didn't argue with her. Lady Clara hardly had any issue with the request. She returned a few seconds later with water. Arabella doused some herbs in a cup of water and carried them toward Lord Wareham. Kneeling down on the floor in front of him, she took his shoulder. My lord, you must look up. At her words, he did nothing. His face turned to the floor as he wheezed. Bending down toward him, she whispered her next words. Please, you must try. I can help. I promise you that. He lifted his head up. As he breathed, his lungs seemed to whine audibly with the movement. Drink, please, she begged him, and passed the water toward him. Small sip, then breathe again. Repeat, my lord. He did as she asked, though at first it didn't seem to do any good at all. What's going on? Mr Withers called from across the room. My son has a condition with his lungs, the Duke explained in a rush, though he didn't bother turning to look at his guests. It was clear the love and devotion he had for his son. He was reaching for Lord Wareham's shoulder, urging him to look up. What do you need, Daniel? Tell me and I will do it. Lord Wareham said nothing, but he looked at Arabella. She reached toward him. Anyone with a casual glance would think it an intimate touch indeed. 
She placed her fingers on his neck and found his pulse. His breathing hitched at that touch and he didn't blink as he stared at her. Pray, do not look at me like that. It makes my own heartbeat erratic. She swallowed past her dry mouth as she counted his pulse. Do you see what she's doing? Mrs Withers said from their place skulking in one of the corners of the room. I see it, Miss Withers said in horror. You'd think they were... What? Mr Fitzroy asked and turned sharply to look at them. What was that sentence, Miss Withers? Nothing. It's too high, Arabella whispered to Lord Wareham as she gently released him. I need to get you to your chamber and rested. Can you manage it? He nodded and tried to stand. Yet the movement had him wheezing even worse than before. The Duke took his son's arm and pulled him to stand. Mr Fitzroy hurried to his other side and helped him. Lady Clara? Arabella turned to face her once again. Please would you arrange for some hot water to be brought up to his chamber, both in a teapot and a steam bowl? Of course, Lady Clara hurried off to follow the request. As the Duke led his son out of the room and through the door, with Mr Fitzroy's assistance, Arabella picked up everything she had deposited on a table nearby. The Duchess was tearful as she went to help Arabella. What is it? she asked Arabella in a quiet voice. It is an attack on his lungs. His body cannot cope with the air in here. Arabella gestured to the smoke hanging in the room. If he's tense and has not been doing his treatments either. He hasn't, the Duchess explained slowly. He stopped doing them. Then it has aggravated his condition. I must go to him. Arabella ran out of the room carrying the bottles. She caught up with Lord Wareham, his father and Mr Fitzroy on the stairs, following them all the way into Lord Wareham's chamber. The Duke laid his son down on the bed. Mr Fitzroy helped Lord Wareham get his boots off, then stood back, appearing as if he awaited instructions. The only movement Lord Wareham offered was the heavy rise and fall of his chest. It came too quickly, far too fast for what was natural. Arabella acted quickly. She flung open the windows to get some fresh air in the room and asked for a fire to be lit to bring some warmth to the air. As the Duke stood back, petrified and leaning against the bedpost with Mr Fitzroy, patting his arm in comfort, Arabella worked around them. Bending down to Lord Wareham as he laid on the bed, she placed a hand to his chest, feeling that fast rise and fall. His eyes looked at her as he wheezed. I can't, he tried to speak. Don't speak, it will make it worse. Can't. Breathe, he whispered, pushing the words through despite her words. Trust me, you will breathe clearly again. Turning her back on the Duke and Mr Fitzroy, she moved her hand to Lord Wareham's and touched his palm for a moment. If you can trust me, my lord, then please do it now. He didn't object, he just stared at her. I will do whatever I can to save him from this. The next few minutes passed in a blur for Arabella. She thought only of making Lord Wareham safe again. She ushered the Duke and Mr Fitzroy out of the room, who hovered in the corridor, refusing to go far. Then she worked around Lord Wareham. A maid was brought in to help Arabella. Together they made Lord Wareham sit up against his pillows. The valet came to help Lord Wareham remove his jacket, but he fumbled with the cravat so much with his palms sweaty that Arabella took over and pushed him out of the way. Unthreading the cravat from his neck, she felt Lord Wareham's eyes on her as she worked. You will be fine, she whispered to him. I promise you, my friend. She meant to say, my lord, but something else came out entirely. Please, trust me. She and the valet helped him pull off the waistcoat, then he laid back against the pillows. She placed a hot steam bowl in front of him, full of so many herbs that she could smell them even as she stood back from Lord Wareham. He breathed in the steam, wheezed, then sat back, 
where she then pressed a fresh tea into his hands. It's orange, he managed to mutter through his wheezing. Turmeric, I believe it will help with the inflammation in your lungs. Please try it. She begged of him, aware her voice was strained in her pleading. He didn't question her but raised the cup to his lips and took a big gulp. For some minutes she worked around him. The valet retreated and the maid stood by the fire, awaiting any more requests. Soon there was nothing much more Arabella could do. She sat on the bed beside Lord Wareham, helping him to hold onto the steam bowl as he breathed. The window had been closed now, so the air was full of the scents of rosemary and thyme. Arabella breathed with him, showing him what to do, in through his nose and out through his mouth. Slowly, his breathing returned to normal. He stopped wheezing and raised his hand to the bowl. He placed it over her palm on the bowl rim. They sat there, merely staring at one another, with not a flicker of a smile between them. The thank you, he managed to stammer. You don't need to thank me. You are recovered, and that is what matters. She took the steam bowl off his lap, and his hand fell away from hers. Placing it on the bedside table, she turned to face him and took his hand again, without hesitation. The maid squeaked across the room, clearly knowing Arabella should not have done it, but she didn't hold back. You need to rest now. Sleep, breathe your herbs, you will be fine. His eyes flickered closed with exhaustion. He gave way to sleep quickly enough, his hand loosening from hers. Slowly Arabella released his fingers. The warmth of his touch was gone as she backed up. Watch over him. Send word to me if he needs anything, she pleaded with the maid who nodded and sat in a chair in the corner of the room. Retreating into the corridor, Arabella found the Duke and Mr Fitzroy. The Duke was pacing, and his son-in-law was trying to calm him. Well, the Duke said, turning sharply toward her with a desperate tone, he's out of danger. Her words seemed to cast a spell over him. He sighed hugely with relief and bent forward, laying his hands on his knees. Thank God for that, the Duke murmured. Thank Miss Spencer for that. Mr Fitzroy smiled at her and nodded. She returned that smile, though her own was sad and only lasted a second. I shall tell the others how he fares. Arabella hastened down the stairs. The Duke and Mr Fitzroy followed her though the Duke asked repeatedly if he could go to see his son. He needs to sleep, Your Grace. He shouldn't be disturbed. Only go in if you can stay quiet. He nodded in understanding, though he wrung his hands together, hardly happy with the outcome. As the three of them walked back into the sitting room, much had changed. The Duchess and Lady Clara were standing by the fire, holding hands and both nervous in their manner, with the Duchess twitching. Their guests were still here. Mr and Mrs Withers were sat on a nearby settee, and their daughter stood beside them, with a permanent frown marring her fair features. Miss Spencer, the Duchess said, moving toward her as she entered. He is out of danger, Arabella assured the Duchess. He must sleep, and come morning. He should return to his exercises. All will be well now. Thank you. Thank you so much. The Duchess took her hand hurriedly, pressing it between her own. Arabella felt uncomfortably under the praise and warmth. I do not know if Lord Wareham even wished for my help. The last words I had from him were censure, yet he clung to my hand. We should leave and return another day, Mr Withers said calmly and stood to his feet. I am most sorry for your son's trouble. Come, he turned to his daughter. You can see your suitor another night. See him? I have no wish to see him. Miss Withers' sudden words made a strange silence descend on the room. The Duchess released Arabella's hand and turned toward Miss Withers with her eyes wide. What did you say? the Duchess murmured. I had no idea Lord Wareham was so sickly, Miss Withers said the word as if it disgusted her. How can she speak so? 
Arabella glared at her with all the hatred she felt at that moment. She made no effort to hide it, with her eyes narrowing in the lady's direction. Father, we talked of Lord Wareham as a strong man. Miss Withers appealed to his father, but was cut off by Lady Clara. He is, Lady Clara said firmly. He just suffers with his lungs. He seems so... She didn't manage the right word, but waved a feeble-looking hand in the air. She wishes to call him weak. Arabella was so horrified she stumbled back, reaching for the door. You wish to call off the courtship? Mr Withers asked his daughter in surprise. I think it best. Miss Withers spoke without hesitation. Arabella stepped forward, finding her footsteps took her around the Duchess to meet Miss Withers with an unyielding gaze. You think him weak? Arabella didn't care she was speaking out of turn, nor that the Withers family were looking at her in shock, most of all Miss Withers, who stared at her as if she had grown two heads. Lord Wareham is not weak. Far from it. He has a strong heart too, and surely that is what matters more than anything. More than any sickness that can plague a man in this world. I beg your pardon? Miss Withers turned completely to face her, with her hands on her hips. You dare to speak to me in such a fashion. What are you to speak so? A low country girl, a healer. She said the words, as if they were an insult. But Arabella felt no contempt from their meaning, for it was what she was. I speak my mind, Arabella said firmly, even if it is something you do not wish to hear, or something that is frowned upon to do so. She breathed deeply thinking of Lord Wareham as he slept upstairs and the way their hands had touched before she left him. Any woman who had Lord Wareham's affection should feel lucky, thrilled. They shouldn't disparage his heart as if it was nothing but autumnal leaves beneath their feet. Her words were as good as a declaration of her own heart. Even as she caught her breath after her outburst, Miss Withers was raising her hand and pointed at her. Have you formed a liking for your employer, Miss Spencer? She asked with derision. Arabella said nothing. Her breath hitched and she backed up. Reaching for her medicinal bag nearby, she snatched it up and left the room as quickly as she could. Miss Spencer? Miss Spencer? It didn't matter how much the Duchess called after her, Arabella didn't stop. Hastening from the house, she ran down the driveway, feeling her tears come as she left Lord Wareham far behind. Miss Withers never deserved him. Daniel! Clara's voice was heard suddenly through the darkness. Daniel woke up with a start, his eyes widening. You were dreaming, she murmured softly, sitting beside him on the bed. Daniel turned his focus to his sister startled to feel so weary. With an effort, he recalled what happened the night before. Lifting a hand, he blocked out the strong sunlight bleeding through the windows and covered his eyes, thinking of what had passed. Arabella's care of him had been everything. He couldn't help fearing he might have died had she not been there. What would have happened if he'd been unable to take a single breath? Arabella, you saved me. You were saying her name. A deeper voice in the room had Daniel lowering the hand from his eyes. Looking up and moving to sit up against his pillows, he turned to see Horatio standing beside the bed. He had one of Arabella's recipe cards in his hands and was mixing up some herbs in a steam bowl for Daniel. She said you have to return to her exercises. And you should, Clara said firmly. So... Breathe this in. Horatio pushed the bowl toward him. Daniel thanked him and lifted the bowl into his lap, breathing in the steam. How are you feeling? Clara said softly, looking toward him with such worry that Daniel feared looking into a mirror. He rather dreaded the exhaustion he'd see in his own eyes. Right as rain, he said sarcastically, prompting them both to smile a little. So... I said Arabella's name. You did. They spoke in unison before glancing at one another. You tell him, 
Horatio waved a hand at Clara, urging him on. You should know Arabella made something of a scene last night, she said with a small smile. Miss Withers declared she no longer wished to court you. She implied you were... weak. Horatio finished the sentence when Clara didn't have the stomach to. She said it, not me. He defended himself to his wife. I know, but still. She squirmed, unhappy with it. Miss Spencer argued with Miss Withers in front of us all. She said you were strong in heart and that mattered more than anything else. She also said any woman who had your affection would be lucky. She said that? Daniel murmured in amazement, leaning over the bowl as he breathed in the steam. She cares for you, you fool, in case you hadn't noticed, Horatio said with a soft chuckle. How useful having a healer fall for you. There's something else you should know. Clara leaned toward him. It is a secret I have kept from you for a while, but one that now must be shared. Chapter 24 Daniel When Horatio first returned to the county, Clara paused and looked at her husband, as if waiting for reassurance. Confused at what this story had to do with Arabella, Daniel looked between his sister and brother-in-law. There was still a tightness across his chest, but with every breath he took of the steam, it was relieving itself. It reminded him of the night before, sat here with Arabella with her hand clutched in his own. To have that moment back. Tell him, Horatio said softly, and laid an encouraging hand to Clara's shoulder. Clara turned back to face Daniel, resting her hands on the side of the bed. I was not the most confident of individuals. Clara spoke with a strain to her voice and her breathing hitched, showing it was not an easy subject to speak of. Where some ladies cope with such self-esteem problems, by applying rouge and the like, I went to someone else for help. I went to Arabella. I beg your pardon? Daniel scowled with the words still puzzled by where this story was heading. She is a healer, Daniel. She is the woman you always believed her to be, but she is no witch, if that's what you fear. Clara shook her head firmly. She gave me tonics to help with my confidence. Belladonna drops, Daniel said darkly. The only risk that one poses is to the user. Horatio took over the tale with his eyes on his wife. I can scarcely believe you use such a dangerous thing. He sighed deeply, staring at Clara. I noticed you without it, you know. I hardly knew that at the time, did I? She asked with a shrug. As you can see, we have discussed this many times and repeated the same words to one another, Horatio said, turning his eyes on Daniel. Clara used tonics she never needed to use, for I had already noticed her. I did it from a place of not being certain he would ever see me as I did him, Clara said in a whispered voice. Arabella helped me to see the truth of the matter. What do you mean? Daniel asked. Horatio nodded at Clara, who reached into a reticule at her side and pulled out a letter. She passed it to Daniel. You should read this, she whispered. This is what Arabella sent to me when I was ill. She was kindness itself. Had it not been for her? She paused and looked at Horatio, who returned her full smile. Well, I would not be as happy as I am now. Read it, Horatio encouraged. Perhaps then you will see Miss Spencer for who she truly is. Daniel turned his eyes down to the letter and unfurled it. The letter opened with kind words from Arabella. She had clearly written at the time when Clara was gravely ill. She'd offered advice on how Clara could recover faster and expressed great concern for her well-being. The latter part of the letter turned to the matter which had led to Clara's sickness from drinking too much belladonna tea. Now, my lady, if you will forgive the advice of a stranger, I wish to address another matter. I offer these tonics and remedies to people to assist with women's confidence at times and to help them feel as if they are taking control of their futures. But in truth, no woman needs any of this. 
You certainly do not need anything I gave you. They are merely a way to buoy confidence, but such confidence should come naturally. I am a great believer in that every woman should be comfortable as they are, happy as they are, for we were all made uniquely. Why should we try to be like any other when we are the perfect versions of ourselves already? When it comes to the matter of men, the above could not be stressed more. Believe me, my lady, that any man who does not notice you as you are, to the point that you feel you need these tonics, is not worthy of your affection. Your true and best partner in life will love you for who you are, not because of orchid perfume or large pupils by using belladonna drops. He is certainly not worth risking your own health for. I pray you will see some wisdom in my words, my lady. I have heard much of you in the village, and I respect you as you are. Pray do not change for any man. Daniel broke off and lifted his head, staring at Clara who sat calmly behind him. She was a good friend to me, Clara whispered. This is how she feels, truly, Daniel murmured, finding himself clinging to the letter rather tightly. It was all a lie about the potions. Arabella was never any sort of witch. She even dislikes the things she sells. There is one thing I do not understand, Daniel said slowly. Horatio tried to take the letter back, but he held on to it for a little longer, reluctant to release it. Why does she do it? If this is how she feels about all these tonics, why does she sell them to women? You've heard of her father's situation as I have, Horatio reminded him. From what I hear from local investors, her father has invested again recently in a failed scheme. They have no money left, Daniel, Clara explained. Arabella was trying to save up something, so at least she and her father could eat. It is why she's now gone. Gone! Daniel spluttered, sitting forward so sharply that he nearly dislodged the steam bowl from his lap. She meant what she said last night, about leaving. Yes, Clara confirmed. She and her father are selling the home. They are moving on. She can't be gone, she can't be. Daniel rode all the way to Clara's house, muttering repeatedly to himself. After spending a whole day in bed, repeatedly doing Clara's exercises, he felt much better again. That morning his father had been most reluctant to let him ride out of the lands, but Daniel insisted there was someone he had to see. His mother looked at him across the dining table with a knowing smile, clearly suspecting where he intended to go, even if his father did not. I must see her, Daniel muttered as he steered the horse onto the driveway of the Spencer house. The moment he glimpsed the building he slowed his pace. The horse trotted beneath him, snuffling softly as they travelled together down the drive. What a place it is. Daniel gasped at the state it was in. The house had clearly once been fine and grand indeed. Some day it could be so again, but not now. The white Palladian structure was covered in ivy and Virginia creepers, with the growing leaves slowly tearing at the brickwork and in places making it crumble. The driveway that should have been raked of weeds had a myriad of small green shoots growing through it. Trees that would have once arched over the drive, cocooning those travelling up the drive, were now splayed wide, overgrown and casting long shadows over the place. The whole estate suggested the owners lived in the past and not for today. Here is where she lives. She never spoke of it. Daniel raked his memories, trying to think of any time Arabella had spoken of her home, but all he could summon was repeated examples of him asking her about her home and her shutting down. She would often tell him other things or even return the conversation to him. She was plainly hiding this life from him. Arabella! Daniel called out to the house, in the vain hope that she was still there though the emptiness before him suggested there was no one home at all. Jumping down from the horse, he left the reins wrapped around a nearby railing at the bottom of the front steps, then walked up to the house. The front door was open, hanging loose on its hinges. Arabella? He called, in a softer tone now, pushing open the door. 
It whined with the movement and slowly creeped open. Inside, the dilapidation of the home was plain to see. Furniture was missing, clearly having been sold. The shadows were long, suggesting the shutters across the windows had been closed up. Is there anyone here? At his words, there were footsteps inside. Daniel stepped in, took his top hat off his head, and tucked it under his arm. Arabella. With hope he strode through the hall, heading toward those footsteps. He had to see her again, he had to. All night he had filled himself with imaginings of what he would say to her. He owed her an apology, a great one indeed. Now he knew who Arabella really was, and she was every bit the woman he had always thought her to be. Kindness itself, benevolent, caring, witty, and captivating. He had to see her again. Arabella? He opened the door to a room close by and stepped inside, but it was no woman that greeted him. An older man was looking around the room with papers in his hands. He had spectacles perched on his nose and pushed them up a little as he turned to face Daniel. Forgive me, I was looking for the lady of the house. The lady? Ah, I see. The man spoke hurriedly with a smile. You mean Miss Spencer? I'm afraid she and her father are long gone. They left two days ago. I'm here to put the house for sale and take down the particulars. He gestured to the papers in his hand. Are you here to inquire about the house? No, the owner. Daniel felt a tightness in his stomach. Was he too slow after all? Had he missed Arabella? Do you know where Mr. Spencer and his daughter have gone? I have not yet had an address for them. The gentleman shook his head. I'm afraid I cannot help you there. I see. Thank you anyway. Daniel backed up. With his gut tightening and his misery taking over, his breathing was beginning to hitch. In through your nose and out through your mouth. He maintained his control of his breathing, performing one of Arabella's exercises as he turned to leave the room. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught sight of a painting in the corner of the room. Hesitating, he looked toward it, recognising the face that was in the picture. It was of Arabella. It seemed to be the only painting that had not been sold. Within the gilt frame was Arabella's painted face. In her lap, she was clutching to a book on botanicals, and in her other hand, there was a sprig of lavender. Daniel ached as he looked at that picture. Here Arabella was, presented as the woman she had always been, someone of science and botany. It was testament to her sharp mind and her knowledge of plants. How could I ever accuse her of being a witch at all? Is there anything I can help you with? The man asked Daniel, disturbing his thoughts. No, thank you. Daniel backed up from the painting, feeling a longing to reach into the painting and pull Arabella from it. I cannot believe I miss her this much. Daniel strode out of the house as quickly as he could, making his way back to his horse. Come what may, he had to find a way to see Arabella again. Arabella With the wind whipping past her ears, Arabella bent down in the kitchen garden and picked some fresh rosemary. It seemed to be constantly windy in Lyme Regis. No matter what the weather, sunny or rainy, the wind never stopped. Arabella felt buffeted by that wind and shivery. Collecting the rosemary, she laid it in the basket she was carrying and stood straight, admiring the garden around her. Her father's cousin was evidently a man of some money. Not only did he have a grand estate, but many servants, more than Arabella was used to. He had five children too, most of whom were much younger than Arabella, and had a habit of fussing over her. The only one who showed her any sort of respect or kindness at all was Albert, who was a year her junior. When she had first arrived, the daughters had stayed by her side, poking at her cheap gowns and curling their noses at the lack of lace on her hem. Now they didn't restrain themselves in their censure. Even now, as Arabella returned to the house, 
she caught sight of two of her cousins from a distance. May and Henrietta were giggling together. Fourteen and fifteen in age, they tended to think they were more mature than they were. They pointed at her, sniggering. Sighing, Arabella hastened into the house, but heard their footsteps following her soon after. They trailed her through the staff kitchen, then into the corridors. What lady bothers herself with the kitchen garden? May asked, sneering as she followed Arabella. Your father must be embarrassed. You make such an exhibition of yourself. That is unkind, May, Arabella said simply, casting a quick glance at the girl at her side with dark black hair. Were you not taught to welcome family, no matter how different they are from you? May had the decency to look ashamed, but her elder sister Henrietta showed no such cowering of manner. She stiffened her spine and held her head high, making her black curls dance around her chin. It's all these plants, she said, wrinkling her nose. You bring such smells into the house. Why do you do the task of a servant? Who said I did? Arabella asked, walking ahead with vigour now, longing to escape to her chamber, yet her cousins followed her. Our mother, May explained. She said you had been raised as a servant by your father. It's the way you are. You have rough hands too. Arabella raised a hand from the handle of her basket and stared at her fingers. They were a worker's hands with the fingers scarred in places. What if I do have rough hands and know the life of a worker? Arabella asked. As she reached the stairs, she halted and turned to face her cousins. They slid to a stop on the hall rug, colliding with one another and nearly toppling over. What is so wrong with that? Henrietta sniggered, as if the mere notion in itself was laughable. Arabella continued to glower at her openly, and that firm stare eventually made Henrietta stop. You should be able to take care of yourselves in this world. Arabella said tartly in a low voice. Tell me, when was the last time you put a stocking on by yourself? Or a gown? She asked, looking between the two of them. The smiles slipped from their faces. Next time your maid helps you on with such things, consider how much more capable they are than you. Perhaps then you will see how absurd it is to laugh at people who are different to yourself. Turning on her heel, Arabella left, hastening up the stairs. For a minute she thought she had won one of their arguments for a change. Perhaps at last their infernal comments would end and she could continue as she was, concocting her remedies in peace. Yet as she reached the top of the stairs she heard their laughter once again. It rang through the hallway, each laugh following the next. It froze Arabella to the spot. She didn't dare look down at her cousins, but she didn't want to give them the pleasure of seeing her affected either. She hastened forward once again, rushing to her chamber and hiding herself inside. Placing down the basket with some other herbs she'd collected the day before, Arabella flung herself into the nearest chair and hung her head forward. She longed for company, for someone to talk to who understood her, but there was no one. Her father was working hard, and out of the house for most of the day, trying to provide for the two of them so they could buy a house for themselves soon enough. No one in the house was particularly welcoming of Arabella's presence, and even the staff whispered about her. I feel very alone indeed. Unsure what else to do, Arabella moved to a writing bureau in the side of the room. Pulling forward a blank sheet of paper, she began a letter. She asked much of how Betsy was faring and if the baby had arrived yet. She didn't doubt it would not be long until the baby was born. Arabella was careful not to talk much of herself, knowing that it would only make Betsy sad. When she was finished with the letter, her eyes were drawn toward another stack of papers at the corner of the bureau. Each letter she had written over the last few days, but they were intended for another. Though I will never send them. She missed Lord Wareham so much that she found it gave her comfort to write to him. She spoke in her letters as if he had never implied that she was a witch at all. She wrote and talked to him as they had always been, with wit, humour and excitement. It gave her an outlet, 
something to look forward to through the long, dreary days in this house. Pushing the letters away, she hid them in a small drawer in the bureau. I can never send them to him, she whispered, hiding them away for good. Chapter 25 Daniel Daniel tore the cloth from his head and tossed it to his side with anger. It fell against a chair nearby, then dropped to the floor. His valet jumped at the movement. I'm sorry, Thomas, Daniel said in a low voice. I can't seem to control my mood these days. He pushed the steam bowl away from him that he had been using for many minutes at a time. This was the third morning in a row now he had woken with the need to talk to Arabella, but he had no idea where she was. A few days ago, he had left word with the solicitor handling the sale of her house, so that when he learned of Mr. Spencer's new address, Daniel could learn of it too. Still, he'd had no news from the solicitor and feared this emptiness could drag on for some time. As the valet retreated from the room, Daniel finished changing. Repeatedly, he looked at an empty chair nearby. He could picture Arabella sitting there easily enough. If she wasn't sorting through the latest herbs she'd collected for him, and then she'd be laughing about something, probably teasing him for not controlling his temper better and being in such a foul mood. You think this helps? He could picture her now, lifting the cloth off the floor and twirling it in her hands. Yes. Let us all take our anger out on inanimate objects. She would toss the cloth to the floor herself then, mimicking his moves. It helps. He found himself saying it aloud. I don't know why. She would repeat the action until they would both smile, laughing together. He imagined her walking toward him as he tied his cravat. Would she take it from him and tie it for him? He could still remember vividly how she'd undone his cravat the night of his attack. She had been swift then and repeatedly looked into his eyes. He imagined her tying the cravat calmly now with a sweet smile playing on her lips. Why can you not control your mood, Daniel? All is well with the world. Your health is good. She would say such things if she was here, pointing out the absurdity of him being in a foul mood. Not all is well with the world. He would say to her if she were here, for you are not here. With these words, the imagining disappeared. He was alone in his room completely. The ache in his chest was acute, but it had nothing to do with his lungs. It was an internal turmoil that had created that ache. I miss you. So much. As he finished tying his cravat, he reached for his tailcoat and hurriedly pulled it on. As he turned and looked at the empty chair beside his steam bowl, the thought of what he felt for Arabella hit him suddenly, as if he had been struck by it like a man's blow to the chest. I love her. His movement stilled completely. He may have suspected it before, perhaps even feared the strength of his attachment to her, but when faced with her vanishment and this longing to see her, it couldn't be denied any more. God's wounds, I love her, he whispered. His next actions were fast. Daniel fled his room and hastened down the stairs. He'd heard Clara had arrived already that morning for a visit and found her in the sitting room, though she was hurrying around her maid, who was sat very still in a chair with a hand clutching her stomach. Clara! Not now, Daniel. Clara kneeled beside her maid. I must get Betsy home. What is it? What's wrong? Daniel asked, stepping forward. The maid offered a nervous smile with her fingers tightening around her belly. I believe the child is ready to come. I have to get her home at once, Clara moved to her feet again. Here, let me help. Daniel moved forward, desperate to be of some use. Clara sent for her carriage again, and Daniel took Betsy's arm. He urged the maid to lean on him, and he led her out of the sitting room back through the house. Clara, I must speak to you, Daniel said with desperation. He was torn. He both had to help the maid and needed to know what more Clara could help him with. Now, Clara asked impatiently, waving a hand at her maid, it is not the right time. 
I wish to talk of Arabella, Daniel explained as he helped Betsy out of the door. When her stomach ached, she nearly slipped on the front step. I've got you, he assured her. As well as taking one of her arms in his grasp, he reached round and took her shoulder too, steering her toward the car. Thank you, my lord, Betsy said, managing a small smile through her labour aches. You were speaking of Arabella. No, no, Clara is right. Now is not the moment for it. Daniel led her toward the carriage. Clara urged the driver to prepare himself to leave, but Betsy didn't climb in yet. She clung to Daniel's hand a little tighter. What did you wish to say about my friend? Betsy asked, her voice low. In truth, I miss her, Daniel whispered the words. And is that all the feeling is? Clara thrust open the carriage door, then turned to face Daniel with her hands on her hips. Because I am tired of seeing you dance around Miss Spencer. Tell me the truth, Daniel. What is it you really feel for her? I love her. Daniel didn't hesitate. Brought on by the sharpness of his sister's tone, the truth fell from his lips. That is the honest answer. I love her. Betsy clung tighter to his hand as he helped her toward the carriage. Yet I cannot find her, Daniel said in a rush. Enough of that now. Betsy, let us get you in the carriage. Clara tried to help the maid up too. She took one step in the coach before turning back to face Daniel. You wish to know where she is? I know, she said, her words escaping her quickly. You do? Daniel stiffened. She has family on the coast, in Lyme Regis. She wrote to me from there just this week. You'll find her there, my lord. Excitement swept over him, but he could ask no more now. I have to get her home. Clara finished pushing Betsy into the carriage. Good luck, Daniel. Good luck, he repeated, prompting his sister to smile. Well, I hardly doubt you're going to stay here when you now know where she is. She laughed and waved at him. Daniel closed the door and wished Betsy well, then backed up. The carriage took off at speed, hastening to take Betsy back to her home. The moment the carriage was gone, Daniel turned and ran inside. He was feeling athletic again. Arabella's treatments and her exercises had helped hugely, and he felt like he was the man he had once been. Striding through the house with ease, he found his mother and father still in the breakfast room. Unusually, his father was not smoking his pipe as he so often did when he had finished breakfast. His mother had explained the day before that his father was giving it up. Daniel had noticed the pattern Arabella had herself speculated on when suggesting that returning home had aggravated his condition. Daniel had been in a house where not only he had smoked, but his father had too. Being closeted up with that smoke had made things much worse. With his father now giving up the habit too, Daniel stood the chance of a better recovery. Daniel! Marianne exclaimed as he entered the room sharply, nearly dropping her coffee cup. Goodness, you made my heart nearly leap out of my chest. She laid a palm flat to her sternum. How are you this morning? I feel fine. Well, in fact, he said hurriedly, looking toward his father who was twitching at the head of the table. How do you feel? Why is it so difficult to stop smoking a pipe? Gregory said restlessly and tossed down the paper he had been reading. It is quite absurd. He sighed deeply and looked at Daniel, evidently sensing something was amiss, for he frowned at once. Is everything well? Daniel explained that Clara had had to leave quickly because of Betsy's condition. They both expressed excitement for Betsy, but Gregory continued to stare at Daniel, with his hands steepled in front of him. Is there a reason you cannot sit down? he asked, waving at where Daniel stood behind a chair with his hands clutching the backrest. Yes, Daniel murmured slowly, uncertain how to begin the conversation he had to have. To be certain, Miss Withers no longer wishes for a courtship, does she? He looked between his parents. His father shook his head, and his mother shuddered at the idea. 
I can't believe I was so mistaken in that lady's character. Marianne topped up her coffee cup, then tutted at herself. You think I would have seen a lady who would misjudge my son so much? Her heart was not as warm as it should have been. Perhaps not, Gregory agreed. Yes, there is to be no courtship. Why do you ask? For I wish for one with another. Daniel's simple words had a sudden effect on the room. This time Marianne did drop her coffee cup. It fell to the dining table and toppled over, spilling coffee everywhere, though she made no effort to pick it up again. Gregory stiffened in his chair too. To whom? Marianne asked excitedly, sitting forward in his chair. Are we sure a courtship is a good idea so soon? Gregory asked. The last attempt has certainly reinforced the idea that such things should not be rushed. It would not be rushed. Daniel held his breath before he spoke, fearing what his father's reaction would be. I know the lady very well. She is the best woman I know, in truth. He had Gregory's attention completely now, who was frowning at him across the table. I am suggesting a courtship with Miss Spencer. Miss Spencer? Gregory spluttered. How wonderful! Marianne was on her feet, clasping her hands together. No, Marianne, no, it's not wonderful. Gregory sat back in his chair, shaking his head with vigour. She is the daughter of a poor merchant, well, a gentleman that was a merchant, in fact. They had money at one point, did they not? Daniel reminded his father. And none now. They have no position, and she certainly would have no dowry either. Gregory paused as Marianne waved her arms in the air. What happened to your sense of romance, Gregory? she asked, placing her hands on her hips. I do not remember you speaking of dowries when you proposed to me. That's because the discussion was had with your father, Gregory explained, lifting his coffee cup calmly to his lips and taking a sip. Do you not realise how callous that sounds? Marianne rounded the table, marching toward her husband. Daniel had to jump out of her way, a little afeard of the anger in his mother. I'd hide if I were you, father. At Daniel's words, Gregory looked tempted to agree with him and sat back in his chair. I'm being practical, Marianne, that is all, Gregory assured her. Miss Spencer is a woman with no connections and no money. I don't consider myself a proud man. Don't you? Daniel said sharply, earning a startled look from his father. What I mean to say is... He struggled for words, shifting in his seat repeatedly. Marianne stood beside him, glaring down at him. Stop looking at me like that, he pleaded with her. It's hard to think straight when you look at me with so much hatred. Not hatred, bewilderment, she snapped loudly. Gregory, you stood in the same room as I when Miss Withers disparaged our son so much, did you not? Then tell me, which of us in this family stepped forward to defend her first? I remember telling Miss Withers and her family to leave, Gregory reminded his wife. Daniel paused, smiling a little, for he had not known his father had sent the family out of the house. Yet you were not the first to speak. Marianne shook her head firmly. The first was Miss Spencer. She turned away from Gregory to face Daniel with her voice pitching high in her fervour. She is devoted to you, Daniel. I saw it myself. Daniel smiled a little, feeling excitement at the words. He could still picture the feeling of her hand in his own the night she had left. How he longed for that feeling to return. He deserves to be loved. Marianne turned and tapped her husband round the arm in reprimand. I didn't say he didn't deserve that and ow, Gregory added pointedly. You were being a fool, she said swiftly. Yes, your tap said as much. He shifted in his seat and sat forward, staring at Daniel with a sombre expression. Are you certain this is what you wish for? he asked. I don't understand what is so awful about it. Daniel was firm. There is also another problem. For all I know, Arabella might never say yes to such a thing. Arabella, Gregory spluttered. You call her. Shush, dear, let your son continue on. Marianne waved a hand at her husband, urging him to fall quiet. But I have to try, 
Daniel said in a rush. I've seen how happy Clara and Horatio are together. I never thought it was something I could have myself. He gripped the back of the chair before him again, leaning upon it. With Arabella, I knew what that felt like. Marianne smiled sweetly and laid a hand on her chest. Our son, what a romantic he is, she gushed warmly, even as Gregory continued to shake his head. Are you truly going to say no? Her happy manner faltered and she turned to glare at Gregory again, who flinched in his seat under that frown. No, I won't say no. He sighed eventually. In truth, I don't know what to think, but neither do I wish you two to hate me forever. Gregory's gaze shifted back toward Daniel. Do you even know where Miss Spencer is? She said she was leaving town. I have an idea of where to look for her. If you would excuse me, I will go there now. Daniel left the room. Now, Gregory asked, trying to follow him, but Marianne blocked the path. What a shame, dear. I've spilled more coffee on your trousers. Marianne's voice could be heard from the dining room as Daniel made his escape, trying to stop Gregory from following. Thank you, mother, Daniel whispered to himself and chuckled, knowing he'd have to thank her properly later. Daniel had been searching for Arabella all day, but had had no success at all. With only the information of Arabella's name and no address, he had been unable to discover where she was living. Climbing out of his carriage, Daniel shielded his head from the growing rain and ran toward an inn. In the centre of Lyme Regis town, overlooking the green ocean nearby, there was an inn offering rooms for the night and good food. Daniel hastened inside and shook off the raindrops from his frock coat, approaching the serving hatch quickly. A man bent his head through the hatch and welcomed Daniel. What will it be? he asked with a thick Dorset accent. Small beer, Daniel pleaded. Do you have any rooms for the night? We do. Daniel could see little hope of finding Arabella in what few daylight hours he had left that day. He'd been searching all day as it was, and with the heavy rain, if it continued to fall, darkness would come quicker than usual thanks to the grey clouds. His best hope was to try again tomorrow morning. He booked a room for the night, arranged for some food to be brought to, then sat down at a table in the corner of the room. He drank the beer quickly, looking around the inn as he did so. There were many men here tonight, from all sorts of classes. The poor and wealthy mixed alike and enjoyed each other's company. Daniel smiled to see them so at ease with one another. Nearby, some men were playing skittles at the end of one of the rooms. Unable to play outside of the rain, they had lined up some skittles by an empty fire grate and were repeatedly tossing the wooden ball in their direction. A young man dressed in fine clothes tossed the ball but missed the skittles entirely. Jovial laughter filled the air as the ball rolled across the tavern and the young man ran after it. Reaching down, Daniel was able to grasp the ball in time before it escaped any further. He proffered it to the young man who appeared at his side. Thank you, sir. The man bowed his head, revealing his dark hair, as he took the ball back and laughed. I could have chased this all over the tavern. What's your name, sir? Wareham, the Marquis of Wareham. Daniel said and bowed his head in greeting too. And your own? Mr. Robert Spencer, my lord. You're more than welcome to join our game if you like. He gestured to the game in a warm manner, yet Daniel had frozen in his seat. Spencer? he repeated, startled. Your name is Spencer? Yes, my lord. Then do you know a Miss Arabella Spencer? I have been searching for her. Of course. The man chuckled. She is my cousin. She has come to stay with us. You know her, my lord? Indeed I do. I have found her at last. Chapter 26 Arabella Arabella wandered the garden. She didn't care that in the early hours of the morning the rain had still not passed. She could not stay in the house any more. 
Her cousins were being cruel and saying petulant things again, poking fun at the poorness of her dress and generally making her feel unwelcome. Only Albert was kind that day, who seemed to have had a preoccupation across breakfast at asking her if she left any friends behind in Wareham. She had dodged the question entirely, not sure where he was going with the conversation. Arabella pushed the wet locks back from her cheek, trying to ignore the dampness as she reached down to the herbs in the garden. One of the staff members had recently complained of backache and she'd offered to make them a tonic for the pain. They'd eagerly accepted, and she now had to pick the herbs. I'll happily do it in the rain. Anything is preferable to this house. She shot a resentful glare at the grand house, then returned her focus to her task. There were footsteps nearby, heavy ones, that she barely paid attention to at first. Those sounds mixed with the noises of the raindrops falling in nearby puddles. When the footsteps got closer, she feared it was her cousins returning to belittle her. May, I'm not in the mood for your quips today. Pray, return to the house, Arabella pleaded tiredly. I'm not May. The voice had Arabella freezing. Her hand around the rosemary leaves stiffened, and she held herself very still. For a second she thought she must be dreaming, for it was surely not possible for the bearer of that voice to be here in Lyme Regis. Arabella? When he said her name, it was impossible to believe it was still a figment of her imagination. Moving swiftly to stand, she turned and faced him. Lord Wareham was a little distance away from her. The rain was running off his cinnamon-coloured hair and his dark black frock coat. He heaved, breathing heavily. You can't be outside in this weather, she murmured hurriedly. You might catch a cold. That's what you say to me now, Lord Wareham asked in disbelief, his lips parting. I have come all the way to see you, and you concern yourself with my health. I always did. Arabella backed up, panicked. If you have come all this way to talk of potions and me being a witch again, pray do not. Your last words on the matter haunt me enough as it is. She spun on her heel, ready to escape to the house. But Lord Wareham took a different path through the borders of the kitchen garden. He ended up cutting in front of her, blocking her path back to the house. That is not why I have come, he said, with his voice deep. I have come to say many things. His lips flickered into the smallest of smiles. Yet, believe me, calling you a witch is not one of them. Arabella shifted her grasp on the herbs in her palms, uncertain what to think or feel. Her heart was leaping in her chest, with excitement, just to see him again. And to see he was well, yet the fear of what he may have come to say made her stomach knot tightly. Arabella, I am so sorry. His words were almost lost in the wind. She shifted her weight between her feet, uncertain of what had truly been said. Did you say, I'm sorry, he said again. He crossed toward her, closing the distance a little, and stopping in front of her. A thousand times I am sorry for all that I said to you that day at the tree. I do not think you are a witch. You said it, Arabella whispered. For a moment you feared it could be true. I feared what these love potions were, that was all, he said in a rush. There's no such thing as love potions, she complained with vigour in her tone, knowing they'd had this argument all before, but she felt compelled to say it again. Even if they did exist, I would not sell them. That's not who I am, my lord. It never was. I know. Yet she didn't pay attention to his words. She was pent up with everything she had wanted to say to him before and felt unable to do so. The words fell from her lips in a rush now. I sold Bella Donna, yes, an orchid perfume. There's a cream too that makes the skin glow, but all these things are for a woman's own self-esteem. They are nothing to trick another's mind. There's no deception in it. Nothing of the kind. She spoke quickly, each sentence running into the next. And wait, did you say, I know? She abruptly realised the very words he'd uttered as he smiled a little. 
Yes. That smile continued to grow. Even without all I have learned since, do you think I could deny what is in your heart after what you did for me the other night? His voice was quiet. With the rain falling so hard around them, she had to step toward him to hear him properly. He mirrored her action, so they were stood very close together, with him leaning down toward her. You cared for me when I could scarcely breathe. You were the one to bring me back from the brink, from the edge of life itself. You were not that much at risk of death, my lord, she said hastily. Was I not? I am not so convinced of it. I could not breathe, Arabella. You were the one who calmed me, made my lungs breathe again. That was all you. He gestured toward her with both hands. How I could ever doubt your intentions when I witnessed that. It would be impossible. He was incredulous, shaking his head back and forth relentlessly. You saved me. You stayed with me. You held my hand when the maid wasn't looking. Oh, she saw it. Arabella said with the smallest of smiles. I did it anyway. She squeaked in objection. Did she? Lord Wareham chuckled. I did not even notice. I was too busy thinking of this. He reached forward and took Arabella's hand away from the herbs. He slid their palms together. That touch sent a tingling excitement up Arabella's arm. She looked down at the hold they had on one another fearing he would snatch it away, and this beautiful moment would be over forever. Thank you, Lord Wareham whispered. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. I would do it again without hesitation, she murmured, still looking down at their hands. Unable to look him in the eye, she stared at their fingers. Slowly his began to curl around hers. I could not see you hurting, my lord. It pains me to see it. It aches me too, to see you here, he whispered to her. You did not make it easy to find you. I did not run away. It was just what happened, she said in a rush. With his fingers now entwined with her own, she felt the confidence to look up. How did you find me? It seems your cousin Robert has a fondness for the local inn and a game of skittles, Lord Wareham said with a laugh. I bumped into him there last night. Fortunately, he was only too happy to tell me where you were. He also needs to improve his skills in the game, by the way. Arabella laughed at his words. She was so excited to see Lord Wareham here holding her hand she could not make sense of it. Is that why you came? she whispered. To play skittles with your cousin? No, Lord Wareham jested. I mean, you said you did not believe I was a witch. Is that why you came? she asked, holding on to hope for something more. It was one of the reasons I came, he murmured softly, his laughter fading. I wished you to know that I had stopped being a fool, yet there is more you should know. He breathed deeply and hung his head forward, breaking the connection between their gazes. God's wounds. You must think me a great idiot indeed for ever believing such tales that were written in those scandal sheets. I would not put it like that. Perhaps a little naive, she teased him, loving the way he chuckled, his smile breaking through the tension that hung on his cheeks. I've missed the way you tease me. He moved their hands together again, so it was a firmer hold. Her breath hitched, but she didn't pull back from him. She loved that touch. I missed you too, she whispered, nervous to say the words aloud. The moment she did, his smile grew broader. I was naive, but you should know why. His shoulders stiffened a little as he prepared to impart something to her. His appearance of nerves had her dropping the herbs she held in her other hand no longer caring for them, and only thinking of Lord Wareham. I liked you, Arabella. Her palms felt clammy, despite the rain and the coolness it brought to the air. What does he mean by that? I liked you too much, he confessed. Within weeks of us being together, there was an attachment there, at least on my part, 
a serious devotion, and when I heard of these love potions and saw you at the tree. He broke off, closed his eyes as if in despair of the memory and shook himself. All I could think of was, what if all my feelings for you were a creation? I could not even trust how I felt about you. Oh, you are a fool. She lifted her other hand and tapped him round the arm. Her sudden outlet broke the tension between them. He laughed boldly, tipping his chin back. Do you really think such things exist? That's not possible. There is no tonic or potion that can change the way one feels, the way one is touched in here. She reached up and laid that hand on his chest, where his heart was. His head snapped down again, his eyes finding hers. She halted, realising what she had done. It is an intimate touch. She went to release him, but at the movement of her fingers, Lord Wareham raised his other hand and laid it over hers, holding it in place on his chest. I know, I am a fool, he whispered. You are a woman of science, Arabella, and I should have trusted you. I should not have questioned everything I felt the way I did. Call it my foolishness, if you wish, my panic. I know the truth now. He laid his palm over her hand, keeping it flat to his chest. They were standing so closely together that Arabella knew it would be scandalous if they were seen. But she couldn't help herself, and she had no wish to step back from him. Let this moment last. I know what I feel is real. I loved you even when I was no longer taking your medicines, and I have loved you even more since. You left, and I knew at once what it was that I felt. Love? He said, love. You love me, Arabella whispered, startled to hear the words aloud. She could not stop smiling. It made her cheeks ache, but never once did that smile falter. I do, Lord Wareham said with boldness, and leaned toward her an inch. From the smile on your face, may I guess that my love is not in vain? Tell me I have not lost all chance because I'm an idiot. You're not an idiot, she said, laughing softly. Well, I think I am, he mocked himself. I would not blame you for thinking it. I don't. So? Tell me then, Arabella, do I have any hope of ever having a return? He asked, as the rain continued to come down around them. She felt the drops on her cheeks and could have easily mistaken them for tears, but they would have been tears of happiness this time. From what I hear, you made quite a display in my house the other night. Something about defending me to Miss Withers, he said playfully, calling me strong in heart. You are. She pressed her hand harder to his chest. You have the best heart I know. You wish to talk of a prize fool, then look no further than Miss Withers. She saw you as nothing more than a chance to marry, well, did she not? The moment she saw you for who you were, she scarpered. She had no love in her, nothing. Indeed, she did not. I pray you, Arabella, do not keep me in suspense any more, he pleaded with her. Do I have any hope of a return of my attachment to you? I've been attached to you for weeks now, months, she said loudly. I love you. He smiled at once and leaned toward her. My lord, I... Daniel. My name is Daniel Arabella. Please call me that and desist with my title at once, he pleaded, coming so close now that she could trace every line in his face. She felt weak, leaning toward him too. Daniel. She trailed off as he moved his lips to hers. The kiss was chaste, a press of lips together, and had power over Arabella. She was very aware of everywhere they touched, the hand they each held, and the palm she had placed on his chest, with his hand over hers. The kiss had her arching toward him, not wanting the moment to end. When it did and they pulled back from one another, there were raindrops on both of their cheeks. You have no idea for how long I have wanted to do that, he whispered to her. She laughed softly, still holding on to him. He shifted their hold, releasing their hands, then drew her forward into an embrace. Arabella placed her head to his chest and wrapped her arms around him. He bent down and kissed her temple, elongating the embrace. 
Daniel. I can call him Daniel now. There's one thing more you should know, Arabella whispered, not wishing for there to be any secrets between them now. What's that? he asked softly. She lifted her head in his embrace so she could look him in the eye. The tonics, all of it, everything I sold that was not a healing medicine, I did it for one reason only, she said in a rush. Your father. He already knew what her next words would be. Startled, her eyebrows shot up across her temple. You know, I have heard of his situation. You were doing what you could to help, were you not? He said gently. I was, she nodded. I just had to find a way to keep us fed when he was exploring the maddest of investments. He's taken a job as a clerk now for a merchant. I did the healing because I wished to, but all these other tonics, they offered something I could not refuse. I know. His voice was deep as he raised a hand between them. With care, he brushed away one of the loose locks of her hair that had become damp in the rain and stuck to her cheek. Lovingly, he pushed it behind her ear. I think I love you even more for it. How is that possible? she asked incredulously. Everything you've ever done is selfless as far as I can see. It's about time you did something for yourself instead of others, you know, he whispered. In fact, right now, tell me something you wish to do for you and no one else. You wish to know? She laughed. Yes. Very well. She raised herself on her toes, longing for another one of those kisses. She saw Daniel smile before he met her with that kiss. It was as chaste as the last, but held for longer this time, allowing her to curl her hands around the lapels of his frock coat, holding on to him as he gently laid his hands to her waist. When they parted, they rested their heads together. Come home, Arabella, he whispered. Home? She leaned back from him. Daniel, my home is gone. My father sold it. No, I mean a different home. He reached for her hand and took it off his lapel, raising it to his lips and kissing the back. You see, I can't help but feel that your home is with me at my house if you wish it to be. You mean, Arabella felt herself tremble. Marry me, Arabella, he whispered. Marry you, she spluttered. I was hoping for an answer rather than a repeat of the question, he jested, smiling at her. But I have no dowry, she shook her head firmly. You are a Marquess, you will be a Duke some day, and what am I? I'm the poor daughter of a once grand merchant without a shilling to my name. How could you marry me? I'm choosing out of love, not from a wish to line my coffers further. He shook his head firmly, adopting a more serious expression this time. I'm asking because I love you, Arabella, and praying you will say yes. So I will ask again, will you marry me? Such happiness leapt within Arabella's chest she could not hold back. Yes. At her answer he kissed her again. Epilogue Arabella, one month later. Oh, Arabella, we will be sisters. Clara gushed as she took Arabella's hands. She twirled the two of them together in the dressing room as Arabella laughed. Careful, too much of this and I will not be able to walk down the aisle straight. Arabella was abruptly released and she tottered on her feet, laughing with Clara and Betsy nearby. Betsy sat in a chair holding on to her new baby, Mariah. The girl was still so young she could not hold her head up. She wriggled in her mother's arms at all the noise. There now, Mariah, today is a happy day, Betsy said to her daughter. When you are older, you'll see what a happy time it is. She leaned down and kissed her daughter on the forehead. Happy indeed. Arabella turned to her reflection in the mirror, thinking of all that had passed the last month. She was scarcely able to believe how much had changed. 
her father had applied himself to his work so well. He had found a new job as a merchant and was doing well again. They'd moved into a small and comfortable home together in Wareham, but from this day forward it was no longer to be her home. Arabella was to marry Daniel, and they'd share their home together on the Duke's estate. We are to marry. Arabella smiled with excitement and looked at her reflection. The gown was ivory white with detailed lace around the bust. She had not wanted anything too expensive or overly fussy, so the skirt was made of silk, with a thin strip of golden lace that passed down the front leading toward the hem. The back of the gown had a small train with white beads that glistened in the light. Thank you, Arabella found the words falling from her lips. Who was that to? Clara asked, appearing beside her in the mirror. Both of you. Arabella looked between Betchy and Clara. To you, Betchy, for mentioning me in the first place to Clara, or today would not be happening, and to you, Clara. She took Clara's hand, who held it back tightly. Without you taking me to your brother, I would not know him as I do now. We would not be marrying. This is the best thing that has ever happened to me. Since Arabella and Daniel had confessed their love for one another, life had changed considerably. There was scarcely a day when Arabella was not with him, and even when they were apart she was smiling, for he brought humour and laughter into her life. I am the one who should be thanking you, Clara said with vigour. Look at all that you have done for my brother. I have barely seen him wheeze at all this last month. That is all you're doing. I did what anyone would do, Arabella insisted. No, Clara was firm. You did what you could and wished to do. That is everything to me. You have brought life and light to my brother again. I will forever love you for that. She released Arabella's hand and embraced her tightly. Arabella smiled over Clara's shoulder at Betchy, who was now singing softly to Mariah in her arms. We shall have to get going soon, Betchy said, breaking off from her song. The ceremony will begin soon. I do not imagine your groom will be best placed if you are not there. Arabella released her sister-in-law-to-be and turned to face the mirror, checking her reflection one last time. I'm ready, she whispered. Clara thrust a bouquet of flowers into her hands and led her out of the room. Mariah was handed to another maid, and the three women headed toward the door, where an open-top phaeton carriage was awaiting them. Arabella stood nervously on the doorstep, waiting for her father as the sun shone overhead. When Betty stepped forward to ensure all was ready with the carriage, Arabella turned to Clara, needing to talk of one last thing before she went to the church. Do you think people will accept it? In time, she whispered. Ah, I see what you mean. Clara sighed heavily and looked at the carriage ahead. You have seen as well as I what whispers there have been this last month. The day after your betrothal to Daniel was announced, the scandal sheets were abuzz with the news people liked to gossip. I know why they gossip, Arabella said sadly. He could have chosen a woman much more suited to him than I. He could have picked a woman with a dowry for starters. Yet that never mattered to Daniel, did it? Clara reminded her prompting Arabella to smile. In time, people forget to gossip. What do you mean? Arabella asked. I mean... Clara broke off and stepped closer toward her, checking over her shoulder that no one else was nearby before she went on. When Horatio first came back to the county after his travels, there was much gossip about how much he was liked by the ladies. Then he married me. Her smile was a special one as she clearly thought of her husband. For a while people talked. Some ladies were shocked that he'd chosen me over any other. I think that's what you call jealousy on their part, Arabella said with a smile. Perhaps so, but they soon forgot to talk. 
Clara turned to face the carriage once more. Fear not. Give it a few weeks and the whole of Wareham will be talking of a maid that eloped with a butler, or Lord Perrington who has a mistress in Lyme Regis. Does he? I don't know, Clara laughed. My point is they will find something else to talk about sooner or later. Fear not. Think only of your future. Yes, you are right. As her father appeared, Arabella stepped away from the door and hastened toward the carriage. Today was the first day of her future with Daniel, and she intended to make it a happy one indeed. Daniel I hope you will stand still when she walks through the door, Horatio hissed under his breath to Daniel. She'll think you wish to run. She wouldn't think that, Daniel laughed, but tried to stay still nevertheless. A mixture of nervousness and excitement filled him before the wedding. From this day forward, Arabella would be under his roof and they wouldn't have to wave goodbye to one another each day before heading home. We can be as we are supposed to be, together. Where is she? Daniel asked, reaching into his waistcoat for his pocket watch and checking the time. Worry not, she's not late yet. Horatio turned in his position as the best man and looked at the pews. You've had a fair few people come. I had noticed. Daniel sighed deeply and glanced back at his side of the pews. His mother and father were sat at the front, both smiling broadly and holding hands. His mother had sought to invite as many people as he possibly could, and Daniel feared that some had come just to gossip about how he was marrying the local healer. Let them gossip, I will not care. Daniel brushed off the fear and looked at his father. Any protest Gregory might have initially made to the idea of the marriage had long ago faded. By the time Daniel had returned the day he'd proposed to Arabella and informed his parents, he'd discovered Gregory didn't mind at all. One evening, Daniel had had the chance to talk to his father openly about the matter. They'd sat in his father's study together, drinking a glass of brandy each and preparing for the wedding. When Daniel had asked his father why he did not object to the wedding, Gregory had sighed, sat back in his chair and taken a big gulp from his brandy. Because your mother was right, he said in a deep tone. We get one chance to marry and it should be someone we love. Who cares if your bride has no dowry? I've seen the way she cares for you. I could not thank her enough for what she has done. It was the last they had talked on the subject and the question of a dowry had never come up again. When the organ music began, Daniel stepped closer to the altar with Horatio at his side. Turning impatiently to look at the church door, Daniel waited for it to open with bated breath. It opened and Arabella stepped in, holding on to her father's arm. Wearing a white gown with a gold strip down the middle of the skirt, it was both beautiful and elegant in its demureness far from some of the ostentatious gowns that some of their guests had even opted to wear. Yet Daniel could not look away from Arabella's face. Her auburn hair was curled tightly at the back of her head, and her eyes were alight with excitement, looking back at him. Her full lips smiled broadly, and she seemed a little eager to walk down the aisle, so much so that her father was holding her back and making her walk at a more measured pace. As Arabella reached his side, Daniel took her hand from her father. Look after her, please, Harold said in a whisper, the words muffled by the organ music. I give you my word I will, Daniel pointed out, though he wished to say that she looked after him too. Once Harold retreated to the pews, Daniel threaded Arabella's hand through his arm and escorted her closer to the altar. The vicar stood at the very end with his back turned to them as he said a prayer to God. With the organ music still playing, it gave Daniel a chance to talk to Arabella under his breath. You look beautiful, he whispered to her. Thank you. You're quite striking yourself today. It might be hard to look at the vicar. She jested and glanced down at his suit. Daniel chuckled under his breath, looking at the dark green waistcoat he'd chosen embroidered with white swirls and the dark tailcoat. The green and white combination matched her bouquet perfectly, 
with green leaves and white carnations. I was just thinking, he continued to whisper, but spoke quickly now as he could hear the organ music coming to an end. If only we'd know when we met that it would lead us here. I'm glad we did not, Arabella murmured. Oh, why? he asked, frowning a little. I like the journey we had, she confessed. I wouldn't wish to be without the memory of you standing in a garden in Lyme Regis in the rain telling me you loved me. It seems you're quite the romantic after all. I could have sworn you once said you were not so fond of the romance plays. Well, maybe I'm a little romantic. He shifted their grasp on one another so they were holding hands. Thank goodness for that. Daniel longed to lift her hand to his lips and kiss the back, to tell her he loved her. But now the vicar was turning to face him. He was out of time. He vowed to himself to tell her later, for they would soon have all the time in the world together. Dearly beloved, the vicar called across the congregation as the organ music ended. We are gathered here today in the sight of God to join together this man and this woman, Daniel Lewis, the Marquis of Wareham, and Miss Arabella Spencer. Daniel smiled as he looked down at his bride, knowing that shortly she would no longer be Miss Arabella Spencer. No, she will be my wife, Arabella Lewis, the Marchioness of Wareham, the end. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.